Okay, welcome everyone to our October 20th State Building Code Council meeting. Uh, to start, we'll go ahead and do Right now. Sorry, I couldn't hear that. Can you hear me now? Yeah, there you go. Okay, perfect. We can hear you. All right. Okay, so welcome everyone to our October 20th State Building Code Council meeting. To start, we'll do a roll call. Shell Anderson. Present. Jay Arnold. Here. Todd Byer there. Here. Justin Borgo. Here. Micah Chappelle. Here. Tony Doan. Here. Damon Doyle. Here. Tom Handy. Here. Roger Oringa. Matthew Hepner. Craig Holt. Here. Ty Menser. Here. Ben O'Mara. Here. Pete Reiki, Katie Sheehan, Pete Reiki, I see Pete Reiki as a guest. I thought I saw Katie just a second. Okay, I'll come back. Um, our ex officio members, Representative Keith Gaynor. Here. Lauren Lathrop. Senator John Lovick. I'm here. Representative Alex Ramel. Senator Linda Wilson. And our Assistant Attorney General Derek Meyerbachdahl. I'm here and I'm on a cell phone. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. So, Pete, Ricky? Here. Incompetent, but here. <laughs> <laughs> and Katie Sheehan? I'm, I'm here. I'm, um, I'm also on the phone. Thanks. Okay. And then was Matthew, did we see Matthew or Roger? Okay, we have a quorum. Okay, thank you, Annette. Appreciate it. Um, let's go ahead and um, if anyone from the public would like to be recognized, you can go ahead and raise your hand in the attendees list and I can call on you. Tim Atterbury. Tim Atterbury, Associated General Contractors of Washington. Thank you, Tim. Welcome. Karen Christensen. I'm Karen Christensen with uh, the Department of Children, Youth, and Families. Thank you for letting me be here. Thank you, Karen. Welcome. Tyler Farmer. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Tyler Farmer. I'm also with the Department of Children, Youth, and Families. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you, Tyler. Welcome. Angeli. Uh, my uh, my name is Anjali Grant. I'm an architect in Seattle uh, with uh, child care expertise. Thanks. Thank you, Anjali. Welcome. Kevin Duell. Good morning. This is Kevin Duell with Northwest Natural. Welcome, Kevin. Elliot Brown. Jonathan Supply. Thank you, Elliot. Kim Barker. Kim Barker. Hi there, Kim Barker with King County Permitting. Welcome, Kim. Todd Allred. Hi, everybody. Good morning. My name is Todd Allred. I'm with the Plumbing, Heating, Cooling Contractors of Washington. Thank you, Todd. Welcome. Andrea Thank Smith. Thank you. Yeah, Andrea Smith here with the Building Industry Association of Washington. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome. Ardell. Hi, good morning. Ardell Jala, Building Official, Seattle Department of Construction and Inspections. Hey, welcome, Ardell. Uh, 
Ken Burlett. Uh, Ken Burlett, Seattle Fire Department, Fire Marshal's Office, hoping to be able to talk about item eight if we can get to it today. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Welcome. Daniel. Daniel Ungard from the Washington Geological Survey, Department of Natural Resources. Thank you, Daniel. Welcome. Did I get Todd all right already? Yes, you did. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. I think that's everyone. Uh, Jeanette McKegg. We can't hear you yet, Jeanette. Okay, we can maybe try and come back to that. Is there anyone else from the public that would like to be recognized? Uh, Angela? Uh, Angela helped uh, Washington Association of Building Officials. Welcome, Angela. Thank you. And Jeanette, you want to try again? Okay. All right. <clears throat> that will conclude our welcome and introductions. Let's move to review and approve the agenda. Move approval. Thank you, Damon. We have a motion to approve. Perfect. Okay, we have a second from Micah. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any again? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Okay, we'll go to review and approve minutes. Agenda item number three. We have September 15th and October 9th. Uh, let's start with the September 15th. And um, this also has public comment on it. Chell, go ahead. Yeah, if you scroll to the very end, there's three lines that have the same entry in it. And it appears like it could be a, um, a typo. Number 11, 12, and 13. Oh, I... Damon Doyle was busy. Okay, so that can be something that can just be cleaned up. And I imagine 12 and 13, those can be, wait. Um, the motion was to table uh, agenda items 11, 12, and 13. I assume this is why I need yeah. to see. They so, could just be uh, all uh, merged in one column. Oh, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. In one column, but this was the motion. Okay. Understood. Move to approve minutes as written. Before, thank you. We have a motion and a second. Before we move to um, a vote on the approval of this of the September 15th. I'd like to see if there's any public comment on the uh, minutes. Okay, seeing no hands in the attendees list. Uh, with that, is there any discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any against? <laughs> Okay, motion carries. Let's move to the October 9th minutes. Move to approve as written. Okay. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, before we open it up for council discussion, does the public have any comments on the minutes for October 9th? It's 
Okay, not seeing any hands. Uh, with that, any discussion from council on the motion to approve the October 9th minutes? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any against? Okay, motion carries, thank you. Okay, next we'll be moving to agenda item number four. This is for public comment on items not on the agenda. So anything that's not covered on the agenda is the public wanna comment on anything. If you do, go ahead and raise your hand and I'll call on you. Okay, seeing no hands. <clears throat> All right, with that, we'll close that agenda item and move to agenda item number five, which is a local amendments, Grant County pre-proposal amendment, adoption of IRC Appendix 5, fire sprinklers. So we have the documents here that we had uploaded to the webpage. They are the same documents that we had at the last meeting. I did not receive um, new documents if there was changes made to this. Um, I would ask that if there's anybody representing Grant County here and the attendees, raise your hand and I'll promote you to speak. Okay, it looks like we have Chris Young with Grant County. Chris, go ahead. Hi, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, State Building Code Council bo Board. Um, for one, uh, keeping this on the agenda and working with uh, Grant County so we could uh, get some feedback and and come up with a an idea that fits everybody's um, answers everybody's questions. So um, Micah was very helpful in this. So thank you, Micah. Um, we did um, manage to amend this somewhat since October 9th. And um, you'll see that um, item three uh, under the original proposal was removed. So uh, we just are sticking with the proposal for item one, which would be to require a, a sprinkler system for our transient rental program, otherwise known as short-term rentals, and also allow a residential fire sprinkler system to be installed in lieu of the um, uh, fire flow requirements, which would necessitate in many times or many instances, um, large water tanks, fire pumps, et cetera, which are much more costly then a P2904 13D system. Um, we, we, there was a question whether we adopted in a PA 1142, and I also sent that along showing that the Grant County it's, Code. It's, sorry to cut you off, I apologize, but uh, you're talking about an updated document and we didn't receive any updated document, so we don't show anything on the screen. So if there is something that you can send us and we can show it, it will be much better because Again, what we have is the document that was discussed uh, last month. The document that I pulled up that was attached shows that that item three, the criteria, has been removed from the proposal. I've got the stuff we received uh, um, yep. September twenty sixth before the. So the last the last document the document we have was received on September twenty sixth as the sense. If there is something newer than that, we don't have it. If it's the same document that we got on September 26, we can we can post we can show it on the screen. I I, I did send the amended document on October 13th. Um, I don't I don't know why it wasn't shared with the State Building Code Council. Oh, it was in our packet. It is in our packet amendment. It's the file yeah. is amendment um, Roman numeral five. Or Appendix Five Amendments. Yeah. I assume that's where you were going with that, Micah. Yes. Okay. I'm showing. I'm showing changes. That's the change document there, I believe. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I apologize then. And, and it's on the web page for today's meeting. The only reason we're saying is it's got the date on it, September 26th is what I've got for these documents. Got it. Okay. I think we're on the same page now. 
one one just uh, probably Scribner error is that number two just needs to read P2904 instead of P904. But uh, Chris, if, if you have anything further, feel free. No, that, that about summarizes. That is the document. Um, I did elaborate a little bit more on item one. There was a question whether um, this was intended to be a retroactive requirement. So I elaborated on that, which I can share with the council that um, it is not a retroactive a proposed retroactive sprinkler code requirement. Uh, Grant County currently codifies commercial hospitality estab establishments, which are um, short-term rentals, transient rentals in our unified development code, and they require a conditional use permit in certain residential recreational zones within the county. So um, anybody that's interested in using a single family dwelling as a commercial hospitality establishment would have to apply and obtain a conditional use permit process. Um, we've all always required fire sprinkler systems to be installed in those commercial hospitality establishments. I've been with the county as the building official and the director of development services for about two years. And I wanted to follow this process and actually get this formally adopted through or allowed to be adopted through state building code council because of the statute requires it and continue allowing people to submit for these uh, commercial hospitality establishments to be regulated under the residential code versus trying to whittle down the square peg and get it into the round IBC hole, uh, which seems to be a lot of struggles with other jurisdictions. So. Um, with that, I'll I'll leave that and I'll re remain on for any further questions of the of the council. Okay, and Chris, just for clarification for me, the Unified Development Code Section twenty three hundred eight two twenty subsection C that's referenced, that's Grant County's code that is specific to land use. That is correct. Okay, thank you, Micah. Go ahead. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Chris, uh, for putting this together and working with through this with my questions. Um, you and I discussed in an email item two a little further, and you had sent me a revised version that removed sentence two, where I had pointed out that it seems that the um, P2904 13D would satisfy the flow requirements and it would have to meet them. You sent me a revised version that said, yeah, I see how that's redundant, and I removed that second sentence, but in this version, you're maintaining that second sentence. Um, are, are we going to remove that second sentence of item two, or you wanted to leave it as well? No, I would like to. You're right. Um, now that I z zoom in on this document that's that's presented, the um, after that, that note, you were right that I agreed that it was redundant since the... the um, the AV 107.1 states that um, the the document that I sent back on October 13th actually had that last sentence removed. So we could, in essence, the installation of a P2904 or 13D sprinkler system shall satisfy the fire flow requirements would, would be okay to be removed. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. So for, for just clarification for a motion and coming up, um, removing the second sentence of item two is what we're talking about. So if, if Dustin, you have an opportunity to edit that document, that sentence would uh, be removed. Yes. Thank you. Beyond that, I had no additional comments. I appreciate Chris and their organization coming back and making modifications. I think this is going to capture what they uh, intend. At least that's my understanding. and. Once we hear from Damon or another public comment, I'd be happy to make a motion. So thank you. Excellent. Uh, Damon, go ahead. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Tony. Uh, this is a Grant County specific amendment. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Okay. We used to have a document on the site and I can't find it anymore. It was about 11 pages of all of the local amendments and it goes all the way back to 2003. So I, just, uh, Stoyan, if you could discover where that is at some point, I just that would be my only concern. Just as, as long as this is a, a Grant County specific, uh, I would be in favor. Okay, excellent. Any other comments from council members? Okay, um, at this time, we'll open it up for uh, public comment. 
Does anyone in the public like to weigh in on this? Okay, um, Micah, you have a motion for us? Absolutely. I'd like to make a motion that we support this Grant County proposed change as shown on the screen. Second. We have a motion and a second. Micah, would you like to speak to your motion? Sure, I, I think this meets the needs for Grant County and, and doesn't provide too many modifications that we cannot accept. And I appreciate Grant County bringing this forward. Damon? I have nothing to add. Okay, any further discussion from council? Okay, so the motion is to um, support the Grant County uh, proposed amendment. Uh, with that, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any aye. against? Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair and State Building Code Council for guiding us along in this process. It is much appreciated. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for getting those documents back to us in a timely manner. Appreciate it. Oh, you bet. Okay, we will move on to agenda item number six. This is to discuss potential changes to the State Building Code Council bylaws, policies, and procedures. And uh, Stoyan, would you like to start us off on this? Yes, and I will start with a question. I uh, posted on the website and I sent the council members. It's a short presentation how other states are doing this and uh, uh, a summary of the SBCC filings with the court revisor's office. Do you think it will be beneficial if I show this on the screen or we can go directly to uh, the calendars and, and the I, I'm okay with that. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. So you, you want me to show the the. Yes, please. That'd be great, Stoyan. Yeah. Thank you. So this is again very short presentation that will show you how other states are doing this. Uh, this is Oregon. Uh, we have uh, nine codes adopted in Oregon. Oregon uh, 11 uh, staff members assigned to different codes. And uh, we have three code boards uh, that appoint members to nine code review com committees. So it's similar to our uh, technical advisor groups, uh, but uh, with a little bit, little bit more stuff involved in this. Uh, with Idaho, uh, we have 13 codes adopted in Idaho. Uh, each court has one manager and four staff members, so they don't work in a, a, a different codes at the same time. Uh, Idaho has a 10-member code board, and uh, the Division of uh, Building Safety is responsible for proposing and amending uh, building codes. Uh, our code proposals go before the Idaho uh, State legis uh, Legislature for approval. So it's similar to us, but we uh, don't wait for approval. Uh, in Idaho, the State Legislature approves the codes. In California, we have 13 codes. Uh, the California Building Standards Commission uh, has uh, 16 staff members, which includes the Executive Director. Uh, six Code Advisory Committees are working on the codes. The Code Advisory Committees of doing just advising, they don't they don't do anything else. Uh, they don't develop proposals. They don't uh, uh, change proposals. Uh, we have uh, state proposing agencies in California, twelve of them with about sixty staff uh, total. In average, five uh, the state agencies, so they get the proposals already. Uh, prepared with the cost benefit analysis, and, and uh, they have nine point criteria similar to what we have, but it's already prepared. So the Bloom Standards Commission only evaluates and, and votes, don't make any changes. That's very important. The last bullet point uh, the California Building Standards Commission doesn't adopt the FG code. Well, they formally do, but uh, 
uh, before uh, the California Building Standards Commission, the California Energy Commission, uh, which is another adopting agency in California, develops the California Energy Code in appliance efficiency regulations. And there are about 100 people, staff, plus and minus, and get that, they have 45 attorneys working on this and they have a full-time attorneys. These 45 are not for the energy corps only, but they have full-time attorneys working on the energy corps only. So we can't compete kind of. In Montana, we have a, a, a 12 member building code council that establishes and enforces 13 codes. Uh, nine staff members work on multiple codes. Uh, staff decides what parts of the code to adopt. Uh, staff presents their findings to the code council, and staff also conducts three, four in person meetings around the state uh, to get feedback on the, uh, on the code proposals. In Nevada, we have nine codes adopted in Nevada. Uh, the state has a seven member public works board and a director of the uh, Department of Administration. Uh, the state building official proposes code amendments, and there are no subcommittees for technical review of codes. The Public Works Board uh, uh, doesn't amend the code. There are 11 staff members to help with code adoption, original amendments, uh, permits, plan review, and inspection. So they have more staff, but they, they get involved in the enforcement. Uh, in Utah, uh, the Utah Uniform Building Code Commission has 13 members and adopts six codes. Uh, there are six advisory committees which make their recommendations to the commissions. The commission will then approve or disapprove the recommendations. After the codes are approved by the commission, they are sent to the Utah legislature. Uh, the legislature formally adopts the codes. There are only two staff members for the commission, a secretary and a bureau manager. So. I think we're looking to get more here. In New Mexico, we have five codes adopted in New Mexico. Uh, the New Mexico General Building Bureau uh, not only adopts, but also enforces the building codes. There are five bureau chiefs responsible for the code adoption. Uh, the General Construction Bureau Chief works closely with the technical advisory groups. Uh, New Mexico is contracting with Excel Energy to create their energy code. So the energy code is developed by somebody else, by a third party, and only uh, approved uh, by the state. In Massachusetts, uh, seven codes are adopted in Massachusetts. The state has uh, an 18 member building code council, 11 member subboard reviews and recommends proposed code amendments, but the council formally uh, adopts the codes. There are 12 staff members working on the code proposals, staff supplies, uh, public comments, and the draft code to the subboard. Uh, the subboard holds a formal vote on each code proposal. Uh, the final draft goes to the building code coordinating council and they vote on all changes. The council sends their final draft to the Secretary of Finance and the process takes about 12 to 18 months. Uh, in New York, nine codes adopted in New York by a 17-member New York Fire Prevention and Building Code Council. The 14-member code development unit uh, assists with writing. So this is this is the staff, 14 member, assists with uh, writing codes, provides technical support, evaluates proposed uh, code changes, and reports to the code council. The codes uh, are adopted in accordance with the New York State Administrative Procedures Act, similar to they have a similar administrative procedure side, similar with us. Uh, in Florida, six codes are adopted in Florida by 19 commissioners. There are six staff members who analyze and update the codes. The codes are updated every three years. I will I'll go back and say that most of these things that they already uh, addressed, they have the they have a three-year code adoption cycle. Uh, the adoption process takes about two years uh, in Florida. There are 11 technical advisory committees. Code changes are presented to each designated technical advisory uh, committee, I assume. Uh, then the uh, technical advisory committees uh, present their findings to the building commission. 
additional duties of council staff is to update the code changes and provide them to the ICC for publishing. Uh, in Arizona, Colorado, and Texas, uh, building code adoption takes place at the local level. Each jurisdiction adopts formally their codes. Uh, Texas building codes are not reprinting, they are adopted by reference. Uh, the code can be accessed uh, via the published website. And this is the last slide I have. And this was developed by Chris. Chris doesn't work for us anymore, but she did a good job on this uh, on this uh, presentation. And uh, the other thing I want to share, uh, Rosanna uh, spent some time and did a good job to put together all filings that we had. Oh, uh, Tony, I see Micah. Yeah, Micah, go ahead. Thanks. I, I know we got a lot to present here, and I know you got a lot of documents, but can we talk about the presentation for a moment before we move on from it? Sure. Of course. Oh, okay. One one thing I had a question of, if if you could provide a little quick information, if you've got it offhand, is I didn't see Washington State in there and what we actually have, no. um, which would be informative to the public. I, I know that we adopt, I want to say, is it nine, eight or nine codes? And oh, we sorry. have, I believe, yes, it's really 10 codes. go ahead. Sorry. sorry to cut you off. Ten codes, okay. we have the, the fuel and gas code also, which is uh, adopted with the mechanical. Okay. It's a, it's a standard. So we adopt 10 codes. If I'm, am I correct? We have seven tags currently or more tags? Uh, with the we, I think we have eight. Eight tags and three committees, the BFP committee, plumbing, mechanical committee, and is energy, I can't remember, two committees. Um, so, that, so that does give us a comparison. I think your presentation is fantastic in that it shows that the SBCC staff needs to be increased. Their budget needs to be increased and the staffing needs to be increased. I mean, you look at these other states that somewhat are similar to ours in at least the number of codes. However, I think there are very, very few states that have more advanced or advance more codes than Washington does and Washington State as a as a whole does for our national level code changes. I, I'm heavily involved in that and, and a lot of our groups are. Um, I think it just shows that we get a lot done with very little staff and a lot of volunteer hours. But I think that needs to shift a little bit. You know, Stoyan's talking about the need, and we'll hear further on in this presentation about the need, at least in my opinion, what shows the need for more staff, more funding. Um, maybe maybe some of the ex-officio members, some of the representative centers can speak up and, and say, yeah, we'll support this, <laughs> getting more staff, more funding. I don't know. Who knows? I think it's a great idea, but Thanks for the presentation, to, uh, presentation Stoyan. Um, we are a national leader in codes, and it just goes to show we do a whole lot with very little, and it would be nice to um, have a more robust staffing and funding for the SBCC as a whole. I have a whole lot more to add, but um, I know there's a lot of hands that just went up, so thanks. Thank you, Micah. Uh, and quickly, I didn't hear the part. What is what is your staff numbers up to right now, Stoyan? Uh we have funding for uh, three code specialists. Currently, we have two uh, and uh, two administrative assistants. Thank you, Stoyan. Jay, go ahead. That was my question. Thank you. And Chell? I guess <clears throat> if they have more staff, then they have more funding. And I guess, do we know how these all these staff members in other states are funded? Hmm. Good question. Stoyan, do you know the funding in those other states? The only the only comparison I can do is with uh, California. Uh, the uh, staff at the Building Standards Commission uh, starts with nine thousand per month, and this is the lowest one. Well, taking for administrative assistance that make like six or seven, but the, do you know how they get the funding though? To the funding, the funding is uh, uh, from the general budget and only for the uh, California Green Building Code. Uh, they get their funding from building permit fees. Got it. Okay, uh, Representative Ramel. Oh, thank you. Um, since since we we're kind of uh, invoked there, uh, Micah's comments. I, I thought I'd just mention or uh, 
maybe remind Stoyan, I volunteered to help with um, budget requests um, to support the Code Council in the past. That offer stands. Um, I, I would say it's it's super helpful when uh, requests like this are in the governor's budget. Um, that makes it easier for us to say this is what the agency is looking for and what they need, and we know uh, what they will do with it. Um, I don't know if you've got any update on whether a expanded staffing or other agency needs will be included in the in the budget. I mean a very uncomfortable position because the council is asking for money, but the budget requests are going through DES and the DES and the Office of Finance Management, our account is healthy. So nothing goes through. I don't know. I'm not a budget specialist, but um, based on my conversations, that's what's happening. We, and I, I, I hit the budget, I hit the budget uh, uh, later. Uh, I can share some information. We have $1.2 million in the account. It, it, it seems healthy, but it's not really because we've been understaffed in the last two and a half, almost three years. Uh, we didn't have the travel, so we have, we have like 300,000, 350 there. And when we add the uh, expenses for the third general's office, it doesn't, it doesn't look that healthy. So the number look healthy, but in reality, not real. And and this is this is with the authority to spend. So I can't. I have specific. I I don't have the numbers right now. Uh, I wasn't prepared for that. But I have authority to spend. So I can even if even if I'm allowed to spend more money for stuff, I I have specific authority. I can't go above that. I I will just reiterate. If you're interested in that advocacy, um, we can we can talk offline. We can get. Um, you know, legislative folks involved as well. I will appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so I I'm going to this summary. So this is this is what we have. So it's not the numbers you see here in the right column. It's not how many rules we filed. This is how many filings. Uh, for example, the 2021 code adoption, it seems a little, little, little bit too, mu too much here, too many uh, filings, but so we may have uh, mistakes here and there, but one rule, one code needs at least three filings. So we file a CR 101, we file a CR 102, we file a CR, the CR 103. Uh, so the emergency rules are different. We file the emergency rule, and, and if the council feels this is uh, an important rule, we start working on an off cycle rule to uh, uh, do the permanent adoption. So, this emergency rules doesn't mean we file 23 different rules, although we are close to that number, but it means like we filed and refiled 23 times. And for this emergency rules, sometimes is too difficult because we we follow the council direction, but we also follow the uh, uh, code revisor's office uh, uh, policies and procedures. And sometimes we just cannot file the emergency rule. We are looking for loopholes. We're trying to find something to file it. So this is something that I want to discuss with the council members uh, or later. The off cycle rules, 28. We have 28 filings. That's for two and a half years. It seems too many. So when I complain about those cycle rules, it's not necessarily whether or not it looks good. I complain because of uh, staff having really hard time to file uh, uh, these rules. For example, we're already, we adopted 2021 codes. They're not effective yet. But if we have an off cycle rule or an emergency rule for 2018, <clears throat> that for a code advisor's office, this doesn't exist anymore. You know, we have a new rule that is filed, so it's it's difficult to get the documents from the code advisor's office and uh, all the typing services, how it's called. So again, I don't want to get into too many details, but staff has big issues with that. Expedite rules, these are, you know, we're correcting errors, uh, still too many. Uh, new effective dates, we have 17 uh, so far. Uh, the code adoption was 
29 total, 124 filings. And for for comparison, for comparison purposes, I will show you 2018. And for 2018, we have two emergency rules versus 20 plus. And now we have 13 off cycle rules, 14 ex expedited rules to fix some issues. And this is the uh, code adoption 32. Again, we may have a plus minus um, because it's difficult to track uh, the CR103s, whether or not they are for uh, uh, the regular rulemaking for the off cycle rule. But the total number we have 71 uh, in 2018. For 2015, uh, we, have, we have a little more than that. We have one, uh, let me show you 2015. We have 105, but we have too many emergency rules and off-cycle rules related to two items. So we, are, we kept refiling uh, uh, code provisions for uh, uh, fire alarms and uh, marijuana. Uh, related uh, proposal. So this is the only reason we have like 40, 45 extra here. Without this, uh, we would be uh, about 70. Okay. Um, Micah, go ahead. Thanks, Tony, for putting those numbers together. I, I have several questions. On the 2021 filing during the 2021 document, we're showing new effective dates. However, we're not showing any new effective dates for the 2018. The, do the 17 new effective dates here also include the two modified effective date filings for the 2018 code adoption? For the 2018, they just weren't during, for the 2018 code adoption cycle, we, we did the effective dates differently. Uh, and uh, we didn't, uh, Crystal, was it with emergency rules, or I think it was with uh, expedite rules, wasn't it? It was uh, emergency rules, and the only thing they did was go in and change the date on the effective date, but then, according to the code revisor, the code, in effect, was still the 2018 code. It just... So, so this way, the way we did it this time allows the uh, previous code to sh still be shown and to be shown that it's still in effect. So when okay. we have two emergencies, we, uh, again, Micah, we may have missed a few. It was uh, a last minute effort to put everything. So uh, if if we that makes sense. Uh, sorry, I didn't hear it. No, I was just saying, okay, that, that makes sense. And then a second question would be, I don't see the 2015 document on the website. However, you're indicating that there was 105 filings in 2015. Would, uh, if we look at the overall, it would seem like the 2018 code adoption cycle was the anomaly and not the standard. <laughs> would be would be more what I read from those three code cycle, at least filings. So to say that 2000. You know, the 2021 cycle has a whole lot of filings. It, it is higher than the 2015, but the 2018 seems very low comparative to the other two code cycles. The, so thanks for the information, and, and I appreciate it. The, just to clarify, uh, the, the, this is why for 2015, and you don't have 2015. I, I uh, worked on it last night. It was too late. Uh, so uh, I intentionally put the uh, off cycle and the emergency rules here again this. We have 22 emergency rules and 21 off-cycle rules, but most of those, they were related to two simple items. It was the marijuana processing and uh, um, uh, fire alarms. Krista, was it for schools? I think it was, right? I think so. Uh, so we kept refiling uh, the emergencies, but they were only two emergencies. Just the refiling was... Uh, 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 kept going because we were working at the same time uh, on the off-cycle rules and we were kept updating, we kept updating the off-cycle uh, rules and uh, filing new rules because there were some issues with the sections adopted, but these are related to two single items only. Okay. So with the off-cycle rules, you indicated that the code revisor office is only allowing us to technically file off-cycle rules that are 
on the code that's in effect when those are filed. In other words, you're saying we, I'm still struggling with the whole, we can't adopt something, an off cycle rule or an emergency rule to the 2018 code because to the code revisor's office, it doesn't even exist. However, to every jurisdiction in the state, that still exists. We're still getting projects vested to that code um, up until at this point, March 15th of next year. So I, I, I really struggle with that. And I, I guess the question would be, how do we get that changed? Is that some type of, of legislative language that needs to be modified for rules that apply to the code revisor's office? It just seems that we can't effectively do our job or our positions here at the State Building Code Council when it comes to modifying something we have to enforce. When we adopt uh, an emergency rule, the emergency rule doesn't even show up in the WAC. And you're right, we have jurisdictions, but when you go back, the emergency rule is not there. It's it's already, the new rule is is is, is there. So uh, we will meet with the code revisor's office again. We. We didn't want to bother these folks anymore for these weeks because they helped us a lot and the effective dates. But we we're planning to have a discussion. We started talking about adopting the building codes by reference to find the right way not to publish the code language, but have it on the SBCC website that will show, okay, this is, for example, 2018, this is 2021. So this will help us a lot, but we are currently we don't we don't have the solution yet. Thank you, Storm, for all the information. So uh, can I go further? <clears throat> do do you have yes. more questions? Okay. Uh, so I want to go to the all changes to the bylaws, if I can get it on the right screen. Sorry about that. Okay, so it's a it's a big document. It's I, I know it needs a lot of time to absorb it, uh, absorb everything, uh, and and I'm sure the council members uh, will have disagreements uh, here and there. Uh, but I I wanted to start the discussion. We had several meetings with the work group that was uh, helping me put this together. We we didn't even have votes, but we had like brainstorming sessions and. I was talking and talking too much, I would say, and and I, I, I was listening. So um, we didn't go through the entire document, but I think this is a, a good start. And I can explain the reason for each of these uh, proposals. But for today, what I want to ask the council, and of course I can answer your questions, but what I, I what I want to answer uh, ask the council, I need a direction. Uh, if the council wants to uh, downsize the number of technical advisory groups and combine some advisory groups, and, and here I have three options, and option one was the one that the, the work group agree, agreed on, and I have two others just in case for, for discussion purposes. The second question I will ask the council, if the council wants to downsize the number of technical advisory group members to 11 or 15, whatever the, the, the appropriate number is, uh, because uh, the example is the energy code, we have more than, Krista, more than 25, I think. You know. I think one has 25, one has 22. Yeah, one has 25, one has 22. And the, the intent here is to have all technical advisory groups consistent with the number of the technical advisory members. Uh, group one and group two, we discussed this at the, uh, with, with the work group, uh, and I think the agreement was to keep with group one and group two, and uh, just in case, I developed two schedules, two calendars, one if we have group one and group two, and one if we 
uh, uh, we were still staggering the codes because start can't work on the codes at the same time, but it won't be group one and group two. And I not, now, Michael is a huge fan of group one and group two, and I uh, I can do both ways, but my concern was when I got the schedule for uh, the ICC adoption, it's different for 2027 20, code adoption. I, I don't, I don't know if we can meet this. We can so then if the intent for group one and group two is to align with the ICC adoption, I don't know. I don't know how we can do it with with the current with the current schedule. And again, uh, I'm not the smartest one here, so I, I'm just uh, sharing my opinion when I see the schedule. Uh, and when you when you see the the calendars, this is what we have for uh, group one and group two, it's posted on the website. It will need some updates, but it's a, it's an early calendar. So with group one and group two, the goal is to adopt group one in 2024 and group two in 2025, but we, we can't, I did my best to put the schedule and finish in 2024 for group one, but we can't do that. It, it just doesn't, it just doesn't work. So we will have a few months, like four months overlapping. And uh, the best case scenario is to adopt the codes in October. And this is really uh, a wish uh, uh, for the moment. And if we have, the other calendar that doesn't have group one and group two. Uh, I don't know why my calendar is in the wrong page, but. <clears throat> so we don't have group one and group two. The highlighted areas are areas where we can, we can save a little bit more time because for example, the submission period is three months here instead of two, two months. Uh, Micah mentioned during one of the meetings that there won't be enough time for uh, uh, folks to evaluate the new codes and 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 uh, uh, submit a proposal. So I added one more month here, and the tax reviews here we have August, September, and October three months. We may be able to do it for two months, uh, but uh, the goal was to adopt everything by June, and. Uh, it, it was difficult for June, so in the original schedule, I had it in July, and uh, uh, Chell raised the concern that in July, it was July 20th, I think, it's, it's, a, it's a vacation time, it will be difficult to uh, reach the, uh, to, to have the quorum, so we, we pushed it a little bit, so it's uh, uh, September, we can adopt in September 2025. <clears throat> And we will be able to publish the codes with ICC and IAPMO by January, and we'll, we'll leave five months, uh, five months uh, for local code adoption training and education. So I will summarize everything that I'm saying. I, well, I'm, I'm I'm mumbling, I would say, but if if we have group one, group two, I will ask the council to start discussing changing the effective date because with group one, group two, we won't be able to meet July 1st and we will start having the same complaints. Not enough time for training and education, not enough time for publishing the codes. With only one group, I think we will be able to meet the July 1st uh, effective date. Uh, the last thing is, currently we publish the insert pages. They are really difficult, not because putting them together, they are difficult because of formatting issues. Uh, I assume everybody wants to have uh, uh, Washington custom codes. It's possible. Wabo uh, did a good job working with ICC. We, were, we, we got involved at one time. We were, we were helping, we we're doing our, our best. It's good to have published Washington custom codes. Uh, if uh, the council can uh, direct staff to start negotiating contracts with ICC and IAPMO. We can do that. I already started talking to ICC and IAPMO about that. I have some idea how we can do it. Uh, 
if the council wants us to keep developing the insert pages, that's cool too, but we can't adopt, uh, we can't develop both. So we can't develop insert pages and uh, 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 publish, publish the codes and I'm, I'm done. A again, I will answer your questions if you can questions. Okay. Thank you, Stoyan. Uh, Craig, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm kind of going to the end game. I, I'm expecting at some point, Stoyan, you are going to say, I need this many staff for option one or option two or options three. I'd like to understand that because right now we've got three options without the context of what you need to meet those and group one and group two and things like that. This is all done without context. I, I clearly, I, I'm with Mike. I think we are underfunded and understaffed, right? But I don't know if all of these options mean I need 10 more staff or three more staff, or we do it less staff. So I'd like to get some kind of context as to how we best support you and get you the right number of staff based on these options. It looks to me like each of the options are gonna require different amounts of work. And we now, you know, Chell and you and different people in this room have been through two or three code cycles. So the information you have about uh, rulemaking and different things like that, we have a pretty good context of what's gonna take to roll out the next one you know, average, right? I don't care how you do it, but say, okay, in order to do all of this stuff and not, we need to, you know, get some controls. I can do 17 emergency rules. I can do 13 with the staff I got now, or I just can't do it with the staff now. Tell us, and I think, I really appreciate what Representative Romel said when he said, you know, he's going to, he's going to go to bat for us and give us some really good help, but we got to give him a target. So I'm hoping at the end of this discussion, maybe not today, but I think at the end of this discussion, in order to support your program, we need to know what you need. And some of our decisions you're going to, I think, are going to be asking us to make. are going to say, which option do you want? And we can't make those decisions without the context of what you need to achieve those options and the, the, the different things you got going on. So uh, without causing a lot of work, I, I, I would like to understand what you need and uh, certainly take advantage of using the offer by Representative Rommel. And uh, then I'll also look at why do we need to hit every cycle? Maybe that's a real crazy question. Why we're not going to get 2021 code out until 2024. What if we skip a cycle? And then we have to do some emergency rulemakings and things like that. Is there a more economical, not in terms of money necessarily, but in terms of effort and effectiveness that we could approach as a state that doesn't have this high level? Because I, I can tell you, watching the sausage being made this time, Chell and Tony did a great job getting us through, or we did, but I think we missed uh, some opportunities because we had to rush to get to a, a mandatory deadline that I don't think really benefited the process. Uh, Does that make sense? Yes, the schedules you saw, yeah. they, they are uh, for the current staffing. So three code specialists uh, and <clears throat> uh, two administrative assistants. And uh, I have, uh, I have uh, 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 Code development background, so I, I I can help with the with the codes. Okay. Uh, I don't know if we have uh, a managing director that is good with that administration, but with no code, code background, I don't know. I, I can't predict that. But the the schedules you have are based on the current staffing. Well, minus one person, it's not only the funding; it's difficult to find these code specialists. It's we've been looking for a long time. It's difficult. It's a very specific job. It needs a lot of time for training. It needs uh, uh, self-education. Uh, it needs uh, uh, a concentration. It takes between, it depends on the person, it takes between two, two and three years to train a person that will be good with, uh, with the code development. So we should steal Micah from the city of Seattle. And no, I'm thinking the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure Micah, uh, Micah will say the same thing. Uh, how many? We how many more? We can do. We can do with the current staffing. If we, if the council can carefully regulate, evaluate and regulate those cycle rules and the and the emergency rules, because not all rules that sound good, right? They're really uh, necessary, in my opinion. Well, you know, I would for you know, this is the contractor in me, right? Saying, okay, we're going to agree. We're going to allow ten emergency rules over this code cycle. So then we have to prioritize which ones we run through emergency and you're somewhere gonna say, no, they happen, they'll happen next time as part of the regular code. Uh, we could I'm, we put some limits on ourselves. I'm sure if I if I say that that the code users they don't 
the quote users like the they like they would like to know what the council is doing. Okay, we have three year code adoption cycle. Keep it three year. We, we we need the cleanup. So California has 18 months cleanup. Keep it once per year. That's okay too, but let the code users know with this off cycle emergency rules, we're constantly on rulemaking. So think about we want to publish the codes, right? Online codes, the online codes are with colors, but I don't know for how long ICC can keep the colors because they're not considered ADA compliant, right? okay? So uh, other states have colored pages, but again, they don't have 15 off-cycle rules. We will run out of colors okay. if, we, if we keep adding color. Right? But we, can, we, put, we can put caps on some things and say no to a bunch of things. That's a long conversation, but uh, you know, you are pretty really combined. Can we, can, can we right? combine? Can we combine? Can we skip 2021? Well, we spent millions of dollars working on it. We, we spent millions of hours. I'm not suggesting skip 2021. We're already late. I'd say skip 24. I, I, it's, it's, I have my opinion, but I don't want to. I don't well, want to. I'm asking your opinion. So, answer, please. My opinion, uh, my opinion is if we are on a three year code adoption cycle, keep it three years. Uh, discuss the effective date very carefully and keep it three years. Uh, if we need a cleanup cycle, we can do a cleanup cycle. It's up to the council members, but too many emergency rules and too many off cycle rules are not good for the code users based on my experience with the codes, based on the emails and the phone calls we're getting here. Uh, it was the, the same in California. I know a little bit about New York. It's the same thing. It's the same issue. It's everywhere the same. You personal know, opinion my core is simple usable and effective right and if that means we simplify to to fit a budget and the number of people you have that's what we have to do i it, it, we strive for that that has to be done here in this group and today's not the day to solve that but I, maybe we get creative and aggressive at finding a solution to get you the right people and do it in a disciplined way so we don't have so many emergency rules and things like that that are, that are a distraction to the overall process there, I don't know that you completely avoid them. Cap them or do we something. Can't completely avoid them, but uh, again, uh, as a personal opinion, council members need to evaluate later what is really necessary. You ask me how, how many more staff. I have great staff, great administrative assistants. Kristen and, and Dustin. Dustin is new, but he's 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 great. Yeah. And we have one missing position. We have the funding for that. And if we want to do a good job, again, personal opinion, we may need two more. I don't need 15 because they're yeah. difficult. To that's, a, that's reasonable, two, right? Two, two more, and we will do everything. Uh, group one, group two, group three, group five, I don't mind. We will do everything if we can uh, have in. Uh, uh, currently, if I'm busy with something, Dustin is working on. Yeah, okay. Right? Eight calls. There you go. Well, he's good, but he makes mistakes because it keeps going something. I've never seen him make a mistake. Oh, well. He, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Okay. You don't. And, you know, extending, I don't know what the cost impact to you is to have 25 people on a couple of tags. That seems crazy. To One me. person on two calls is, I think, to do a good job is the limit. Again, based on experience, I, I may be incorrect here, but this is how I feel about it. Okay. Well, your, your input is important. And I think to have what I'm saying, 25 people on a tag in two different groups, because that's too many people to be effective. And so I would, I'm wide open to slashing to be a, a efficient and effective, right? They still need to be effective. That needs a lot of input, but I think you get too big in a committee and it cannot function. It just grinds to a halt because, you know, there's just a lot, a lot of voices that are in conflict and will never resolve anything. So, you know, the motion comes up at some point to reduce the number of tags. I don't know about that because it seems like our tags run fairly efficiently and you start to bundle them together. Maybe it's harder, but, you know, the, some of the guys who are running them, I think, would have a stronger opinion. But 25 people in a tag just seems overwhelming to me. I don't know how you manage that. So there you go. That's way too much talking for me. <laughs> Thank you, Craig. Uh, Todd, go ahead. Uh, thank you. And Craig, you made, made some really good points there. I'm, I'll, I'll start by saying I, I, I very much favor the three-year cycle. I think there's a lot of, of strong arguments why we need to keep on that pace. But but what I want to uh, give a little commentary as, um, you know, Stoyan, I think you mentioned, well, first of all, thank you for all this. 
you mentioned there's agreement in the work group. I, I I don't know that I agree on on a two group process going forward. So I think I'm I'm have been and 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 will be an advocate for for doing one group. And and the the, the main reasoning is um and Craig, you're, I think you're right. We need to pick a schedule and then and then shape you know the shape the resources around around that strategy. So I think it is important we very soon pick a you know schedule. Obviously. The main thing in my experience is um, um, it's it's confusing to have two cycles. I mean, those of us that are uh, that are aware of and track the ICC process, uh, it seems logical, but they put a lot of resources behind the the two year, the two year, the two groups, uh, and doing repetitive, you know, each year. It's hard at the state level where we have so many volunteers. Um, I, I think I, I fear that we we don't have consistency in, in the tags when we 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 need to. Uh, regroup them and go through the process twice. I think we lose a lot of people, so there's not consistency. I think that's same with the with the council because um, you know we do have people coming on and off the council very quickly, and they don't and often um, you know for example, I'll leave after a year, you know, after we start this process. So uh, I, I'm an advocate for sprints and phases. Let's let's do a phase, and we're gonna it's gonna be heavy lift on the on the submission period uh, for both for both groups, and then and. And move through like that so that we have plenty of time on the back end to avoid avoid what happened this last cycle. Um, and then the last thing I'll, I'll note is I think Stoyan's right. I, I I don't see the alignment. Mike is probably better qualified to to, to discuss this, but um, you know there were some proposals that benefited from being able to reference what was happening in the next code cycle in ICC last time. But with their with their committee meetings and in, in, in the combined going all the way into 2026, it's already too late for our cycle. So I like this accelerated idea. Thanks. Thank you, Todd. Chell? Yeah, I like what's been said. Um, just to confirm, the one to two, the group one and two version, the implementation date is likely September 1 of 2026, right? And the combined one is July 1, 2026. Is that your understanding, Soyan, based on well, I, my my intent with combining was to meet the July first uh, uh, FAQ. Yep. Again, won't be easy to achieve, but uh, that was the intent for Group One and Group Two. It yep. just, okay. it, and then um, both in your in this iteration could produce Washington code books. Is that? That's the final goal. Yes. Yeah, because that seems to be the intent. We've never voted on it, but that seems to be like what um, some people are pushing for. Um, so skipping a cycle, in my opinion, is not going to benefit the state because there's advancements in every code cycle. Um, it's great to hear that we're okay with the current staff if we don't do too many off-cycle rules. And I think to Craig's point, we could exercise a bit more rigor as the council and maybe we set an, an artificial limit. And of course we could go by it if we absolutely needed to because there's massive emergencies, but we could probably apply more rigor to a higher threshold internally for what we consider emergency or off-cycle rules. Um, I, I do think there is a money issue. Um, uh, we should be able to, we complain about it all the time, but we should be able to pay for cost benefit um, analysis of the energy code as we're going through it and not when we're totally done with it. Um, we should be paying a third party to check the codes, especially the energy codes, before we publish them. Um, other entities have volunteered to do that from time to time, but if we knew some entity was was ready to pay for it or ready to do that and do a you know one or two month look through the code, certain codes, and make sure that they're, you know, catch that those last 30 errata. Uh, so when we publish them, they're they're ready. Um, and we should have a third party do, you know, the efficiency through the energy codes as we're, as we're combining them and then updating the, you know, the proponents cost benefit analysis or, or providing a check on that. Um, because, you know, we, the, the tags modify the energy code proposals and, and that modifies some of the, some of the cost and some of the benefit and, you know, we're, we're not. We're not getting that in time for the um, for the tag to make decisions on it, and usually we're not getting that before the end of the or before the CR one or two process. And 
I think the council wants more information. And so that's where I see the money issue is we need to be able to pay these other entities to provide service and provide information so we can make good decisions as a council. Um, and then I guess lastly, I agree with 15 max per tag is, is probably a good, a good choice. Um, I get to um, chair the tags that have 20 some members on them and, and it is um, <clears throat> a lot of people. And, and that would not mean that the public and members of the tag or the public couldn't show up at the meetings and talk. We never, we have at the tag level, I don't think limited the public speaking on, on these issues. Um, so I, I think it would be fine to limit the 15. I don't think it would, it would, uh, it would hurt. It would probably just benefit a little bit better at uh, getting to people, the meetings and making sure we have the right voices represented on the, on the tag. So those are my opinions. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Quickly, before I go to Micah, on the in the bylaws as printed now, there, uh, and I could be missing it. Is there a there isn't a number set for the the tag? Is that correct? That's correct. We don't have a number. Okay. All right. Thank you. So that would be. Is that something that that we want published in bylaws, or is this just an internal procedure that we're we're kicking around? We can do both ways, but it's better if it's. Uh specify it in the bylaws so it won't open uh unpleasant conversations and uh sure. lawsuits, those, those kind of things many okay, of these you. many of these items that i'm proposing they they're not currently in the bylaw we can work without it i, I was just trying to clarify uh, uh, uh many things and i was coordinating with dirk and and uh, we talked yesterday and there are more items to be added to the bylaws. For example, you know, if we have a lawsuit, do we need to uh, schedule a special meeting each time where we need to act on something, or we can the council can establish a committee that that can uh, take this work. Uh, for example, and I want to clarify about the funding. So we we get our funding from the building permit. So I, I already mentioned in California they get only for Calgary, but not for the rest of the courts. I'm not. I don't want to ask for uh, more uh, uh, fees for the building permit. I think I think uh, it's 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 high enough, and uh, this is why it's complicated about the funding. When 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 you say okay, we can get some more money, but I don't want to ask for fee increase. Uh, that's important yeah and i'll i'll just say when i was suggesting more money uh be allocated i think you know the legislature has tasked the the building code council with specifically the energy code being a major policy lever uh that serves the state and reduces you know emissions and, and energy use and serves lots of purposes um, but has not separately funded that effort and i think um while other policies the state has that that have impact are funded so that's kind of where i'm coming from i agree that um increasing building permits fees is is probably not the right choice thank you Joe. micah go ahead sorry for cutting there that's okay i gives me time to formulate a whole lot more thoughts and try to write down so many responses um first i do want to thank representative Rommel for the offer to assist doyen to get additional funding even if it's you know, we, we don't want to see permit increase fees increase, but the permit fees are not major. I think it's like twenty five dollars or something simple. But at the same time, maybe general fund is where some funding needs to come from. I mean, when we're looking at other states and what they do compared to what Washington does, I, I think we're desperately understaffed and underfunded for the SBCC. As Chell mentioned, for the policies that we are directed to enact. Um, I, I have a lot of questions. First would be on the on group one, group two, I believe we are set in, in that right now. And we can't modify that even by voting today based on the WAC rules. We would have to go through a rule, rule change. Um, and when I say that, group one, group two are identified in WAC 5104020. It's already set. The only thing that SBCC can modify at this point would be the codes that are within those groups. 
I remember this change. I, I see historian highlighting it, unless otherwise directed by counsel. That is specific to the division of the two groups and the codes that are in there. I worked on that when that came through. Um, then, you know, the, the schedule that story is posting and talking about getting, whether it's Washington custom codes or, or insert pages, first, the insert pages can go away. The custom codes would be much, much better as, as mentioned before. Um, the implementation date for July 1st is set by the SBCC. That's not in the rules, that's not in RCW. What is in RCW is the December 1st date that the proposed changes need to be voted on by the SBCC by in order to sit through a legislative cycle. So the implementation date is set by council. We could make that later to allow for the opportunity for that training and for the custom codes and everything else. I believe that was a big, big concern this last cycle. I, I'm sure I've spoken to that. Um, speaking of Craig's comments about capping, Proposals, I don't believe we can do that based on RCW 1927 and that we shall look at amendments or proposed amendments is kind of how the language reads. And I'm not sure we could cap that in a meaningful way based on that RCW unless that RCW has changed. Um, one thing I heard is about the emergency rules and how there's a problem. Most of the emergency rules were bought, brought by the code users themselves. Those that are affected by these rules are the ones that brought in the emergency rules. For the most part, I know that Seattle Fire, we had a lot of stuff on emergency or the energy storage systems, which have increased a significant number of filings. However, again, those are identified items that we as a council agreed are important enough to bring forward in emergency rules, even if it increased the number of filings. Um, I agree with Chael that the, and maybe it was mentioned by someone else, that the tag should be capped at 15. That aligns with the 15 member votes for the SBCC as well. Um, like I said, just a ton. I got a ton more we can go through, but I, I, I want to let others talk. I think we're set at this point to, I'm not sure we could modify the group one, group two, other than the codes that align or are divided in those two groups. Um, and maybe that's something we have to discuss. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. And Jay, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. From previous discussions, we've heard from a set of jurisdictions that wants and needs insert pages. And it sounds from this discussion like we made the assumption that those aren't needed. And I wanted to confirm that that's changed. My recollection from the previous discussion a few months ago is that we heard from others that wanted a compiled code versus relying on third parties that provide that service. And that our work moving forward was tr to try to enable both. And I'm not willing to drop the insert pages until I hear from that constituency that was offering a lot of public comment that they needed that in that format. So I think we need to look at a path forward uh, that need that allows both. Also on the emergency rules, from looking at the history of the emergency rules after each code cycle, I observe that the biggest issue is when the SBCC is more or less developing policy versus accepting or modifying ICC code. Marijuana was an example of that. And afterwards, we adopted code. And then we saw a bunch of rules that we had to do as emergency rules thereafter to, to uh, revise as we were doing something new. We're seeing some of the same thing with will we in the energy code and given things like our legislative mandate on energy efficiency that is going to continue from now through through 2030, we're developing new code and we may need to revise that. I would rather plan for adoption, uh, plan for um, having to respond after adoption of these major codes versus some arbitrary limit on emergency codes. That said, I think we can be more justified. And as Chell had suggested, there may be some pre-work that could happen through outside third-party reviews and others that might help mitigate some of these issues. But um, I don't see that going away. And so I think we need to, uh, rather than try to restrict it, plan for it. Thank you, Jay. Um, quickly to the insert pages. If the publishing of the Washington State codes could be by way of 
the binder version or if the printings could be updated in the electronic copies, I'm okay with the no insert pages. My my issue is is the is the one printing of the binded book, and that makes it difficult to add and um, update the the user's book. That's my that's been my biggest hang up on that. So, but that's a good point, Jay. Katie, go ahead. Um. I uh, was kind of responding a little bit, I think, to Craig. So I, this is a while back. We were talking about limiting the emergency rules. And um, I think in the bylaws, we're trying to um, come up with a way to put some of the, um, not burden, but just the uh, that the proponents and uh, of the proposals need to also um, pull some weight so th so that they're coming with a full proposal. Um, and you know, I think Chell, you made a really good point about um, some of the analysis that needs to happen afterwards. But um, that was one way that we were trying to address on the bylaws um, committee, maybe. Uh, and then the training requirements and the ne the need to really remember we're we all remember we're gonna this board is gonna be fine with um an, analyzing emergency rules but as more board members come on that uh urgency will probably diminish over time so i think it's just important to keep that in the training um which we're also putting in in the bylaws um the need for ethical training which i know is different than uh than emergency rules but um and then the last thing, or two things, I agree, reducing the tag numbers to 15, 13 to 15 range or whatever it is, um, making sure that there's an odd number ideally is great. And then the last thing, we haven't gotten to combining the tags, which was a, actually the majority of our conversation the other day. So just wanted to um, also say that that um, is another area where um, you know, Stoyan, you asked to reduce the number of tags, and we didn't really land on something that actually does that. And so we wanted to get the full council's opinion about that. Um, and then I had big opinions about the uh, the timing um, and the schedule, but if it's outlined in the RCW, that really throws a wrench in it. So um, I don't know about that one. I would like um, Derek's feedback on that if he's prepared for that as far as what our ability is to um, to do those because I think Micah makes a strong point there and, and that, that can be a level of concern. So, um, and Senator Wilson, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I was just going to go back to the um, budgeting part of this. I like to see um, the accounting within D the DES budget and how it's appropriated. Um, the It is funded by the fees, we all know. And if you look at um, RCW 1927-085, it does say that every four years, the state treasurer shall report to the legislature on the balances in the account so that the legislature may adjust the charges imposed. Um, uh, I don't know where we are in that um, in in that process, so that would be um, interesting to know. Also, uh, I'm curious about how long has this position been open and not been and not hired someone? We have the funding for it, but we haven't hired the person. So, how long has that position been open? We we we've been looking for more than six months. Well. Since I started, we've been looking for that extra person. We had somebody, uh, didn't work out. So we will open again. Uh, we'll start advertising most likely next week again. But it's been minus one person for a long time. Long, long time. Oh, What's I would say two years, about two years. But And we've hired one person. They didn't work out. And so we're back to that. Within that two year, within that two year period. Okay, so how how do you how would you uh, expect to hire more people 
if we're unable to fill this position in two years, if you if you receive more money to hire more people. This is why I said it's not only the money. Well, it's it's all related to money. I guess folks don't like how much they will get paid. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and and it's a struggle not only in, in Washington State, it's it's everywhere. I, I don't know if Micah wants to share how he does that in uh in uh, uh, Seattle, but uh, and and we we upgraded the pay for the code specialists. Uh, was it three times? Mm. Since I started back in in twenty twenty, but there is still like almost three thousand difference. Again, I will compare with California because I'm aware of that. I don't know how other states are getting paid. We weren't able to get this information, but. If, if you have $3,000 difference with the neighboring state and California is also looking for this type of people, I mean, if it's me, I would go there. I won't, I won't, I won't be willing to work for Stoyan in this case. So it's all related to how much we're paying. Uh, currently, the position we have created to management analyst five, which is a high level state class, I don't know if we can go above that. Uh, if we want to pay more, we, we need to uh, figure out something else, a different position. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Todd, go ahead. I can yield to Micah if he wants to respond to that. OK. I, I will respond to that, but I did something else after that. Um, it, it is the money thing that Storian mentioned. Um, the level of technical expertise to get some type of code analyst or or the other title that Stoyan uses, it, those those folks that have that have the opportunity to make much more in in monthly income elsewhere than than the state position that Stoyan has you know funding for. Unfortunately, um, it does occur the same way at Seattle. Um, I, I believe Seattle does at this point offer more income than the state does, but uh, it does come down to that. It's very tough to get folks with that level of expertise for the funds that are being offered. Okay, uh, Todd, and then we'll go back to Micah. Okay, yeah, so real quickly, thank you. And Micah, thank you for, for being very clear on what is RCW in terms of adoption date and what is WAC. And I think, I think um, Katie, maybe, maybe you accidentally said RCW on the, you know, on the, on the group one, group two, but I would love to also hear Tony, you know, you know what the process of rulemaking would be to to change that. I think more importantly, I you know I think I made my opinion experience. You know um, I've shared that, and Micah obviously has an opinion also on Group One, Group Two. I'd like to hear from more council members, TAG members. Hopefully, we we can open this up to the public and 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 get feedback. You know I'm not taking a hard stance on it, but I'd like to hear more because um, as like the chair of the IBC TAG, that is one of those those. Um, that divides between group one and group two. So it that that that's one of the codes that actually is in itself divided, not just under one of the one of the groups. So thank you. Thank you, Todd. Uh Micah, go ahead. Thanks. I we do have some disagreements, Todd, but not very often. <laughs> um and it's not that I don't want to go to work for Stoyan. I really like where I'm at. I think that was mentioned earlier. <laughs> Um, I am not necessarily tied to group one, group two, but I think the previous discussions, you know, group one and group two are fairly new, but I think the more important part of this is that was discussed by others in the industry and industry stakeholders was that we align with ICC and the ICC code adoption cycle. I think the RCW and uh, the state building code act itself is the RCW indicates that we are to align with what the ICC does um, in some way, shape, or form. Does that mean we have to group our codes the same way? Not necessarily, but it is an effective method based on code development. And what I mean by that is usually you get a, a certain group of folks that are interested in code development. I know myself and, and Todd and, and Chael and others we not only work at the state level, but we do work maybe it's with jurisdictions, but also at the national level. So it's easy to bring forth good ideas to the state of Washington from elsewhere. 
And that's what we do at the national level. We'll work on national level code changes and we go, oh, that's a good idea. It's or 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 vice versa. A lot of folks take what we do from the state of Washington and city of Seattle and others, and they take that to the national level. Um, so I think it is important to align the codes that way if for those certain reasons. Are we do we have to stay tied to it? Not necessarily, but there are a lot of benefits to align the codes with what ICC is doing in the grouping. Just based off of that, you you can spend your time working on that and you don't have to go, oh, I'm going to go work somewhere on something else for the state and then come back to this later. You know, it aligns really nicely so you can, you know, be more efficient in what you're doing, especially when so many of us volunteer our time towards that co-development, not just at the state level, but at the national level. So um, there is some importance there. I think it's a benefit, but maybe there's something we can, you know, make more efficient for the state purposes um, moving forward. And I think that's why we're all here. And that's why we want to look at the bylaws. Um, that's what I've said over and over. Thanks. Thank you, Micah. Lots of good discussion. Um, we'll go with Chell and then I kind of have an idea on how to move some of this forward. Chell, go ahead. Yeah, Micah. So <clears throat> I couldn't tell explicitly from what you were saying. Are you more in favor of the combined group or the, the separate groups? At this point, I'm not sure we have the opportunity to, to do a combined group based on the WAC rules without going through a rule change, which would take too much time, considering we were have already supposed to have posted the next code cycle schedule in August of this year. And we're it, it's now the end of October, and we still don't have it even completed. So I would say at this point, we probably need to go with the, the two-group schedule, as indicated by Stoyan. And we could, you know, incorporate a later implementation date if, if the printing and training concerns were there, because I think that's a separate topic based on the schedule. Um, we still have to complete everything by December 1st of whatever year um, we get done or, okay. or need to get done. All right. I guess the way I read the, the law regarding those two groups, uh, the WAC, um, <clears throat> It says unless um, otherwise directed by the council for the two groups. But then the other thing is it says nothing about the, it says divided into two groups, but it doesn't say anything about what those two groups are doing. So the two groups could be concurrent. It doesn't say anything about that in the WAC. It um, doesn't say anything about doing one than the other or or the other than one. There's there's no requirements for for what, once you divide them in those two groups, what you would do with them. So I guess there's, it seems when I read this, there's two, two clear things that say we don't need to do group one and then group two. One is that it says nothing about that. It says nothing you need to do group one and then group two. Um, and the other one says, unless otherwise directed by the council. So I guess I, I'm not seeing that we need to divide them into, into two sequential groups. Okay, um, let's okay. do this. Go ahead, Micah, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, I thought uh, Chell was still gonna ask me a question, but I I agree with you, but I believe the understanding or from my understanding previously was they were developed this way so we could wrap up one and move into the other. So while we were working on the other, the group, say the group one codes could be going through all the filings, getting, you know, any any mistakes identified and getting those published or printed or ready for publishing and printing. Um, if we don't, then we did like we did this last cycle, in my opinion, where we continue group one into group two and we were trying to rush at the end. And then everybody's going, we don't have enough time for filings. We don't have enough time for public comment. We don't have enough time for changes. Um, that's my understanding of group one group two if you combine them all then we're still going to wrap up december 1st of the second year of code and we're still not going to have a time I, I i mean there's arguments that go both ways we're we're already past time that i think we should be allowed to modify the WAC and the scheduling for this for this next cycle um again we worked on these bylaw changes less than three years ago that added that language so we could change the the codes within the groups but my understanding wasn't to combine the group into one large group 
I worked on those bylaws at, at Den as well. Thanks, Jill. Okay, so Micah, it sounds like you're speaking a little bit from the intent standpoint, being that you were involved with that work group. Um, thank you for that feedback, and thank you, Chell. Dirk, I can't call on you fast enough. What's your take on this? <laughs> what can we do here? <laughs> I thought I saw you unmute for a little bit. The first, the first, the first thing I need to do is unmute my phone. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I haven't done a deep dive into the wax, and so tentative um, sense, though, is, is like shells on to something there is some flexibility within the rules council and its sound discretion can identify ways that make sense to efficiently um, you know move the process forward the wax do specify that there are two groups and it specifies which is in the two groups um, I'd submit there could be some creativity maybe uh, one of the groups could be uh, in one, a code Right, and then another the group could be the remaining codes. The dates aren't locked into the wax, and so as Chell suggested, there could be some creativity there, and uh, when the groups meet and, and when they deliver their product. And so, um, obviously, um, better and and uh, approach would be to amend um, in the wax, right? So to ensure um, full deliberation on on the process. In the, with, by the public and the like, uh, but at least as I read it, there is some flexibility in the wax now to to land on the process that that makes sense. Yeah, thank you, Derek. Okay, um, Katie's right. Oh, go ahead, Katie. Well, I wanted to hear what you said about me being right, um, but. Uh... <laughs> I was going to say, if we're going back and forth on group one or group two, to me, that indicates that systemically this isn't working very well. Um, just if every code cycle we're going like we can't do this in the time that we have. Um, so I'm just pointing that out. Um, the other thing and, and you know, so I, I think that uh, given that uh, you know, we did talk, you know, this is what our staff is asking for is the group one, or one group total. Um, and to me, that seems like, you know, they've been through the cycle, uh, Stoyan has in leadership now, and, um, Chris has been doing this for a long time. And in the meeting, we discussed that this is what our staff is asking for. And with all due respect to everybody working on these over and over the years, you know, they're the ones that have to do this work. And so I really defer to their uh, opinion about that. Um, and or, you know, we also talked about pushing the um, date back a little bit on the effective date by a month or two um, to give us that wiggle room and then really sticking to that. So um, that's the other option is pushing it to a September 1st, perhaps. Um, so just that, that's the idea that I wanted to share. Okay, thank you, Katie. Micah? Brian, can you post or show your combined schedule for us real quick? I, I, I think we, can't approve this either for another reason. Be, and, and if I'm incorrect, please correct me if I'm wrong. But I'm only seeing one submission period for proposed state amendments, April 22nd through July 16th for this schedule. Yes. Is that correct, Stoyan? Yes, but okay. you're going to six months. That's wonderful. I I will make my point. RC, or excuse me, WAC 5104020 item. B states that the schedule you're showing should have been posted in August, but it says including providing separate periods of at, less, at least 60 days for the submission of petition for statewide amendments for each group. Now, it allows you to adjust the timeline in that, our, that same language, but again, you have to provide two submission periods of 60 days each for each group. So this would have to be modified. So I don't think we can uh, approve that today unless we modify it and go forward. But but again, I, I'm still not clear whether we can even 
do this. You know, I do think there's some gray areas like Chell mentioned. So, but it's still not accurate this, to me. This schedule is for one group, not group one, group two. And yes, you're right. We need the rulemaking for uh, uh, modifying uh, uh, WAC 5104. But, you know, I, I showed you that we have 20 something emergency rules. Can we add one more? That will be important. There are options here in our regular rulemaking. Uh, we can complete by, I'm not sure if we can do it by the end of December, but I think that sometimes in January we can complete that if there is an agreement on it. And I don't wanna, I mean, I prefer group one group, but what they said at the beginning, if you wanna keep it group, group one, group two, we'll work on it, but you need to change the effective date because uh, we, when we get to December, 2025, folks will start asking for delaying the court. So it's it, it won't be a good service if we keep delaying every every court cycle. So again, if it's group one, group two, I would ask for a few more months to complete. Uh, if it's combined, uh, we'll do our best to finish on time with the July 1st, 2026 effective date. So it's it's up to the council members how they want it. Okay, so, quickly, just for clarity, Micah, sorry, before we move on, on in the WAC, can you please read that again? I'm sorry. Yes, the WAC states item B of, fifth, of uh, WAC 5104020 states during August of the year before the year of the model code edition, the council will post a timeline for group one and group two code update processes, including providing separate periods of at least 60 days for the submission of petitions for statewide amendments for each group. The council right. reserves the right to modify its timeline as it determines necessary and appropriate. And then it goes on to further talk about transmittal deadlines for group one and group two um, and go from there. You know, the other thing I was gonna, go the ahead. I, I had the, the separate is the what I wanted to see. I, I missed separate the last time, got it, go ahead. Um, the other concerns I'm seeing with, with group one is it gives exactly one year for the council and tags and committees to complete all the code changes and all their work, which we're doing in two years now. If you look at the schedule that Stoyan has proposed in the second year, 2025, majority of that work is going to be done by SBCC staff. I think to do you know, the wonderful job that all these volunteers do in effective code writing for Washington State and advancing our codes is very, very tough to, for those volunteers to do that amount of work in one year. And that one year is actually from January to December 1st is when we have to submit that to the state. So it sits through the legislative cycle. Now, if story and saying we got to we, we vote on it the following year. To sit through, we're still two years and waiting until December to get it done. I, I I just don't know what this does. I don't know what benefit it has, except spending a lot of staff time on it right now <laughs> and council time. Understood. I, I, by the sounds of it, because of the separate per periods of time needed for both groups, which is specified, um, I, I don't know that. Is anyone in disagreement that we probably can't go one group at this point? Again, this schedule is based on uh, assumption that the WAC will be modified. So with the current with the current WAC without the modifications, and you can tell that this area is highlighted in in uh, is highlighted uh, in my proposal. With the current language, this uh, schedule won't work. The assumption was if there is an agreement to go with one group, we would need to modify the WAC. CR one hundred one is already submitted. Uh, so this this schedule won't work with the current uh, with the current one. Okay, what's the what's a what's the timeline for adjusting the WAC? Uh, it will take uh, at least two months and not more than not more than three months. So that puts us into twenty four. Twenty twenty four. We are October, so November, December, January. Like about that time, and again. If there is a consensus, uh, an emergency rule is also also possible. 
Can, can okay. you imagine that I'm asking you for emergency room? <laughs> 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 well, yeah. I would uh, make a declaration of emergency on that. That's what well, uh, why did here. you say that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Krista, Krista is right. It's uh, it will be difficult to it will be difficult to uh, to put them so, on. So I'm going to get to Micah and Todd, but but one thing that I do want to try and pin down today. And and changing the whack obviously um, brings some um, uh, a little more importance to how we proceed with this as far as timeline. We need to figure out what our goal is today, as far as council action. Uh, first of all, in order to move this forward, and I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of second what Craig was doing earlier a little bit here. And, and I want to hear from staff what you want. And I want it to be pretty specific within the realm of what we're allowed to do with what Micah has brought forward, which I think are some very good points. But but are we expected to take council action today? Or is that what you're looking for, Stoyan? Because I'm, I'm looking at the calendar. And if we got to change wax, we got to move. I'm not expecting... Uh, a council vote on the proposal that I sent you. But I'm expecting some kind of a clarification what the council is willing to do. Again, group one, group two, cool. I, it's easier for staff, to be honest, on the, on the timeline. But the council needs to uh, discuss a new effective date because we won't be able to complete by July 1st. We will, we will be able to complete by July 1st, but we won't be able to publish the codes and have the same effective date because Michael will be the first one to say, hey, why would we have enough time for training and education? I agree with that. So group one, group two goes with a few more months for publishing and local adoption, training and education. If if you uh, want to take the risk and do group one, Michael is right, more work for staff. I take a risk here, but we can start working on the WAC <clears throat> modifications right away. Okay, but we can't publish a schedule, right? And we the can't... schedule the schedule last last code cycle we changed the schedule six times. No, understood, but we can't so go we out can't... and say group one when, when the WAC has to be changed. One group, sorry. We can't come out and go as a council today or next month or two months from now, we can't say we're gonna go one group when a WAC change has to be done before that's even possible. Otherwise, we're going against what the what the wax intent is. We 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 posted a schedule in September. Uh, uh, we were uh, one month late because we didn't have a council meeting in in August. So the currently posted schedule is for group one and group two. Understood. And the plan is to update the schedule in January because in January and we we do this anyway because in January we will have more information about you know which codes, model codes we will have, whether or not we will be working with ICC and AI on the publishing. So we'll have more information and it will be a better schedule, more specific. This is a preliminary schedule. Uh, I would uh, uh, refer to Dear here if he can hear us, but I was thinking about posting group one and group two and posting a message on the SBCC website that uh, uh, this may need to revise to be revised in January due to whatever the, the language will figure out. So again, Understood. if the agreement is group one, group two, less work for staff, but we need we need new effective date, in, in my opinion. And again, Understood. it's based on the current staffing. Yep. Okay. Okay. Dirk, do you have anything to say to that? Unmuting. You actually caught me at a minute where I had to step away for, for one minute. So you, you have to repeat that. My apologies. Stoyan was mentioning that. It's an uh, I did send an email to Stoyan that I was stepping out, but I know he's very busy right now. Okay. Um, Stoyan was saying, is it possible to post on the website that we're going, this is the group one, group two schedule. Uh, however, uh, Changes may be coming in January, depending on what council decides with the bylaws. Yeah, I think that that's fine. I mean, the the, the WAC provides the, the 
what Micah read was that there, there does by, by August, right, of the code adoption year, that, or the model code adoption year, that the schedules for separately for groups one and two posted, in, but they can be modified. And so I think what what Stoyan is proposing makes a lot of sense consistently. Okay, thank you. Um, Micah, go ahead. I, I did have a couple of questions. Um, do we we have to vote on the schedule, correct? It's already posted, but we never voted on that. It, do we have to vote on that? Is that an action that's required by council, Dirk? And then I had other comments, too. Mike, I'm looking at the, the WAC right now. I'm not seeing it anything in it that WAC that specifically requires council action for posting the, the time frame. I, I might be overlooking okay. it. Uh, I no, that's fine. I was just, I'm just curious. Though, that's fine. Yeah, I, I think that in the past there has been uh, council votes on the time frames uh, just as a formality, uh, and it, that might be uh, sensible to do here. Okay. And and I appreciate everybody's input. I know I talk a lot, but I would like to maybe hear from some members of the public. And But at, but before that, I did have a kind of a question on the WAC. Um, when we talk about modifying the WAC storing, or is the indication there that we would modify it to the proposed language that uh, is in the meeting or on the meeting website at this time, the, the, the number of pages there with changes that we still would have to go through? Uh, the WAC is in the last two, the, the proposals for the WAC uh, are in the last two pages. Uh, okay. And, uh, initially, initially, it, it had the changes right here for group one and group two. I just uh, uh, eliminated the proposed changes because uh, the work group kind of agreed and group one, group two thing. So I just highlighted it. So if we need to revise it, then it will be in this area right here. Thank you. I, I know there's some revisions on this document that need to be discussed and, and some revisions that aren't shown that I know the, the work group discussed. So um, I'll put my hand down and stop talking and hopefully we can hear from the public on the group one, group two item before we move into the proposed changes to the web. Okay, and, and I'm gonna call on Todd and Jay and then we'll open it up for public comment. Todd, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Quick question. Um, I need a refresher please on what sets the effective date? I, I I think I understand the RCW sets the adoption date in December 1st, but is the effective date, uh, we'd go to rulemaking to change that anyway, right? And is that part of a WAC or is that just simply part of the schedule that has to be changed? Thank you. The effective date, the effective date uh, doesn't appear anywhere. It's just a council decision. Uh, Christopher, how long we've been doing July 1st? Um. It's actually changed a couple of times. Uh, we generally go with the July 1st because it's after the end of the regular session, whether it's a long session or a short session. Plus, it's uh, a known date. It's a nice round number, you know, middle of the year. Uh, we've done June 30th. A couple of times just because of uh, other political timelines that needed to be met. Uh, and I think back in the 70s and 80s, there were a number of September effective dates, but they were also weird, you know, like September 17th and September 28th and they weren't the beginning or end of a month. Thank you for that. Do we go into rulemaking though to change that? No, no that's part of the regular rule adoption. There's a, a when we file the CR 103, we set okay. an effective date. Thank you. That's that's what I was looking for. Thank you. It goes with the council with the council decision, not in the bylaws, not in the law. Well, it will be in the WAC because it's part of the, the effective date is uh, uh, in chapter one of the building codes, but not something in the policies and procedures. Understood. Okay. Uh, Jay, go ahead. Uh, similar to Todd's question, I'm looking at the breakdown of the two schedules with the separate group one and group two 
Council takes final action in April and November. And then with the combined, the council takes final action in September of 2025. When we're looking at the difference on what happens with effective dates, does that mean group one and group two could have different effective dates? With uh, group one and group two, uh, because uh, you can tell, so there, there is there are four months overlapping. Uh, we, you have highlight, I highlighted this because if we try to save a month, then staff needs to do it faster. Uh, so we can, I mean, I, I can't guarantee we'll be able to do it, but April is the date we cannot pass that, April 25. Can we do it in March? Maybe in February? I don't think so. Uh, when we start working in, in group two, I don't think we can save time anywhere. And I have it in the schedule adopted by uh, in November because it, it, it's risky to do it. Well, in November is the last option. Can we do it in October? Maybe, but I can't promise that. It depends how many proposals we'll have. Do we need some extra work in the uh, 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 justifying documents, cost benefit analysis, small business economic impact statement. So plus minus one month, it, it, it depends. And uh, if we have it in in one group, uh, let me get that. So you can tell right here, we can, we have one extra month for submission period. So typically a submission period is 60 days, two months. I added one month because Michael was concerned that there won't be enough time for our uh, uh, stakeholders and code users to submit their proposals. I, I added one month. Uh, and August, September, and October, we have the TAC, TAC review proposals. But I highlighted it because I wasn't I wasn't sure if we will have the same number of technical advisory groups, eight, we will have less. Uh, so that's, can we save one month here? Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Uh, the adoption date here is in September. The goal was to have it in June. And because it was too risky in June, I put it in July. Chell raised the concern that it's, it's kind of a vacation month. We, we may not be able to have the schedule. It's It will be sad to make you guys and the 10 advisory groups working in the summer. So this is why it's in September. If we can get it done by June, great. It's it's even better because we have time for the publishing. The the preferable time, it's not a mandatory anything, but based on how other states are doing this, six months for publishing plus six months for uh, training, education, and local adoption. This is what I was trying to. Okay, so for given that six months, we'd be looking at. June, July of 26 is the effective date. July with with uh, a single with a single line, July 1st, 26. Okay. And then with the combine with the split, it could be end of year 25 for group one. And then well, group one or group later. Two, we will have different adoption dates for group one and group two, but we'll have the same effective date. So because group two will be adopted in December 2025. And between December and July 1st, we have only six months. So we, we won't be able to complete the code publishing and allow enough time for training, education, and local adoption. That's the main concern. Uh, if we can, let's say we have more staff. We are lucky and we hire two more people, right? Well, after we finish group one, the staff that works in group one can start working with ICC and the publishing. But for group two, we may have less codes for group two, but it will still be not enough time for group two, especially when you add the energy codes here. And uh, the, the energy codes are always complicated because the, the schedule you have on the screen right now, it's kind of excludes the second energy code. We need to fit it in somehow in the schedule. It's there, but we all know that we won't be able to do that because Three months submission period for two energy codes. I don't know if we can do that. And 
tech reviews, three months for both air codes. Can we complete that? I don't think in my opinion, but you are more qualified than me on that. Okay, that so, makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. We've done it in the past, but I can take it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Thank you. I think that stuff time current stuff group one group two works, but again, the effective date will have the same conversation, like you know, like the conversation we had a few months ago. Okay, and it sounds like we don't get any benefit on effective date with the split codes because the effective date needs to be the same. Uh, well, the effective, even group one, group two, again, we will have different adoption dates, but we'll have the same effective same date. Same effective date. For okay. scores, yeah. Great. Thank you. Chell, go ahead. Tony, I'm not sure if you were uh, thinking this, but it might be a break time. That's that's where I was going to go um, before going to public comment. Senator Wilson, um, would you like to speak first? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to clarify when this information was put on the website. Uh, I only received this, the detailed reports that uh, Stoyan sent out at 515 last night. So I'm just curious, are we within the open public meetings requirement of 24 hour notice? The information, the information, the information I'm talking about was uh, uh, posted uh, on the SBCC website about a week ago, okay. and and the the calendar for 2024 with Group One and Group Two was posted. I can't remember the exact date, but uh, in in September, it's it's very close to what you have. Uh, it, mm -hmm. The only difference is. Uh, Right here, October. Well, I was trying to start with group two earlier, not in 2025. I was trying to start in December. So there, there is a minor difference, but uh, not not that much. So uh, the calendar was posted uh, uh, about a week ago for for the the uh, council meeting. Uh, this calendar, this calendar, uh, the single line. Mm -hmm. I the single the single line was posted, I think, uh, on Thursday, if I remember correctly. Can you remember when we posted? Wednesday. 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 Yeah. So what I sent you yesterday, I sent you attachments just to uh, help you, up, just to avoid your time digging into the the documents on the website because we have too many too many documents posted. So what you have. Was already posted for the council. What I sent you last night actually was already posted uh, uh, on the website for the council. Okay, but what I what I printed out is not what you're showing me right now. So something was changed. It looks mm -hmm. to be there's quite a few things on here that are different than what you have posted here. Uh, are you talking about this calendar? Uh huh. Yes. There may be a few changes that I did last night. Yes. But again, I'm not asking you to approve this calendar right now. So there's no plan for a vote today? Uh, no plan for a vote on this calendar, yes. I'm just giving you this calendar okay. as a comparison. And again, group one, group two uh, will be posted and we'll post a message that it may uh, need to be modified based on the council decision whether or not the council wants to adopt 5104-020. So this calendar here that you see is for discussion purposes. We mm -hmm. don't need we don't need any approval on it. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's go ahead and recess to twelve fifteen. Yeah. Um, we'll come back at twelve fifteen and take public comment. Okay, uh, we'll call this meeting back to order. It is twelve fifteen. And with that, on agenda item number six, uh, let's go ahead and open this up for public comment. Okay, let's start with John Sue.
Hello, yeah, my name is John Sue. Sorry, I didn't introduce myself earlier. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, I am currently a technical consultant uh, on the codes, mostly working with the Washington Association of Building Officials. Uh, but I was the uh, former building official and principal engineer for the city of Seattle. Uh, I retired about three years ago from that position. Um, just uh, real quickly, I'm going to address a few points that were raised uh, during the uh, uh, discussion, the council discussion um, about sequencing groups one and two. I'm pretty sure, and I was, I, I have to admit, I was not directly involved in the process on that uh, when group one and two was first created, but the intent was very clear that it was it was intended to be separate years. Um, when, as for my recollection of that, so uh, just just and that was a. Could have been, I don't know if it was because of staffing issues or just because it made sense to, again, uh, align the discussion mm -hmm. with the uh, ICC sequence, uh, how they were doing uh, group one and two. I will admit, uh, okay, so so I'm speaking in a favor of keeping group one and two, first of all, um, but um, I will admit that uh, the way ICC changed their process this cycle is going to make that very difficult um, because they split part of the IBC off into a separate group. And the particular the particular one is ICC, uh, IBC uh, general. It's the second one in the, if you're looking at that uh, second column there, talks about I admin and then IBC general. That used to be group one. So you used to have all the non-structural pieces of, uh, of the IBC in group one and you could kind of fix all of that and, and, and work with that. Um, structural was separate because it was pretty independent. Um, and so uh, we've been kind of working with that, but um, this does make it much more difficult to have an integrated um, or well integrated um, uh, uh, codes. If we were to stick with a group one and two, we'd have to figure out how to, how to work that in. Um, but, um, I, my concern uh, with eliminating group one and two is that there are certain people, I think it's kind of been mentioned that are heavily involved in this and spend uh, time working with us either as volunteers or as consultants or whatever. And if you combine the two and you have the have to do everything in one year, that's a lot of bandwidth there <laughs> uh, that probably doesn't exist. And my concern would be, um, particularly for the governmental, you know, folks who get involved in this, my concern would be that this would decrease participation in the codes and in the code development and would, uh, we don't end up with what I would consider the best codes. Um, the other concern I would have is that um, this would, doing, doing, going to one group will, uh, essentially result in more work uh, for the jurisdictions, for the building officials. And just on my, from my experience, anyway, I'm not going to speak for all building officials, but from my experience, this probably would result in more work for me if I were still a building official, uh, because um, there, you know, certain jurisdictions are more open to innovation and things like that. And so, and, you know, designers and folks kind of know that. Some people do not like to innovate or adopt things that are outside the code or approve what we call code modifications or um, uh, alternates. And um, my concern is that this would result in a lot more, re um, uh, going to one group would result in a lot more requests for um, code modifications on the basis of, well, the next code, we know this is gonna happen. So can you allow this? And you know, some people are more willing to do that than others. Um, but uh, regardless of that, I think it'll result in a lot more um, requests for those types of modifications. And so, and what you'll end up with is a hodge, more of a, a hodgepodge of who's enforcing what. Uh, so that would be my my main concern. And, you know, we did this sort of with uh, with um, uh, the mass timber uh, provisions. We kind of worked with <clears throat> trying to get those. Um, pre-adopted essentially. And, and I think they are, those are those kinds of innovations are good. Um, and so uh, I really would uh, um, request that you stick with a group one and two. The other thing about the uh, uh, effective date, you know, my 
personal opinion again is that there's no magic in the July 1st date. It's kind of been kind of traditional. And so whether if that gets modified, the jurisdictions will know about that. They all have to adjust their um, their processes for adopting the codes, you know, at each uh, the local jurisdictions. But I don't think that's as big a deal as as, you know, changing it as we have in the last for this last cycle, you know, a couple of times right in the middle there, are, you know, there's the the, the jur local jurisdictions then have to go back to their councils or whoever and then say, OK, sorry, we got to fix. You got to change the date. And so um, I think that's more disruptive than just, OK, fine, we can't meet July 1st. Let's move it out to whatever date is is uh, reasonable and workable. And I think that's going to work a lot better. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to share. Thank you, John. A. Hop, City of Kirkland. <clears throat> Oops. Hi. Uh, so uh, my name is Angela Haupt, and I'm a plan review supervisor for the City of Kirkland. Uh, but I'm speaking with WABO, uh, Washington Association of Building Officials. And um, I was one of the volunteers that worked on the 2021 Washington Codes. And while doing those, uh, the Wabo volunteers and Stoyan's group were able to identify a large number of errors after the WACs were published, but before the codes went into effect. And that hasn't been the case in the past. In the past, it took code users uh, like months, maybe years, of actual use to identify those errors that were there. And so that's why I think it's actually a necessity um, that that uh, a third party is hired to proofread uh, the, the wax or the code changes before the wax are approved by the legislation. Um, that would limit the number of the emergency rules and erratas that you were talking about. Um, that have come for the 2021 codes because a lot of those were changes that were required to fix the errors that were identified in uh, the Washington code process that we went with. Um, and the other thing I'd just like to mention, and uh, Mike has heard me rant on this before, but I'll just go through it. Um, I'm in favor of pushing the date, but as far as pushing that effective date, we've done that once before in the 20 years that I've been in code enforcement and the code date of July 1st of the year after the ICC codes used to be what we what the cycle was so the 2003 code went into effect July 1st of 2004 and it was changed to two years after the ICC publishing date that we have now to actually accommodate the publishing of the Washington codes but what actually happened was that the tags in SBC somehow absorb that extra year into their process. So we ended up losing the time that we were supposed to have to do to produce the codes. And so we ended up right back where we started from. So I guess my my concern would be in pushing this is to make sure that we actually use that time for what it's intended for, which would be the actual Washington code development, which is is a must to continue on. So those are my comments. Thanks. Thank you, Angela. Lisa Rosenau. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lisa Rosenau and our company provides technical support and resources for the commercial provisions of the Washington State Energy Code. And uh, I have a, a, a both a question and a comment, and uh, part of it's just going to repeat what Anne just mentioned. Um, in your opinion, this is a question. In your opinion, would a more robust code cleanup process uh, reduce the number of emergency and off-cycle rules? Um, it's definitely been our experience that um, when we encounter issues in the code language that is brought to our attention through technical support. Uh, often they um, are issues where the language may not be enforceable and you know that raises it to the level of being an emergency rule. So um, that, that is a question uh, to the council. And then with regards to uh, 
in addition to for funding, um, not only is code development heavily dependent on volunteers, uh, technical resources and education that is needed to support compliance with the Washington state codes is voluntarily funded and delivered by private agencies not affiliated with the state of Washington. And although this private support has been reliable in the past, state funding for this would ensure reliability of resources and training for codes in the future. And although my area of expertise is, is with the commercial energy code, um, both of these comments do apply to all codes. And lastly, with regards to resources that support the codes, um, we, we do administer a uh, online resource that a lot of jurisdictions now require for documentation for compliance with the energy code. Uh, and then there are other resources that are provided by us, and by other agencies that uh, provide the technical information that people need to understand the codes. And it, it would be very helpful if there was some alignment between when the final code language is adopted. And I understand this code cycle has been a difficult one in that regard, but when the final code language is adopted and put out for the public to um, wrap their head around, that there also be sufficient time for these technical resources to be developed as well. So they are ready to go when the new code goes into effect. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Jim Brulette. Thank you very much. Uh, Ken Brulette, Seattle Fire Department. Uh, so first, I just want to make sure everybody's aware that that schedule that's shown up there is for the development of the 2027 high codes. And we're actually discussing our 2024 or our review of the 2024 codes right now. Um, so first of all, I'm in favor of keeping our current schedule that we have now. Um, in favor of keeping the three-year code cycle that we have now, keeping the two groups um, and as much as we can align with the ICC. Uh, with regards to the SBC staff um, and uh, salaries, it starts at the top. It starts with Stoyne's position. That position should be paid 30 to 40% more than it is now. And with that, you could then set up a salary schedule that is going to be able to obtain the qualified people to fill the staff uh, level positions below. Um, there are technical people that are available, but again, like it was discussed, they are not gonna come and work uh, for that lower salary. They are you're not gonna be able to pull them um, from private industry or even other public entities uh, to fulfill those roles. So I, I think until that is done, you can add three or four more positions or five, but you're still going to have the problem with filling them because of the lower salaries. And, and until you start at the top and increase, increase stoyans and work it waste down, you're not going to um, be able to draw the people that you want. Um, next, um, this ag agenda item number six now, it's kind of confusing that, that everybody's talking about making changes to the WAC. I really don't think that was... Um, and I could be wrong that the topics that discuss potential changes to the bylaws, policies, and procedures, it wasn't necessarily, here's the proposed changes to the WACs that we're voting on. Um, the only thing it talked about was approve the preliminary schedule for the 2024 code adoption cycle. That was the only item that I thought was actually going to be an action item that was going to get voted on. Everything else was just going to be discussed. And with saying that, if you are going to be proposing changes to the WAC, it's just like what Storian said, the process is going to take over three months. So you've already going to be messing up um, your timelines that you're proposing. So, and you and we already have the, the draft schedule that's already up and running. So again, an, another reason not to change what we already have. This discussion that you're having right now should have taken place six months ago. My suggestion is continue this discussion early in 2024 to discuss the 2027 codes and not try to rush this through and try to change everything in one meeting or two meetings. It, it needs to be a long-term discussion. Getting back down a little further down is the tags. Um, one of the issues that I brought up as a tag member on the Fargo tag was the mm -hmm. issue with code correlation. 
Um, I suggested we have a code correlation tag, and unfortunately, that did not go forward. The reason for a code correlation tag is, again, to align with ICC, and there are different types of committees that they have. They have an ICC code correlation committee, which I'm fortunate enough to be sitting on for the 2027 code development process. And that is just one mechanism that can help with all of the changes that need to happen when somebody brought up all these different emergency amendments, all these different filings. Some of it's based on, again, just that code correlation that hadn't been done. So um, the Building Code Council has the ability to put together an ad hoc committee just for code correlation. Then they have the ability to put together a tag for code correlation. I, I think that's something that we need to uh, look into. And that would be all my comments for now. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Any other public comment related to this item? Okay, thank you. Okay, with that, we'll open it uh, back up to council. Does council have any further discussion on this? Uh, Micah, go ahead. Thanks, Tony. Um, it, it, just a clarification, that comment was only in regards to the schedule, group one, group two in the schedule, would that be correct? We have not gone through the other um, items as part of item six on the agenda. As Just far as curiosity. public comment? Yes. No, we can go back to public comment. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Just want to make sure. I don't need to right now. Um, I did want to mention, it was mentioned several times. I think it's a huge thing, especially when it comes to the tags. Is I believe we've talked about it in the work group as well, was, was what others brought up was the code correlation group. Um, I think that would be a huge benefit. I think I mentioned that before, the SBCC as well, and, and how important – um, that group could be in avoiding mistakes, errata, um, or just correlating code language in chapters that are the same. But when I say that for folks that may not work in the IFC and work in the IBC, um, pretty much chapter nine and, and even chapter 10 are going to be identical with fire code language. So if there's changes that are made in the fire code tag and they're not aligned with the IBC, that has been problematic. I think that's what Ken was alluding to as well. Um, I think it would be a really benefit for our group if we could look at developing that committee as well as part of the tag. Thanks. Thank you, Micah. <clears throat> I know too that in some of the other uh, work group sessions that have taken place for this uh, with the correlation, we did have members that represented both tags, building and fire. Uh, but there was still a considerable amount that fell through the cracks in the 21 process as well as the uh, 18. So um, it, it it would be nice to have some dedicated members and, and have our chairs be very strong with those tags as far as making sure that that correlation took place. Thank you for that comment. Uh, do we want to discuss the, the tags at this time since we haven't really dove into that a ton? Well, I would need some, uh, if not direction, a recommendation, because we need to start working on the tax seats, and I want to have the tax seats available for the next meeting to get approved, and in December, we'll start establishing the technical advisor group, so it will we'll have about 30 days to do that, and uh, I, I need, again, at least a recommendation if the council would like to uh, combine tax or uh, you want to keep it the same, uh, in this case, we can start working and prepare uh, the tax seats. The other one is, would you approve the, you know, 11, 13, 15, whatever council uh, tax members for each technical advisor? So I will need this too, because this is the time for us to start working on uh, the new technical advisor. Okay, thank you, Tom. Go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, one of the things as I was thinking all of this through when I was first started looking at it was wondering why it was suggested that no more than one council member be a member of the tag and that they were only the chair instead of having the opportunity for more council representation on the tags. I can I can answer directly uh, because think about the technical advisor group that we're 
trying to limit and we have six council members there or seven it, it changes it changes the recommendation the, the technical advisory groups are the technical experts that uh, provide recommendations and above them we have the uh, bfp and the mve committee so this is where the the uh, council members uh, get involved in the process if you have too many in the technical advisory groups, in my opinion, it defeats the purpose of having BFP and MVE committee uh, uh, approving or disapproving the technical advisory group uh, uh, decisions. That that was the uh, that was my intent, and I think the work group agreed on two council members, one of the group members. So all council members, they can participate during the technical advisory group uh, 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 process, but uh, I didn't want to have too many of them allowed to vote and make decisions because uh, I'll give an example with the plumbing code tag. I mean, we have decisions like two to one or three to two and think about for three council members to change the, to change the recommendation. So we, we, we get the council involved from the bottom level it defeats the purpose of having the technical experts working on this. I know council, there are council members that are technical experts, but they will have the opportunity to get involved in the MVE and, and BFP committee uh, process. That was my intent. Again, okay. it's up to you to agree or disagree with it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Micah, go ahead. If we're just discussing the tag, the actual tags themselves, can we scroll back up to that on the screen to the list of the options we had? Um, and I believe, Stoyan, you made mention that the work group recommended option one as the modification to the tags and their combinations thereof. Is that correct? Yeah. And, and when you see here on the screen, uh, uh, Craig Holt prefer option three, then it was a different option three. So, sorry. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I just saw it, I apologize. It was a different option three, so the options- Big switch on me like that. <laughs> Excellent. So, with that, I, I would assume um, we would need to open this for public comment before motion is made on which option of the tag makeup, or is that necessary? We can do that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And I, I think it's worth some council discussion as well, just based on the kind of the back and forth on this that we've had. So um, let's do this. Uh, Let's let's go with some council discussion and then we'll open up the tag options to public comment. So, um, Micah, do you have anything further? I don't want to cut you off. No, I was going to make a, a motion for an option, but if we want to have more council discussion on the options specifically without the additional language, um, that would be fine. I, the language, okay. I, I think we, you know, is, is so much more in depth that I'm not sure we should get to that today. But um, and of course, that seems like whack rule changes anyway. And I think the request is just to identify the tags themselves today. So thank you. Okay, very good. Thank you. Todd, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I, I'll defer to others on option one on the residential and WUI combination. I, I'd love to hear more about that. Um, I had, you know, proposed or requested that the, although it's a big effort, the IBC and the IRC um, have some overlap. It, maybe it's not as a you know option two as one tag, but with some of the um, with the um, mandated tasks coming before us this next cycle, especially related to middle housing um, and single stayer and so forth, I, I think that would be nice to to have a lot of over overlap between IPC and IRC. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Chow. Yeah, I guess on that last point, Todd. <laughs> Are we going to convene a separate tag for that single stair thing, or was that going to be under IRC? I, well, I think and I, no, it could be a, an ad hoc. Is is what you're saying? And no. and I, I think we did talk about that. I can't remember. 
but then I, I we're just also getting we're seeing you know some legislation that is is pushing for more um multifamily typologies to be considered in the IRC. So that's more what I was referring to a six plex, a four plex, so forth. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, and then my I just wanted to clarify for everybody in the room that the my understanding is the difference between what we do today and option one is that the residential and WUI tags are combined. That's the only difference from today. Is that correct? In plumbing mechanical and ventilation. Uh, okay. So <clears throat> now we have plumbing and we have mechanical. Uh, and plumbing mechanical and ventilation are shown here in one and, and residential and WUI. Uh, my initial proposal was, uh, I think, to combine building and fire because of these correlation issues. Uh, so it's still here, but again, the the group decided to go with this uh, option one. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, to the options there, before I get to Micah, the um, I think the concern with the building and fire code tag combining is uh, I'm concerned with with getting quorum if we do combine tags because I think there's a level of um, disinterest that may take place by one tag or the other if we're knee deep in fire or vice versa building uh, when it comes to some of those items. Uh, however, option one, which is the one that I like the most, I think that if we do option one, uh, we do not have an option but to do an ad hoc committee that's made up of members of both building and fire to meet regularly throughout the process for um, correlating. So that would be the kind of the trade-off there. Micah, go ahead. Thanks. Turn my camera off. I have an internet issue, so let me know if you can't hear me. But um, I think the correlation group could could work across all the tags, and maybe it's made up of members from every tag. Um, I don't know if that's needed for energy, but it might be considering they do impact other codes. Uh, to answer Todd's question on the residential WUI code tag combination, I think you asked about that and why we went that route as a recommended path. When we look at the WUI code, um, the majority of the application in there are, is construction requirements. So like the, the water supply and access is already by locally adopted standards, which may be enforced by the, the fire code official already. So there's really no change going to occur there. So that's why we felt that was, you know, the, the biggest impact of the WUI code is the construction standards on residential construction um, would be, is, was our thinking. So that's why we combine them that way. And I think that was supported unanimously by the work group folks. That helps. Thank you, Micah. Excellent. Okay. With that, let's open up a uh, public comment for the modify uh, something that you know, keeping keeping the same technical advisory groups. I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear it here, but that's an option too. You know, it's a, it, it's up to the council how to go with it. Currently, we have eight technical advisor groups. Okay. All right, and option one is six. So, okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, let's, uh, uh, Senator Wilson, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I know that it sounds like there's going to be consideration of a vote here. And I, again, am concerned because the agenda only states that it is a discussion. It doesn't say that we are going to be approving or, or voting on it. There's a there's a mark for council action, but the actual amend, uh, the actual um, item says discuss potential changes, and then also following up with the email that um, Stoyan sent out said that it is the proposed changes to all these things are for discussion purposes. So I'm not sure that we can vote today. I just want a clarification on that. I I specified which items will need the vote uh, uh, in in the emails. I I think I sent. Uh, you know, twice. In the bullet points here, uh, they each one uh, can each one is a potential of vote in the council. It's it's up to the council how we'll do it. I just said what I need in order to prepare for the next meeting. Everything else, if there is a consensus, the council can decide to have a vote. If there is not, we can keep working or just eliminate it. But for the technical advisory groups, again, we need to start working on those because we're about a month late. Uh, the intent was to have those approved in September. Uh, so, okay. 
by a follow up on that. Um, it does though. Number six does the top says sit, discuss and then the bullet points underneath, and it says pros and cons for combining tags and limiting the number of tag members. So it does say discuss and discuss pros and cons. Doesn't say vote. But again, that's why I'm asking for clarification. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Wilson. Before we move on, uh, Derek, do, is there is there issues with us taking council action today on the tags? Can you hear me, Tony? Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks. And by the way, I appreciate your patience while I'm traveling today. I've, I've lost the signal for a few minutes there, but I did hear the previous discussion. I don't see any legal concerns under the OPMA with taking council action. I agree with Stoyan's uh, analysis. Um, the purpose of the agenda was to note up the item if the council elects take a, a vote uh, or to make a motion and take a vote on that motion. Uh, they're not. Okay, thank you. Representative Mel. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Just so I understand where we're at in the process, um, any votes we take today will be to amend this draft and then um, at a subsequent or future meeting, there will be a final vote on the whole package of bylaws. Is that correct? That was my plan, yes. Okay. All right, let's go to public comment on the technical advisory groups. Uh, Ken Burlett, go ahead. Such a fun discussion. Um, one of the, uh, Tony, you brought up about combining the tags like an option um, three, the building and fire code tag and worry about a quorum. I'm also worried about if you limit the number of tag members, um, you go from possibly 30 that you would have 15 on building code, 15 on fire code, to maybe then only limiting to 15 of the building and fire code if you combine it. So I, I, I would, definitely be in favor of keeping those two uh, separate. And and at this point, I really think if you're looking at um, modifying this section, that you should be putting in a code correlation tag and and uh, not just just make sure it's it's there now with your bylaws and then make sure that you do have um, the makeup of that, uh, like that was suggested, maybe, you know, it has to have at least one member of each um, existing tag on that plus um, one or two of the uh, council members. So I, I think you, you should formally make it as a tag now since you are looking at uh, proposing these three options and, and not wait and do this later. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Angela, go ahead. Um, I agree with uh, what Ken just said. I think there needs to be like an official separate code correlation tag because I think you don't want you know basically the tags doing their own correlation because that's not proper proofreading you need a third party in there so I think that having yeah at least one representative from each of the tags overlooking kind of doing a whole correlation and then obviously also council members but um yeah I think it should be an official tag that's identified in there that's all thank you John Sue, go ahead. Yeah, <clears throat> um, just just on the, I don't think it matters so much uh, which option while well, you go with. I I would prefer option one over the others. Although uh, I I kind of sort of favor, especially given this uh, stage right now, is just stick with what we have. Again, kind of because this does relate to the group one, group two discussion in some ways. That aside. Uh, if you do go to a cor code correlation committee, um, you're going to have to carefully scope what they, they're allowed to do. Mm -hmm. um, that, that gets to be a, a real issue. Uh, I know uh, I served on the code correlation committee at ICC uh, for one cycle uh, recently, and they were, how shall I say, um, somewhat conservative on what they felt they could do. Um, and so uh, that that's, that's going to have their authority, I think, is going to have to be uh, carefully um, described 
and and um, so so that everyone knows what what their scope is because um, what what ICC's code correlation committee does say well we can do um, editorial changes but anything that's substantive has to go back yeah you know, they they don't they kind of limit themselves from doing and substantive changes has uh, they again they treated those very very um, conservatively. So almost everything was was uh, a um, substantive change, even though it looked like it should be something really simple to do. So again, just just be careful how you how you scope them. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Kevin Duell. Oh hi, thank you. Yeah, Kevin Duell, Northwest Natural. Um, I, I'm not sure if this is on target with the discussion, but in terms of the tag group size, if we're talking about reducing the number, there would need to be some thought into who gets cut, right? I mean, at the moment, there are certain categories that are designated for which uh, which members exist, you know what I'm saying? Uh, building owners, utilities, things like that. So if there are fewer numbers, there would have to be some thought into what, what criteria would there be to select tag members. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate it. Lisa Rose now. Hello, thank you. Um, yeah, Lisa Rose now with Evergreen Technology Consulting. Uh, I, I've been a voting member of the uh, commercial energy code tag for four code cycles. So just kind of uh, sharing some observations during those code cycle uh, co-development processes. I, I would agree with some earlier comments about um, being able to have a quorum um, when you have something like the energy code that covers multiple disciplines. You know, there are members of the tag, you know, for example, if we're talking about mechanical requirements, uh, those that their expertise is in electrical or lighting, um, often they they, they, there's not something for them to contribute to uh, directly from a technical perspective. And so sometimes, and, and vice versa. So uh, sometimes that does pose a problem with having enough, enough tag members. So again, if the tag number of tag members is reduced, I would agree with Kevin Duell that um, the expertise of those members um, really is, is going to be important. Um, to make sure that the industry is fully represented. And then as an addition to, with the discussion about having uh, representatives that cover multiple topics, um, that is very important. Um, we've run into that where there are requirements in the energy code that are specific to mechanical that have very direct overlaps with the mechanical code. And so having representatives that are, that's their role, and that is to monitor what's going on between the two codes. And, and we do have people that do that. However, you know, bringing in somebody that, you know, that's their area of expertise and have that be their sole responsibility. And that is to make sure that the two codes are being developed so that they don't have conflicts would be a really important um, member to, to include in the list of uh, tag members. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Andrea Smith, go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, this is Andrea Smith with the Building Industry Association. Um, I have a comment and then a quick question. So um, I would support what others had said so far in, in recommending a code correlation committee or TAG. Um, but I would almost want to recommend that it not be the same people that are are creating that language in the first place, just as a, a double like whammy of a third party overlooking, because I think that's super important and people that are uh, in the field, you know, using the codes, it would be beneficial to have them look at that as well. And then my other question, or I guess my question would be, um, if we are going to move towards combining tags, would there then be potentially um, a limit on how many tags an individual could serve on it, any one code cycle. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. There, there is a proposal further down, uh, which uh, hasn't been discussed. Uh, tag member, 
is allowed to serve in one technical advisory group and one uh, alternate. If we have issues uh, finding volunteers to serve in the TAC, then the council may agree on uh, the TAC and TAC member to serve in two technical advisory groups. But again, this never was discussed before. And uh, uh, I'm not sure we are preparing, we are prepared to discuss it today, but uh, I was planning uh, to get this discussion in November. Thank you. Um, looks like that concludes public comment. Todd, go ahead. Yeah, while we're in public comment, I was gonna see if it was appropriate to ask a question. Um, and that would be, is there um, validity to, instead of a separate, correlation committee to have a technical expert either on staff or a third party uh, inform the MVE or the BFP, the standing committees that then can remand back down to the tags. Is it, can that serve a, a similar purpose? I'm just curious on opinions. So thank you. Is that uh, kind of Andrea's comment on that as far as having experts involved in the correlation, Todd? Yeah, and I just, you know, I, I, when we talk about authority, I mean, the authority comes when we get to the standing committee, and then that is the, is our process that we remanded back to the, the advisory groups when when there's a substantial, you know, change. So I'm wondering if that if that's more appropriate at that level than another advisory committee. The, the intent, <laughs> the expectation, it's always been that the MBE and the BFP committee is this coordination entity that can coordinate between different forms. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it's not happening very often. It does sometimes, but uh, many things are missed. And the other thing is that the technical advisory group, especially the fire code, it, it needs to remember that Washington state is a unique state because in, in almost all other states, if you have a conflict between two codes, the more stringent applies. Well, in Washington state, we have a seniority, you know, building and residential code first, and then the fire code is, when was that? Fourth, fifth? Below mechanical. Uh, it, so it, the, the, the issue is that, you know, the building code tag decides something, the fire code tag decides something else, and the fire code tag expects that the building code tag will, uh, you know, if it's more restrictive, it will it will over it will be over the building code tag, but it's not how work, it works in Washington State. And this is why the biggest uh, issues are typically between the building code and the fire code. Again, the expectation was that the, the BFP committee will serve as the coordinate coordinating uh, uh, entity because the BFP committee has the authority to uh, override and change the technical advisory group recommendations. But again, it's not working so far. We can add a little bit more language in the, the bylaws to, to clarify that, but I don't know if the council members see this as a good option. To Andrea's comment on that, if we had a tag for correlating and we had members from each tag making that up, and we set a number at 15, I, I imagine that would allow other members to be involved. And I think maybe that's the outlet for that. And I, I, I'm not against that. So I don't know how everyone else feels about that. Micah, go ahead. We need the thumbs up button like other meetings have. <laughs> so I agree with you, Tony, that, um, if we do a correlation group that it could make up the same number of members as the tag, but it would maybe have an, a member from each tag required, but then the rest of the uh, makeup could be, you know, an appropriate stakeholder uh, makeup. So I agree with you there. And I agree with Andrew. I think that would be my intent if we um, create a correlation group. Thanks. Chell, go ahead. I guess with the correlation group, then basically only have the purview to, suggest that other tags make changes or would they actually have some oversight role where they could just make changes wherever they felt it would help? That's a good question. I, I think that's the rules that John talked about in his public comment um, was, you know, we, we would have to more or less come up with a almost a, a set of bylaws for that group or, or 
you know, this is what you can or can't do. And then if we have some conflicts there, maybe that has to come back to the council for decision. Yeah, that was my thumbs up button, Micah. It, 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 it could be nice. using, using my past experience, it could be very dangerous if this group has more authority than the technical advisory groups that develop the code language or provide the recommendations. Uh, we don't want to get into, into this serpentine of going back and forth between the technical advisory groups and the coordination council. I, I thought the expectation for this coordinating tag was to identify conflicts and let the technical advisory groups fix it. Yeah, understood, Todd. I'm by no means opposed to this. I think it's very, um, there's a very strong desire that we were hearing for this. I'm just uh, still a little um, concerned that we're not, um, we're, we already have a structure in place with BFP that each one of the chairs of the tags is a member of that standing committee. Is that, that's, I think that's a correct statement, right? So, it, you know, is there a way to reinforce that the chairs have technical support whether it's staff or third party that then we're going back and forth from the committee to the, to the tags. Maybe we're not doing a good enough job as chairs perhaps is what I'm saying. Well, to that, before I go to Micah, Todd, I, I said in one of the work group meetings that if we're going to correlate without doing something very intentional, like a tag or an ad hoc, it's going to be up to the tags chairs to have a very, very strong presence in correlating, yeah. which I'll be the first to admit last cycle, I did not do a good job at that. <laughs> and so that's, I think, where this is coming from, in my opinion. So uh, Micah, go ahead. Yeah, I agree with you, Tony. I think it's a tough one to identify and what Todd's saying. It's, you know, maybe the BFP committee or, or the MBE committee or whatever other committee is supposed to do something more. But, you know, a lot of times we're just looking at the tag recommendations, but I think that the correlation committee would need to go further than that, where um, correlation is more after even the BFP committee would be my thought, because what's occurring or what I'm seeing in, in some areas of correlation is that the tag makes a recommendation for say a code language or an amendment to continue forward a washington amendment and then there's an amendment that comes into the base code language for that same section and then we get further along and both of those have been adopted without correlation and that's where i think that that we wouldn't have that information before the bfp committee it would have to be after that. So that, I think that's where the correlation group would come in to more effect is when those instances occur, um, because that's one of some of the errors that I think are, are we're seeing as well. So again, I think there's a lot of rules and information that have to be developed on this. However, if we do come up with a correlation group, we can work on that over the next while before the tags get kicked off and maybe we can get it this cycle. And if not, we can have it for next cycle. Thank you, Mike Achell. Yeah, it seems like it could be, <clears throat> well, the CR 102 is out, the correlation groups are getting together and making that as a public comment, that would be a simple way to do it, to limit <clears throat> to limit any potential influence or whatever that they might have otherwise. Um, that, might, that might be one way to do it. Todd? You know, one, one other thought is we rely so much on volunteers on these, tags and and you know that works the best when we have somebody with technical code writing you know um, expertise and so again the other idea is that we uh, one of the 15 positions on each group is a, a technical code writer that is responsible for maybe maybe or there there's a staff person responsible for that on each each tag so that's instead of putting another another group in just a thought, thanks. Staff is the best case scenario, but if we have enough staff to concentrate on that, but instead of this, we have one person taking care of several codes. And uh, one of the reasons I, I, I wanted to resize the tax a little bit was because we'll get into a time that we'll have tax meetings every day. So this is when the mistakes happen. Uh, and uh, uh, 
fortunately, we when we started, you know, Wabo Fox, and uh, I think Angela made that comment that uh, we cut most of it. We should have done it before we get into the we got into the publishing part. Staff can do a better job here again. If you keep me safe from too many off cycle rules, we can we can invest <laughs> more time there. We used to have far more time to be able to do uh, a more in depth proofreading, and anymore we just don't have enough time between all the various tasks to do the proper proofreading on the proposed rules. And also keep in mind that, and there was another comment slash question that, you know, why we were able to do it for one year and now two years is not enough time. And in 2018, we got, well, I wasn't here, but this is what I hear. We got more funding, uh, but also we doubled the work because now we have to comply with uh, RCW 3405-328, which added some extra work and the intent, the intent was this will be done on a fact level and, and the proponents will provide enough information, but the truth is we don't, we don't have enough uh, uh, information about the cost-benefit analysis. We don't have enough for small business economic impact statement. We have other things we need to do, you know, concise explanatory statement. So it, it, adds, it adds more work. So uh, I think this is important. Okay, uh, any further public comment before we move on to some possible council action with the tags? Uh, Lisa, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to chime in on what Micah mentioned because uh, it's a good point that any kind of correlation, there really are two distinct correlation tasks. And one is this correlation between different codes, the proposals for different codes to make sure it doesn't create conflicts between them. But then also correlation of multiple approved proposals that are on the same topic. Uh, because when, when we observe errors and omissions, oftentimes it is, you know, there are two proposals, they're very close together, but there's some fine nuances between them. And, you know, we see some of the intent lost when they're blended. And so I think correlation of that particular task uh, would be an important role of, of this committee. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Kevin Duell. Thank you. Yeah, um, this might be off topic, but deeper down in this document, there was, and just stop me if it's off topic, there was actions the tag can take, and it's approve, approve as amended, etc. There's a, a, a bullet under approve as amended, which I just can't understand. Um, it's the last bullet. Um, there you go. Yeah, the, that one there. Uh, it's a it's a double negative, and then it sends me off to the whack. And I I don't know what modifications to the documents means. Um. So that, the double negative, but here is the intent. So we get the initial proposal. The proponent provides the information related to the cost benefit analysis. For example, the proposal got changed as a matter by the proponent or by the technical advisory group. It changes the regulatory effect and we submit the proposal with the, with the initial cost benefit analysis, which already doesn't align with the new proposal. So there are specific requirements in 5104025 that the proponent needs to submit with the proposal, that was the intent, but we haven't discussed that. And I now Chell had some uh, concerns. So 
I assume we will have more time to do this uh, uh, in November. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Cheryl, did you want to speak to that before I go to Ken? Sure. Yeah, I, I think down here under Section Nine, I strongly disagree with the third bullet. The tag cannot make substantive changes to a proposal without the proponent's approval. From the energy code perspective, we do that often, and it makes the proposal better. Um, and the proponent is not always even in the room for every tag meeting. We ask them to show up, but they don't always show up. Um, so I, I strongly disagree with that. I think that would would um, reduce the effectiveness of the tag. I also <clears throat> think the third, the the fourth bullet, um, as written, isn't is is also going to make it more challenging to do things in the energy code tag. Um, I think there could be some limits on how substantive changes are, but often we're in a tag meeting and someone says. Oh, you know, that should be 0.15 instead of 0.18, you know, per this other standard over here. And we're like, okay, let's um let's put that on the screen. And if we had then had to wait a whole meeting before we could go back and vote on it, I think that would be it would just mean we would we'd have to relitigate things over and over and over. So I I disagree with that. Uh the the third and the fourth bullets as <clears throat> as highlighted there. Um I also, the fifth bullet just speaks to the, the the challenging process we have where a proponent might um, suggest something and do some economic analysis on it, and it gets changed from 0.15 to 0.20. And now are we saying, well, this proposal dies unless the proponent has the time to go back and redo all their economic analysis that such that 0.20 is the number I think that's putting too much of a burden on the proponent. They're, these are volunteers, and they are doing a great job. Um, but if the code, if the energy code tag wants to see a couple different options, I, I, I think we can't expect people to do and redo and redo economic analysis every time the tag uh, thinks of a different idea. So, uh, and votes on it. So, I, I just I don't see how that's um, I don't see how to solve the problem, but I don't see that the what is written under bullet five is a solution to the problem. So anyway, that's somewhat responding to Kevin's comments, but my own thoughts on, on those bullets. It's all related to, again, compliance with RCW 3405-328. Somebody needs to prepare that. So staff, we do this for many costs, but I don't think we have the capability of doing this for the energy cost. Not, yeah, to talk about, not to talk about time. It's just the energy code analysis needs something else that we cannot provide. Yeah, this is where I think economic uh, challenges are, are with the council on this. And I think we need the funding to actually have people do somewhat real-time vetting of proposals, economics, and energy savings. And so the TAG and the council can be better informed about these things. That's that's my thought. But, you know, I'm not proposing to contribute much money to that. Okay. Micah, go ahead. <laughs> Come on, Chael, open your pocketbook. Um, I agree with Chael on the, on some of these here too, and I didn't want to get into the rest of this document, but I will mention that if the tag makes a change to the proposal where the original proponent said there was no increase or decrease in cost for the proposal, and the tag changes it to where there is an increase or decrease in cost, I definitely don't believe that's fair to have the proponent go in and make an analysis of what the tag did for the cost benefit, um, especially since they, you know, their original proposal had no impact whatsoever, according to them, which which does occur regularly. Um, with that, I, I didn't want to get down into the rest of this document, and I hope that we can move back up to the tag options. And then from there, we move into the tag members. And then hopefully we can wrap up this discussion point since it is just a discussion. And, and I mean, if we want to get into this document, I think it's going to eat up the rest of the meeting. And I, and I know we need to be aware of the other items on the agenda this time since we didn't complete the agenda last meeting. Thanks. 
This is why I insisted on the discussion, and this is why these bullet points are highlighted because they are complicated. Thank you. Okay. Um, Kevin, do you have anything further on your public comment? Oh, thanks for asking. No, I, I'm done. Okay, thank you. Ken, go ahead. Thanks. I just want to make it clear when the, what we should be talking about when we talk about the code correlation is a code correlation tag. There's been some terminology going back and forth that people are talking about code correlation committee. I, I don't think we need to have a code correlation standing committee. I just believe that the code correlation tag would then report back to the individual standing committees with the information that they've discovered with the issues with the codes not correlating in certain areas. So I don't think it's so much of them taking actions and rewriting codes. I think it's more just making those other standing committees that there's issues with the codes not correlating and then they can direct the appropriate um, tags that are working for their committee. So again, I, I don't think that you're looking at creating a committee. I think you're looking at creating a code correlation tag. Thank you. And the tag recommendation can in this uh, instance would then go to the appropriate committee. So let's say BFP, and then that BFP could reassign um, to the fire building tag. Exactly. Understood. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Appreciate that. Uh, Lisa, go ahead. Yeah, one last uh, small comment, and that is with regards to correlation of multiple approved proposals. Um, the Energy Code tag has been able to address that pretty effectively with uh, internal tag working groups. And so that that is another way to do it. And so um, perhaps that could be you know, part of the policy that if there are multiple proposals that are all dealing with the same code section, that they be evaluated or that correlation occurs via a working group within the tag. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Appreciate that. Any further public comment? Okay, let's head back to council then. So under option one, are we in agreement that we could add a correlation tag? Is that the route we want to go? Does someone have a motion for this? Craig, go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion that we adopt uh, option one with the addition of a correlation tag. Uh, and I guess I'll that's second. Great. Okay. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion in a second. Craig, would you like to uh, speak to your motion? I think uh, plenty has been spoken. I think it's pretty clear that uh, this is the right way to go. Excellent. And Micah, would you like to speak to your second? Sure. Now, I appreciate the work group and Stoyan for putting this together. I know the tags are a lot of work, and hopefully this will help some, even if we are adding an additional tag. Um, I'm not sure if we're cutting down on the number, but uh, maybe these will function a little better overall. Thanks. Thank you, Micah. Uh, open it up for discussion to the rest of council. Todd, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Yes, Ken's uh, last description helped me a lot, so I'm, I'm in support of the correlation tag. Thank you. Excellent. Any further discussion before we take a vote on this? Just to be clear, um, Tony, is uh, we are just advising staff on how to do take the next step, right? This is this is in no ways updating the bylaws. Is that correct? This is advising staff how to proceed with the technical advisory groups. Understood. Uh, Katie, go ahead. Actually, I'm okay. Thank you. Okay. Micah, did you have something? Okay. I thought I had something, but I don't, that might be dangerous. Okay, let's move forward with a vote. <laughs> okay, uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any against? Okay, motion carries. Okay, uh, 
do we want to make a recommendation for number of members for the tags? Micah? Um, before I do that, I, I do like the 15 number, but I want to ask Dorian if we have the documents that show the tag makeups now and the numbers. I, I believe um, you had a document previously that showed that, and I hate to put you on the spot. I should have asked earlier. I don't have it currently, but I will make it available and we'll send you to the council members. I need two weeks to prepare. Okay. So with that, I would like to make a motion that we uh, limit the tags to 15 members and that the membership makeup be done at a later date once we get the information from Stoyan at the next meeting. How about that? So I, I would go with the number as a motion, 15 as the number for the tag. Okay, we have a motion. Damon, did you have the second on that? I did. Okay, thank you. Uh, Micah, would you like to speak to your motion? Sure. Uh, again, I think I mentioned that earlier in the meeting that I the 15 aligns with the numbers of the SBCC uh, members. And so if it's adequate for this group, I think it would be adequate for that group. Thanks. Thank you. Damon? Um, so, uh, Micah, would you say uh, it's up to 15 members or 15 members? Uh, uh, to me, I would say it would be up to 15 members with the makeup being determined at a later date. So we, you know, okay. we don't know how that 15 member makeup is going to shake out, but. Um, right. 15 know that sometimes it's difficult to, to fill those spots. So, okay. That's all I have. Yep. Okay. Craig, go ahead. I'd like to offer a friendly amendment uh, that we add language that would allow the, the council to adjust that cap, if you will, on an as needed basis, if there's a specific need to do so. Okay, do we have a second? I'll second that. I just think you, okay. Sorry. As the original the... motion maker, Craig do, or I wasn't the original motion, um, Craig was. Um, when you mean increase the tag, so say if we combine the tags for a special meeting, we don't limit it to 15, it's the, it's the 30 technically at that point, and then say, Chill comes to us or the energy code group comes to us and say, we need a, a specific number for this exact item, or we want to include other voting members. Is that where you're getting at? No, I'm actually, just trying just to figure out why we would need far, to increase. Far more specific than that would be if we're in an energy code and you want to bring in an expert, it would make it 16 people rather than 15 people to advise a tag. The, the council has the ability to approve that or disapprove that. Just something to give some flexibility at the council level that would be only decidable there. Would that person be to, the expert would be to vote? I mean, they have the opportunity to provide any type of public testimony and, and guidance to a tag. I'm not sure why they would need the vote would be the question. You know, that's a good point. I'll withdraw my friendly amendment proposal. Thank you. Okay, any further discussion on the motion from Micah to have up to 15 members per technical advisory group? Okay, with that, we'll take a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any against? Okay, motion carries. Very well. Okay. Uh, does anyone else want to bring up anything else on uh, agenda item six? Uh, I'm looking at moving on at this point. I think we've accomplished what Stoyans wanted for this. Katie, go ahead. Did did they get an answer on the timing, or were we did we did we come to a conclusion on that? I think we're tabling that. Tabling. Okay. Thank you. So I will post uh, the schedule with group one, group two. I think it was the agreement, and then I will clarify that most likely in January it may it may need to be revised. Is that that's yeah. Thank something you. that captures? We need to revise it anyway to add in the correlation. In the correlation, yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. <clears throat> okay, if there's nothing further, not seeing any hands, we're going to move on to agenda item number seven, which is provisions for family home child care and IRC, IBC, and IFC. 
Take approved draft for consideration to move to CR 102 and public comment period. All right, so we've had the uh, work group with uh, the Department of Child, Children, Youth and Family working with us. Uh, they, I guess, I, I want to get them to raise their hands in the uh, attendees list so I can allow them to talk because they uh, have some presentation as well. Um, but we are experiencing as a state of Washington a child care drought um, per se, where you know the there's been some legislative action to allow the DCYF to permit a waiver to extend the number of children in a family home child care scenario above our current limit of 12. And we've been discussing to increase that to 16. And um, I was going to ask Tyler to maybe uh, give us a little bit more uh, picture from the DCYF standpoint on why this is uh, uh, important and necessary for the state. And then we have some other folks who worked on the um, code language who would present after Tyler. So um, Tyler, uh, go ahead and um, Let's go. If you need to share anything, I can bring up stuff or I can allow you to share the screen as well. Yeah, thanks, uh, Dustin, for that. And uh, thank you, everybody here on the committee for your time. Uh, many of you I've had the pleasure of getting to speak to in the tag. So uh, good to see you again. And also a lot of new faces here that I'm looking forward to addressing. I don't know how to turn my camera on for this meeting. I don't know if you control that, but I'm happy to do that. If uh, Oh, hey. Sorry, hello. Okay, it booted me over to this system. Uh, my name is Tyler Farmer. Uh, I am with the Department of Children, Youth, and Families, uh, and I am in our rules unit. I'm joined here today with a colleague of mine, Karen Christensen. She is in the Child Care Licensing Division, so we're going to be talking sort of from different angles about the same issue. Uh, and I'd like to give you just a little bit of background uh, a lot has happened since 2021 that has resulted in us being here today. And uh, we're pretty excited to be here and we think we can move the needle a little bit for children, youth and families in Washington. In, uh, in 2021, the state legislature passed the Fair Start for Kids Act and that was a big landmark change in a lot of ways. And one of the big changes was the cap for family home child care programs has historically been set at 16, I'm sorry, at 12 children. So a family home child care provider in your community could not have more than 12 children. This has been in place at least since the 70s uh, or possibly earlier based on my research. And as Dustin mentioned, and as we've said over and over again, child care is in a state of crisis in Washington and around the U.S. It's very hard to find. It's very expensive. And so it's a big complex issue with a lot of different solutions. And one of those, the legislature lifted this cap of 12 and uh, in the Fair Start for Kids Act. And as part of that, they did not establish a limit. There's no upper limit of this cap. But what they did do is mandate DCYF, our agency, to develop a set of criteria for somebody to get this waiver. And we did that the following February in 2022, we promulgated new rules in our WAC and I can give anybody those um, citations if they'd like. So this new system went into effect early 2022. And one unfortunate part of our development of those rules was we were not able to get um, local government or building code officials involved in that process. Uh, despite trying a number of ways. And so our rules went into effect 2022. And within probably six months of that rolling out, both licensors inside our agency and then also local government officials started reaching out to us to learn more about this program, offer suggestions, et cetera. So what we did in DCYF is we built a work group with a number of people who are joining me here today that represent a lot of local governments. And we've had stellar help from your staff, Doyen and Dustin, uh, over the course of the year. And really, at the end of the day, um, like I said, what we're trying to do is move the needle, get more high-quality, safe child care supply out there for families. And we're coming to you with some recommendations to the building code. 
and the fire code that um, Ardell will be able to talk about in more detail. But what we experienced was this unique issue where a provider would come to us and ask for a waiver and they would meet all of our criteria and so we would grant them one. And then all of a sudden they would have to retrofit their home to meet the building code rather than the residential code. And it created a lot of headaches for them, huge expenses, uh, and frankly, made it very scary for people to try and supply more child care for children. So we've been trying to work through this uh, very complex issue with a number of people here. And um, that is the regulatory history. Uh, we are trying to update our rules to go along with what the State Building Code Council might do, sort of work in tandem, uh, like I said, to move the needle. Uh, and I'll go ahead, if Dustin, you don't mind, um, Karen can address this from the actual licensing uh, child care standpoint now, unless anybody has a question for me. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you, all of you, for allowing us to continue to ask questions, to continue to provide comments. Um, like Tyler said, we've had incredible support from uh, Dustin and Stoyan, so we appreciate that. Uh, he's right. Child care is in a it's in a crisis place. And uh, we are doing everything we can to comply with what we've been asked to do by the legislature, like Tyler said, and also to uh, try to work within your system and others to provide quality care that is safe for kids. So whatever we can do to move the needle to provide more care is uh, much appreciated. We have currently... I want to say 74 approved waivers. Um, we have paused the process for approving or reviewing waivers. Uh, they're all on hold and currently there are 33 applications. They come in every week. So we're sending a message that we're working with all of you and uh, and trying to keep kids safe and still increase capacity for for child care, so even with a cap of 16 um, in my bad math skills, uh, that's another 132-ish children that could have care in a licensed facility rather than somewhere unlicensed where we don't know anything that's going on. So our WAC uh, during this process with, uh, with the groups that we've worked with, it it involves making changes that were recommended. Um, it wouldn't be all of the changes. We don't put every building code uh, topic into our WAC, but they are things like not allowing someone who provides overnight care to do that with over 12 children. Um, it is adding a fire extinguisher to the kitchen and emergency lighting. It's uh, it's doing it's making some changes that. Uh, we've all agreed in the group that is helpful. It's not allowing someone with an initial license that's not been fully licensed to um, to even have over 12 children. So there are some things uh, such as the residential monitored fire alarm system that we want to um, add to our WAC and we're in the process of doing that, hoping all of this time to coordinate the timing with whatever changes are made to residential code. So I I don't know if I've missed anything. Tyler, you can help me out if I have or anyone else, but I just do appreciate the time and the group that has worked so hard on all of this. So thanks. And I, I don't know now if uh, Dustin, we wanna hear from Anjali or Ardell. Uh, I'll probably be moving towards Ardell. She's put together our most recent draft of proposed code language. Um, to, for council members who haven't been part of the TAG group or the BFP committee meetings that we had recently, uh, sprinklers and alarm systems are kind of the one of the hinge points on allowing the increase to occur within the building code. Uh, another thing I'd like everybody to be aware of is that this is going to have some correlated changes within the uh, IRC, the IBC, and the IFC. 
Um, the most substantive changes will be within section 331 of the IRC, um, but just to correlate between the IBC and IFC, there's some definition changes that occur there as well. Um, and Ardell, if we could share the tag approved version of this code language first, and then we can talk about the uh, kind of public comment that we've got going on to maybe allow for the exceptions that we were talking about um, for this provision. And so I'll turn it over to you, Ardell, and you should have the ability to share screen as well. Thanks, Dustin. Do you need me to uh, pull up the approved version then? I apologize. Um, I have the one that has the. Well, you, you could show the one with the, uh, um, the, friend, the amendment to with it to allow the exception, the but let's just make sure to paint that. We'll talk about what the tag put forward yep, first. I will and make then, it clear. Um, we actually at the BFP meeting didn't have a quorum, so we don't have a recommendation from uh, BFP on this either. And uh, But we have some uh, friendly comments from that meeting. So um, I will uh, yield to Ardell. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ardell Jala. I'm the building official for Seattle Department of Construction and Inspections to participate with DCYF on this work group. And as a city, we do have a Department of Education and Early Learning that does offer grants and uh -oh. assistance to Ardell, if I may, family your... home child care. And so because of the, the large number of um, child care providers within our city, this is something that we. Uh, Ardell, we've been having some issues with your, we've been having I some issues with your audio. audio and maybe uh, killing the video might uh, smooth out your bandwidth. Okay. Does that work? Can uh, you hear me now? Loud and clear now? Great. I apologize for that. I will. I can, um, I can share the document that way. Um, you can just let me know where you need to move. That would be great. Thanks, Dustin. Um, I'll recap quickly. Basically, we have a lot of family home child cares in our city, and so I do have a vested interest in trying to one encourage um, safe occupancy, especially when we have this increase. Um, what, what what can we as a jurisdiction encourage to? Uh, to get incorporated into the residential code to kind of provide what is a reasonable increase to both the capacity and evaluate the life safety um, of that increase. And so I appreciate the the tag inputs on how we've got to where we've where what's been approved already. Within this document, you'll see items that are highlighted in red and underlined. And those are the changes that have been reviewed and approved by the IRC and IFC tags. Items highlighted in yellow, I'm going to hold on to, uh, on addressing at this time. I'd like to go through first with uh, what's been approved at the tag. So we went back and forth on a number and, and it's landed on 16 as the cap before you go into the building code. And so the family home child care provisions here are currently at 12 children. And you'll see throughout this document that the cap has been raised to 16 or fewer children. If you scroll down a little further, R331.1, we have currently made a, a change in the provisions around exterior exit doors and have provided a reference back to the base code, base residential code provisions of R311.2. And the next change further down is a cleanup. Sorry, Dustin, you've gone a little too far. R331.1, item four, there is a cleanup there. A residential sprinkler system, as currently called out in the existing provisions, references only NFPA 13D. And one of the tag changes was to include reference to section P2904, 
which is uh, an alternate to 13D that the IRC recognizes. That change happens in, a, in section 2.3 as well and is consistent throughout these code changes. As we scroll further down, this is a change to the base requirement for up to 12 children, which is that smoke alarms and heat detectors shall be installed in accordance with the requirements of new construction per IRC 314. And so what this ensures is that when we are looking at an existing family home childcare and the capacity increase, that we get to put in smoke alarms and heat detectors as would be required for new construction. And we are asking for an additional heat detector in each kitchen. And then we get to what's new. R331.2 are the new provisions for when you have from 13 to 16 children. The uh, first provision there is for an artificial light source in the event that power supply is cut and so that we still have light to the stairs, so for egress. And the next section is R331.2, which is the, the biggest change here is that we are getting sprinklers per P2904 or 13D. And so as approved by the TAG for our family home child care to increase their capacity up to 16 children, they will need to install a sprinkler system. And that's, that's where we landed with the TAGs and that is the language that was recommended to move forward. Are there any questions on the on the TAG recommendations? And and I'd also invite any of the TAG members to to speak if they want to talk about the the proposal as approved by the TAGs. I just want to clarify that the exceptions on screen are part of an amendment beyond what the tag approved. Dustin, are you, being that um, Dave was a part of the tag process but was not able to be here, would, would now be an appropriate time for the comments he submitted? Uh, yes, I, I think so. So, I mean, we don't have any uh, of our panelists wanting to comment on this one. Uh, we could open up to public comment and I could lead that off with the reading of uh, Dave's letter that he uh, submitted for testimony. Okay. Okay. Uh, would you like me to share the letter on screen? Oh, Angeli has her yeah. address. I just want to, before we get into that, because I know it's going to address the sprinklers, I just wanted to um, say a few words about that gives some context. So as uh, Karen and Tyler mentioned, that state Senate bill was passed in April 2021. The assessment for the limit was supposed to be based on square footage and staffing capabilities. Um, so I work with mostly commercial institutional preschools and child care centers, but I have been able to work with a couple of family home care providers as part of the City of Seattle DEL, Department of Education and Early Learning Program. Um, so even with centers, construction costs are high. Small businesses rely on grant, grant funding, friendly landlords, and family donations for capital projects. For family in-home care, my experience with that has been with very modest homes and providers who are trying to make do with what they have. English may not be their first language. They're unlikely to have any experience with development or construction. Um, there's very little available funding. Seattle is one of the few cities that ha actually has funding for that. Um, any major construction activity would impact the provider's ability to generate income. Their child care would have to shut down and the ability of the families in their care to have access to that care. And so right now, the, why this all started is there's a lack of clarity around around requirements. The DCYF regulations, as you know, conflict with the residential building codes. 
it, it's creating confusion and it's also putting providers at risk. So I really appreciate that the tag is taking on this work. I would ask you to address life safety in a way that's affordable, achievable, and straightforward. I would love to see a checklist type system that does not rely on design professionals to implement. Thank you. Okay. Um, would you like me to share the letter as I uh, read it for you guys? Yes, please. Uh, it looks like, oh, never mind. All right, so this is a letter from Dave Cocott. He uh, participated as a member of the fire tag in part of this rulemaking that we are considering here today. Um, so from Dave, having participated in the combined IRC IFC tag for the proposed changes to allow up to 16 children in home daycares, I'm compelled to provide testimony to the council regarding the discussions at the BFP meeting October 13th 2023. The combined tag voted to require fire sprinklers in R331.2.2 on September 19th, 2023 for the allowance to increase the number of children. Although the IFC tag did not have a quorum at that particular meeting, a courtesy vote was made that was unanimous from those attending to recommend fire sprinklers. The IRC tag did have a quorum and it was a near unanimous vote to require fire sprinklers and not to move forward a proposal that would have provided a path that would not have required fire sprinklers. During the October 13th, 2023 meeting, there was discussion to override the recommendation of the combined tag. During that meeting, several references were made to compare I-4 and E occupancies to the proposed increase in the family home child cares. The comparisons lacked the full requirements that an I-4 or E child care facility would have to meet. Opponents to the sprinkler requirement compared family home child care in the IRC to I-4 and E occupancies. In that comparison, it was stated that I-4 or E occupancies would not be required to have fire sprinklers when 50 or less children are in a daycare. Although that is technically correct, the comparison to a family home child care facility is different as the home child care building also includes a residence. Under the IBC IFC, if the I-4 or E occupancy were in a building with a residence, fire sprinklers would be required in the building with any number of children for IBC IFC 903.2.8. The recommendation by the overall majority of the TAG members recognizes that increasing the number of children in family home child cares constitutes a higher hazard than the current allowed, than the current allowed number. It is concerning that the minority position of the tag is being pushed without the participation and recommendation of the majority of the combined tag. The tag had a number of meetings and conducted their due diligence in making the recommendation that was presented to the BFP. More than once, the proposed alternative to fire sprinklers was revised and brought back to the combined tag. It was clear throughout the hearing that there was a majority of those on the tag that did not accept that an alternative compliance path proposal was equivalent to the protection offered by fire sprinklers. It is recognized that there is indeed a daycare crisis. Reducing life safety to address the crisis is not the response that needs to be taken, especially for a high risk population. Before considering revised language that is different from the recommended combined tag language to allow for a path without fire sprinklers for the increased number of children in family home child care facilities, the council needs to take into account the effort and majority position by the combined tag, respectively Dave Kokop. Ardell, go ahead. Thank you. So I, I want to thank Dave Koka for his feedback and expertise, both during the IRC and I uh, and combined fire tag review of the proposal, and also for his written testimony. Respectfully, the rulemaking process is established such that there are multiple chances to put forward a public comment. We're in CR 101. The TAG has made a recommendation for a draft rule to the SBCC, and that recommendation is for sprinklers only. And that is a that is a, a great resolution. I mean, if, if that's where we land today, then that is where we land today with the SBCC. 
However, DCYF has knows that adding sprinklers can be an obstacle. And I have two public comments today that modify what is being proposed and what has been reviewed and approved by the tags. That doesn't discount the work that the tag has done. I very much appreciate that work and that has gotten us to the language where we are at today. But the process does allow still for public comment. And what the tag has provided is a recommendation for the SBCC. Anybody can submit a public comment to the tag. We did that during the tag review. I did that during the BFP on behalf of DCYF work group. And if it's okay with the council, I will do so again today to offer an exception that would allow sprinklers to be waived when these, these alternate criteria are met. And again, if the SBCC votes to move this forward today from CR 101 to 102, I remind you, there's still a public hearing and public comments are still permitted at that point as well. So today I'd like to put forth a public comment to add a sprinkler exception to the tag approved language. And this is another bite at the apple in support of increased access to childcare. Uh, Tony, is it appropriate for me to, to make a, one additional comment on the proposal that you see, or do you want me to make a formal presentation uh, request of the SBCC to hear a public comment? Um, Ardell, we can do it one of a couple ways. We can either open it up for um, public comment um, and, and go there now, or we can open it up for council discussion and then public comment. So it's whatever you're comfortable with. Floor is yours. I appreciate that. Since it's on screen already, I'd like to go ahead and actually, Dustin, would you mind if I went and shared um, the version that I have on screen so it's a little more clear? I don't think you have the the, the most version, current version. Thank you. No worries. Can you give me the ability to share, please? You should have that still. Okay. Thank you. So there's there's two changes that I'd like to submit via public comment. And what's shown in red is what's been approved. What's shown in red with highlighted yellow is what I'm proposing as public comment. The first one's a little more straightforward and it's around this proposal to add language that states that exterior exit doors shall be operable from the inside without the use of keys or any special knowledge or effort. Discussion at the tag recommended language that said to add and comply with the requirements of R311.2. After discussion with DCYF, um, I, it became clear that the existing language was negotiated language that had already been coordinated with the WAC. And by applying the provisions of R311.2, the big change is that existing family home child carers would not be able to use a side hinge door to meet this requirement. Or sorry, that they would be required to use a side hinge door to meet this requirement and that a sliding door for egress would not be permitted. And based on discussion at the BFP, uh, they were amenable to a public comment moving forward that would move, relocate that reference to R311.2 to what we were asked to do, which is create provisions around the increased capacity to 16 children. And so you'll see here in R331.2.2, exterior exit doors serving childcare areas shall comply with the requirements of R311.2 and 311.3. And those are um, 311.2 is the, the door requirements, and that includes a side hinge door. And 311.3 .3 is a landing requirement. And so these were suggestions based um, that came from the BFP to relocate this. And so I'd like to submit that for public comment. And then the second sort of 
uh, the bigger issue that I'd like to bring forward for public comment is the sprinkler exception. So the BFP and, pardon me, the IRC and the I and the fire code tags both approved sprinklers to move forward. What I would like to submit as public comment is an exception to requiring sprinklers. And that exception can be granted only with the approval of a code official. And it would require that the childcare areas all be located within four feet of grade. And also that all childcare areas would have a door compliant with 311.2 and three that leads directly to the exterior of the building. So that, and I, I realize I have a duplicate, <laughs> duplicate reference here, and, and that could get cleaned up um, depending on how you wanted to move those, those public comments forward. So why are we asking for this? Again, the cost of sprinklers can be prohibitive and DCYF preference to be able to have more providers use this is to maintain the sprinkler exception. Again, we, we only allowing this where children are, are located at grade and where each child care area has a door leading directly to the building exterior. While not the same as an I-4 or an E occupancy in the building code, those occupancies, if this were a commercial child care, would not be required to have sprinklers. It's not apples to apples, but again, 50 children in the child care in a commercial child care in the building code would not be required to have sprinklers. So I ask again, as a public comment for the building code council as a whole to consider use of this exception. One of the big things within this language is that it is subject to the approval of the code official. And what that means is that each jurisdiction, each fire official, each building official can make a determination based on the plan set that they see in front of them, based on their understanding of their access to that site, of the water supply, the response time of their fire department, and of the plan layout. How readily accessible is egress? How well does this plan lend itself to an increase to 16 children without requiring sprinklers? And while that may not be appropriate for every location, what this does is it gives the local official the flexibility to make a call on whether it could be appropriate for, the, for any specific child care. So that's, uh, that's my request is that those are the public comments that I'd like to put forward today. Um, and I'll, I'll hand it back. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Tyler, go ahead. Oh, we forget that mute button. Yeah, thank you, Ardell, for that. I'd like to just piggyback on her her public comment. Um, I think she does a fantastic job with the technical writing and, and also explaining it in the advocacy. Can't thank her enough for it. I just want to chime in a little bit about DCYF perspective here and what we're hoping to accomplish. Um, DCYF is not opposed to sprinklers whatsoever. We wish every child care provider had sprinklers, absolutely. Um, but we also have a very in-depth understanding of what the sprinkler requirement does to programs. And it basically means programs can't operate or won't operate under that requirement. So our perspective, and this was built not just from the licensing expertise that our staff have, but also in conjunction with a number of building professionals and fire professionals that we spoke with throughout our work group, our sentiment is that we are asking for this narrow, and I'm speaking specifically to the sprinkler exception, but the other exception um, still applies here in my comments. Uh, we're simply asking to for the council to consider this narrow exception to the sprinklers if certain conditions are met, if certain other health and safety criteria are put in place. Um, and we feel comfortable 
in these limited situations because other life and safety um, elements include some things that Karen, my colleague mentioned earlier, increased fire alarms, heat detectors, increased staffing, lower ratios of um, children to providers inside the home. Uh, a new requirement is to have pre-approval of all of these spaces by the local government before issuing a waiver and not allowing people with initial licenses to have waivers, not allowing providers who do no, do overnight care to have waivers. We feel that all of these health and safety updates combined are sufficient to allow for, again, this narrow exception for fire sprinklers in certain circumstances, because what we're trying to do at the end of the day is help these small businesses in rural communities that are you know, few and far between helping children provide helping families provide care for their children, helping these small businesses that are in urban centers, helping their communities so parents can go to work, just increasing the supply, even if it's onesies, twosies here and, here and there, that makes a huge difference for families, that makes a huge difference for kids. And so even changing these criteria in this little way can help out some number, some greater number of families. Uh, so thank you for your consideration, that's our, uh, our take on the exceptions and our reasoning for asking for it. And I don't know if either uh, my colleague Karen or anybody else on our work group has anything to add, but thank you again, everybody here. Thank you, Tyler. Karen, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I guess I just, I don't have anything further to add. I wanna thank you again. I wanna thank Anjali, Ardell, Dustin, Stoyan, everybody who's helped with this because it has, it has pointed us in the direction of safer childcare for licensed childcare facilities. And, and that's our goal as well as your goal, I think. Um, our goal also is to get more kids in licensed childcare because they aren't. And uh, I don't even like to think where they are. One of the biggest, most important things to me, and I'm the facilitator who processes these applications when they come in, is that we would have like Tyler described, something in hand from someone who has inspected the facility. And, and that's important to us. And that would make us feel um, very much more confident that there are fire and life safety issues that have been considered. But thank you all again. Thank you, Karen. Ardell, is your hand residual or did you have something further? That's left over. Sorry about that. Okay. No, no worries. Uh, Tyler, go ahead. Yeah, thanks again. Sorry about that. Uh, one thing Karen mentioned reminded me of one last point I wanted to put before the council is that we we absolutely understand where the sprinkler requirement comes from and having no exceptions makes perfect sense. That on paper creates a safer space. Um, in reality, though, is that these, these providers simply go to an unlicensed provider. They go to a somebody in the neighborhood who says, yeah, I'll take your kids way cheaper. And we have no insight into any sort of health and safety training, any sort of physical space, any sort of uh, anything really. And so that's why um, that's why having something even a little more lenient on paper means true safety, a true increase to safety to kids in the state of Washington, rather than just having a safer home on paper. Thanks so much. Dustin, go ahead. Uh, so it is the hope today to to get a proposal moved to CR 102 to begin the public comment period and uh, hopefully get this uh, adopted and ready for implementation with the rest of our codes in March 15th of 24. Um, I wanted to make sure that uh, the council is aware that um, if we put this together with the TAG approved proposal, and there's a lot of public comment that supports the exception, and we don't have that in the draft language, we won't be able to add that at the CR 103 phase because it'll be a regulatory change. Um, so it would be my suggestion to, if the council is interested, to have both of these options for consideration, to have an option one without the exception and an option two with the exception for consideration during the public comment period. 
Thank you, Dustin. Thanks for that clarification. I think that helps out council on moving forward. Uh, Micah, go ahead. It definitely helps me. Um, you know, I was originally against kind of moving forward with additional children. Uh, it, you know, had some concerns there and was not very comfortable with it since we already are, are higher than other states, but we are setting precedent and we need to, you know, advance things like this and consider all the options that should occur for each jurisdiction. Um, I definitely think that the first PC is, is a no brainer that we're going to get in there. That's a, <laughs> um, a pretty easy to do a good clarification and capture. Uh, I definitely want to see the options move forward. I chaired the IRC IFC combined tag. So I didn't get to vote <laughs> or I didn't vote. I probably could have voted, but um, that's really not the way we function. The only time the chair usually votes is if there's, you know, something significant uh, where it's a tiebreaker or something else. So I didn't vote, but uh, you know, both proposals, the one that was moved by the TAG and the one that the BFP committee didn't have a quorum on, gets you sprinklers. But the one with the exceptions and the PC that Ardell is proposing allows the individual jurisdiction to have more or less boots on the ground and understand how their jurisdiction functions and, and makes the case that, hey, there may be certain instances where these are OK without sprinklers to increase for these few additional children. Um, so I would like to see that move forward and I'll open, I'll leave the floor open for additional council discussion, but I'd like to make a motion soon. Okay. Thank you, Micah. Uh, Pete, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, John, I mentioned that, uh, if I interpret this correctly, that commercial facilities with up to 50 children are not required to have sprinkler systems if they meet the ground level and uh, direct outside entrance requirements is, am I interpreting that correctly? That's correct. That is correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, what does a commercial facility have that a, uh, a, a more non-commercial facility that we're talking about ha ha not have here? What, what would be the differences in a commercial facility versus a non a residential facility. I I don't know who you want to tackle that. But there's probably a few of us who want perhaps to perhaps Jala. I guess I I am you know so. I'm going to go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, this is sort of hidden text, uh, and it's it's stricken out. But I do want to share the language. So this is the full code proposal is here, and I've included what is existing code language that does not change. And so that's why you see it with a strikeout. But right here is the, um, the I-4 occupancy, which is the daycare occupancy designation in the building code. I'm gonna to go to 903261, which states that an automatic sprinkler system shall be provided in fire areas where the fire area has an occupant load of 51 or more. So this is where you get the charging language where for less than 50 occupants, there is no sprinkler requirement in an I-4. There is also an exception that, so if I have greater than 50, so if I have 51 or more, then sprinklers are required. But there's a further exception to that, where if I have between 51 and 100, that an automatic sprinkler system is not required when the daycare is located at the level of exit discharge and where every room where care is provided has not fewer than one exterior exit door. And that is the language that I've modeled uh, at, along with tag feedback to uh, that I've mod that this the exception for family home child cares has been modeled after. So for 51 to 100 exterior exit door, direct access located at grade, you would not be required to have sprinklers in an I-4. The other component then is the fire alarm requirements. So a manual fire alarm system is triggered in an I-4. However, there is an exception where it's not required with an occupant load of 50 or less. So this is just one component. It is difficult to compare, you know, what do you get out of a, a building code building that is an I-4, there are many other provisions and, and we have a, a table of those if you would like to see that. Um, but I, that's probably more than we want to cover in this, in this tag, but those are the big ones. 
um, you would get egress, potentially compartmentation. Um, it, there's accessibility revisions, plumbing revisions. There's so there's many more provisions out of the building code, but from a fire and life safety standpoint, fire and sprinkler alarm are the biggest, and you would not be required to have one in an I-4 for less than 50. Does that answer your question? And I'm sure there are others that can contribute to this response. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I believe I believe that does. It seems like that there's a uh, uh, technical requirement hump for between 16 and 50, uh, and that we're trying to lower that hump to some extent. Uh, if if I sorry, uh, if I, I I guess that's probably a bad analogy, but uh, uh, it certainly seems like the, for the up to 16 residents that you're you're trying to match what happens in a more uh, regulated facility, but allowing local inspectors to come in and make sure that that's appropriate kind of addresses that, I guess. Uh, so I, I guess I'm you know, being first time exposed to this process. Uh, I guess this sounds pretty reasonable to me. So. Uh, but I'd like to hear from others. So I'll I'll quit there. No, that's a great question, Pete. I'll kind of add to that is that the building height and area would be similar for the R construction as for the I-4. And again, you know, we're looking at comparison, quick comparisons. That those are similar in sprinkler and non-sprinkler buildings. Um, close, not exact, but very similar. One of the concerns that was brought up at the, I believe the BFP, and I could be wrong here, that um, just to your question, Pete, is the um, emergency vehicle access would, would be a considerable concern in a residential neighborhood versus a commercial uh, building that's zoned differently. So that is one, one difference. And that's where I think that the local jurisdiction, that if that is something that they felt was not appropriate, can just say no. And then this, the sprinkler exception cannot be used. Uh, Pete, anything further? No, I, I guess I didn't catch on the emergency vehicle access. Uh, and so that would, so that you mean fire trucks, not necessarily medical facility trucks, uh, ambulances, et cetera. That's what we're I think the to focus on across here. the board. I think the concerns across the board, but yes, with with uh, fire apparatus for sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Pete. Uh, Tom, go ahead. Yeah, I'm. I said in on I think all of the tags and the committee meeting on this, and I I got to say, I'm fully in favor of going forward with the exceptions, as as they're presented here. Um, I think in not doing that, we'd pretty much preclude the opportunity to go from 12 to 16 in almost every case, you know, just from the business standpoint of it and the cost of making that improvement to the property. So, you know, if we're going to want to be consistent with the um, with the goals of the legislation that we're trying to um, move forward here, I think we need to allow this exception. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Dustin, did you have something to add? Yes, I, you know, in reading Dave Cocott's letter, I thought, I think there's a point that he has there in the middle that uh, is maybe being overlooked a little bit, which is when we're talking about I-4 and E occupancies, we are considering those occupancies as standalone occupancies. And I think his comment that when we are looking at these, that you have a residence included in this mixed use occupancy, and something like that in the building code would have a sprinkler. Thank you, Dustin. Appreciate that. Jay, go ahead. I support moving forward and putting the exception in for uh, public comment. And um, the one piece that I think we'll need to respond to after public comment, if I might channel uh, Micah for a moment, is we, we uh, allow an exception for the code official, but don't provide any criteria on what that exception should be based on and uh, would like to follow up with some language on that. Uh, but that can happen after public comment. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. One of my concerns was that specifically. Um, 
generally, if we're going to decline something, I'm going to try and reposition because the light's getting bad behind me. Um, if we, you know, do not approve something, then that has to be in writing with justification. And so I think there is a gap there. Um, so maybe some language similar to alternative materials, methods, and designs, where it says that you have to put that in writing with justification might be some good language to have. Thank you. Um, Anjali? Um, I, someone made a comment that the family child care is less regulated. And while that's true at a building code perspective, the wax around child care are pretty intense, sort of operationally and also in terms of other kinds of safeties, you know, safety glass, sharps, access to water, all kinds of like health and safety things. And those are very similar for family to um, uh, center care. So just, and there are regular inspections, just so folks know about that. Thank you. Katie? Yeah, I was gonna make actually two comments about that and kind of um, ask, so thank you, uh, Anjali, that, that's really helpful. And also I, I was gonna ask Micah if the factors to consider on an exception are in, are those, typically enumerated in a statute like this, or are they kind of just like known? Is that the secret code that you guys know? Uh, that's kind of a known, but I, I want to say a lot of some of those criteria are outlined in chapter one, administrative mm -hmm. sections of the code where it talks about, you know, when you consider certain things or alternates, it, it does have information in there. Um, so it applies to every section of the code when you're considering something different. So we, we wouldn't necessarily have to outline those or would it be helpful to, you just know how to do that already? Um, I won't say it's not helpful, but um, I, I definitely think it's a discussion point we can have and and maybe share those sections with, with Jay, I think brought up this point, uh, share those sections and say, this is where we get the criteria or how we determine the criteria a little bit. But um, I see Ardell has her hand up. Maybe she'd like to answer that too. Um, just doing a quick search of subject to approval by the building official or by the authority having jurisdiction within the residential code, there is, yeah, the, the typically does not include the criteria for review, but that is something that could accompany uh, any legislation that does move forward and could also be a guidance document that, again, the, there's no Washington State amendments to a um, to the commentary, <laughs> um, and, but there could be a request for interpretation that is made by a jurisdiction um, that the SBCC could answer and post. Um, there's there's ways to get that get that guidance out there. If it's not, um, it doesn't always fit clearly as criteria in the code provision itself, but it could. Uh, we could do it with an interpretation. Got it. Thank you both. Um, I I'd be in favor of moving both forward, both options and get more public comment on it. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Micah? Uh, I'd like to make a motion unless Todd wants to make a motion. I see his hand up. <laughs> Maybe on some more discussion. Can I make a motion, Todd? Okay. No, no, no. Make, like the mo make... make the motion, please. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'd like to make a motion that we move uh, the proposal to CR 102 that includes PC1 and the option for P with PC2. I'll second that since I have my hand up. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Micah, would you like to speak to that? Yeah, based on the comments from council and questions and at least some of the voice support for including the option and the recommendation from Dustin that we have it in case it is needed based on further public comment down the road. Um, that's why we want to have that in there. And I do believe it is the best and, and most balanced path forward to get this proposal in, in and appreciate DCYF's uh, assistance and guidance. Thanks. Thank you, Micah. Todd? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I do support putting the options forward. I'm, I'm, I'm still a little uncomfortable on, on the, on the amendments, um, you know, with, with, from a procedural standpoint and, and also I, I'm trying to resolve, you know, to, to, um, 
code officials that I, I greatly respect uh, are in disagreement on this. Um, so I think I'm, I'm looking forward to the rest of the public process is, is my point. So I'm very, very comfortable with the options. Thank you everyone for bringing this forward. Okay, thank you, Todd. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, one thing that I have failed to officially do on this topic is to open it to the public. I think we have a lot of public comment, but I just haven't officially offered it to those in the per <laughs> attendees list. So let me get that out of the way and then Jay, you're next, okay? So is there anyone uh, from the public that would like to comment on this? If you'd like, you can raise your hand. Uh, Tony, Ty Menser would like to uh, have some input. Am I picked up on mine? Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, I just had a question for Tyler, I think it was. When you were describing the package of other protections that would looked at in a whole make this reasonable proposal, you were ticking through things. And at one point you mentioned ratio, uh, increased ratio or something. I didn't quite get that. And I was caught my attention. I was wondering if you could explain that. Yeah, great question. Um, ratio is sort of the cornerstone for health and safety in the child care world. And the ratio means how many kids can one uh, child care provider watch at a time? Um, and I am going to have to pull up the numbers, so I'd, I'd have to look it up. But basically, I think the ratio, and I'm going to lean on Karen here too, because I don't want to misspeak, but I think the current ratio, number one, is based on age. Um, so the younger the, the child or children are, the smaller the ratio, the fewer number of kids uh, a provider can, can care for. Uh, and ability goes along with that. If a child is ambulatory, it's going to have a smaller ratio in supervision than you know a 12 year old kid or a group of 12 year old kids so one of the things our proposed changes will do in our dcyf rules is it's going to tighten the ratio for any provider operating under a waiver um, and if you give me a couple minutes i can get you those exact numbers but maybe that just generally answers the question that does answer the question and i would just argue that's a pretty important Piece. So, I mean, in supporting what you're trying to advance. So, I I think it's good for everyone to hear that. And if you had those numbers super handy, that would be good. So, we could hear specifically what you're doing to tighten it. I have it open if you want me to read off of it. It's the waiver for 13 or more children. And, Tyler, I asked the same questions uh, of what's, what is the ratio. And, and we, what it, you had told me previously was that. If there were children under two, there would be three staff. If there were no children under two, there would be two staff. So two staff for 16 children, minimum. That's different than what it would be now? That is, let me clarify here. I believe that is the proposed changes that's the future state, what it will be once we update our rules, which is more stringent than what it currently is. Uh, maybe give me a minute here. <laughs> I just found it on the DCOF website, and it's pretty clear that it's at least two staff for children over two <clears throat> with a one to eight ratio. And then there's a, a sliding scale for the ambulatory nature of the children and age of the children, but at least three staff uh, if there's children under two, if they're going up to 16. That, that's exactly right. That is the current code uh, right now. And that is, that is um, just to clarify, that is more stringent than, that is the waiver ratio. That is more stringent than somebody not operating under the waiver. We already, this is Karen, I hope it's okay to jump in. We already Please. require, we already have differences in how the ratio can be depending upon how many children are walking independently, how many are under two, how many are under one. So we have different age groups and their ratios that are required. And then this WAC that is about the waivers uh, makes that more stringent. So we also include another 15 square feet in the waiver process for um, any children who are under two years of age. Um, we do, we're asking that licensing staff watch 
a conducted fire um, exit uh, with, uh, uh, within under two minutes. So there's some things that we're asking. We already have, for a commercial facility, we have the state fire marshal go out. That's a requirement. They do not visit family homes. So the, the part of, for us about having a local uh, person come out and verify that they're meeting these codes and safety things is really great for us. We, um, we ask for higher education if someone's going to have uh, an increased capacity over 12, we ask for higher um, experience number. They have to have at least three years of experience. So there's a lot of things that are already in our WAC that we've kind of pushed um, a little more to a higher limit for this. Uh, and then we do have building code exit WACs in our uh, in our WAC and our staff are required to make sure that those meet requirements. So again, there's a lot of there's a lot of building code and safety hazard stuff in our requirements. And so again, having someone local go out and help us verify that is um, would just be golden. Thank you, Karen. Um, okay, let's do this. Uh, Karen, did you have anything further? I know you had your hand up. I thought no, question. no, I don't remember. So no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you, Tony. Right, thank you. Anjali, did you have something? I know your hand was up. Okay. All right. Thank you. And just so I can check the box again, uh, any public comment from the attendees? Raise a hands. Seeing none. Okay. With that, we will go back to council discussion. And Jay, did you have something on that? I did not. I was just flagging the fact that Ty. Got it. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Any further discussion from council? Okay. Right. A, sorry. I didn't raise my hand. I have a question. So the motion was including like, I don't know, PC one or something like that. What is public comment? I imagine. Oh, is that oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I, I I go to enough code hearings where it's uh, you, you abbreviate everything, it makes faster. Uh, public comment one was 331.1, .1, the modification Ardell proposed there. And then PC2 was the the um, exceptions in 331 or 331.2.2, I believe, if you need to be more specific. Thanks, Chill. <laughs> okay. No, thanks. Okay. Uh, we'll go ahead and... Um take a vote on our on our motion. The motion is to move the proposal forward to the CR 102 um, with public comment one and option of public comment two, which includes the exception in 331. Does that capture that okay for council members? You're good with that? Okay, very good. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any against? Okay, very good, motion carries. Okay, thank you everyone for your time on that subject. We're uh, hmm. taking a break, please. Yeah, let's take a break. Okay, it's 228, we'll come back at, uh, let's go 239. Okay, we'll call this meeting back to order and we will move to agenda item number eight which is request for new emergency rule. It's the 2018 IFC chapter 12 and 80. And Ken Brulette, if you're on, I'll uh, let you lead the way. Sorry, I missed that, Dustin, what's that? Oh, I was... Murmuring with story, I've got the documents ready to show, and and I just promoted to a panelist, so he should be allowed to unmute and talk and stuff. Okay. All right, we're getting there. All right, thank you so much. Um, I first, uh, geez, I don't want that up there. Hold on. Make me a panelist and it messes things up. Okay, so I guess my first question uh, to the board is, or I mean, to the council is, during the last meeting, and I re-listened to it again because I got nothing you know, else to do, um, and it was a great way to fall asleep, is the emergency rule for the 2018 IFC, the current one, 
And on the SBCC website, it stipulates due to the revised effective date of all 21 codes, the emergency rule will be refiled again and will be effective until March 14th, 2024. What there was no motion and it was not voted on. It was discussed that that was something that was going to happen. I did not know, and this is where I'm, I'm asking this is that a council action that has to happen? Or since the effective date got changed, it, it just automatically happens on its own without council approval? Uh, to answer your question for refiling the emergency rules, uh, we don't ask the council for additional approval. If it's something that is political, we will do it. But I think it was the consensus that we need to refile it anyway. So this is what we did a couple of days after the council meeting. Okay, with, so it, with, it, with the new with the new effective date. Okay, so it was refiled, but the council didn't vote on it. They just you just did it on a consensus based on the discussion. Okay, as long as that was that was that's fine if that's what was decided. All right. Um, I'll move on and let's see, it will be probably, let me see, I'm going to just go ahead and you tell me if this is going to work. Um, I cannot share my screen while the other participant is sharing. So can, can you allow me to share my screen? It might be easier sure. for me to follow along. Thank you. All right, we'll try to make this bigger for you guys can see it. All right, so this is just the the document again that you were seeing. I want to make sure you guys can see that. All right. Hello. That's a yes. Okay, I see Tony's head yep. went down. All right. So a, a little reasoning for this. Um, yes, it's a 41-page document, but what I have done, um, because we the Building Code Council um, has continued to push the effective date of the 2021 code has caused some issues. Uh with regards to just getting some of these provisions that we know that we're going to be implemented for the 2021 code, particularly for section 1207 of the fire code to get implemented. Um, what I'm showing today is everything that's in the current 2021 code and also all of the 2121 off cycle um, approvals, which the council just made at their last meeting. So there is no new language that would be introduced today. It's all existing approved language. What I have done is tried to move this forward so it could become an emergency rule today to the 2018 code. So what I'm asking is that each WAC section, which I'm gonna roll through here, there's going to have to be additions and deletions. So the 2018 code will correlate with the 2021 20, code plus all the off cycle rules. So I'll try to run through these um, as quickly as I can, um, unless because of time you guys don't want me to and you just want to ask questions about it. Um, so I'll, I'll let okay. you guys make that decision. Okay, Dustin, go ahead. Uh, Ken, uh, was, uh, my understanding that the proposal here is to pretty much bring the um, adoption of the 2021 amendments back to the 2018 to give those provisions the availability to be used there. Um, the proposal we had for the 2021 amendment didn't have a section uh, for chapter one or for the definitions. Um, I guess my question for you is, does this bring back the model code language of 2021 IFC to the 2018? Yes. Okay. Okay, with that, um... <clears throat> I'll open it up just quickly for council discussion and maybe we can get some direction as to how we want to tackle this. Um, we have a couple other agenda items left uh, that would be nice to get through. Do we want Ken to go through these? Are we um, on the surface in agreement that this is a good proposal to 
to bring forward. And if that's the case, then um, you know maybe some expediting is is in order. I'm I'm happy to hear from the group. Uh, Micah. You'll always hear from me, Tony, whether I'm part of the group or not. <laughs> um, uh, I think this is important. I, I believe we've talked about this at the last meeting and in, in how to capture the need of the 2018 and so many projects that will still be vested under that over the coming months and even beyond that, constructing to it, much less vesting to the 2018 code. So I do this believe this is important. Um, and I, I I agree with Ken that there's really no new language here. It's just bringing all that information that we've already reviewed and adopted forward. And I think we should expedite this, but I, I don't want to cut off any public comment. So at the appropriate time, I'd be happy to make a motion. If I can, if I can clarify, first, the, I think we had this discussion a few months ago on, a, on another council meeting. Uh, uh, the council can, the proponent can, uh, uh, show the proposal and then we'll, we'll give a, a month for the council to uh, evaluate the proposal. Uh, I feel bad, uh, Ken, you you uh, did the 30% raise for me, but I, I, I have to disagree with you on that one. Uh, and so the issue here is that we don't even know if we can file it as an emergency for 2018. We, we have to talk to the court revisor's office. We couldn't because uh, they were able to uh, add the new effective date a couple of days ago. And it's not only this emergency, we have uh, five or six uh, CR 105 uh, fives for different codes, the errata, and we have the R4 that is still hanging, and we have the uh, uh, Ken, Ken's proposal that was going to go to 2021. So even if you direct staff to uh, proceed with emergency, we don't know why, uh, if we will be able to file it. Why? First, we already have emergency in place. And second, this is an emergency in 2018, when we ask the court advisor's office for the document to file it, he'll give us 2021. So I don't I don't know how how we can make this work. I, I, don't, I was planning to give an answer for you today, but again, we never had the chance to meet with the court advisors for this due to we're already overloaded them with the effective dates. Okay. Uh, Micah? I, I figured you were going to say that story, and I know that puts you in a very tough position. I, I'm going to ask, is, is there steps that the council can take or legislatively we could take to maybe remove the barriers that the code revisor's office keeps putting up for us to do our work as the council and what we're supposed to do per the state building code act. It just seems like every time we talk about doing something we need to in various instances, it's always, Oh, the code revisor is not going to let us do this, or they're going to put up barriers here and cause more work there. It just seems like we should get some adjustments somewhere along the way at some point, not today, obviously, but that's my, that's my rant off my soapbox. box. Well, they don't put barriers for us. We have to comply with uh, uh, the Administrative Procedures Act and what, what, what was it, Kristen? Doesn't matter. So there are policies and procedures and they are not specific to building codes. So as far as I see it, and I already stated it at the beginning of this meeting, we need to find a way to adopt the codes by reference, not filing them in one. In this case, we don't need to comply with these specific uh, uh, provisions. But uh, they don't do this because of us. They follow what we need to follow. If it's no, no, I I understand that. I'm just curious to how we can separate that, like you talked about, and and what steps are being made to do so. Okay. I'm uh, working on it, but I don't have the answer yet. Okay, Craig, go ahead. Thank you, Tony. Uh, two questions, uh, pretty basic. If I'm in the middle of a code approval on a building that's about to be built and you insert this into that, do I have to go back again and are these more stringent than I'm going to have to add more things to my building that I currently don't have to add? That's question number one. And Ken, maybe that's a question you can answer. And then two, maybe something Micah can answer because he said this is wrong. How is this more urgent than getting the entire 2021 code out? What about this specific thing is more urgent 
in the entire code. Why don't we just wait till 2021 comes out and incorporate it smoothly rather than having this emergency drill? Thank you. I'll let Ken speak to that. All right. So, so first, Craig. Um, so right now, NFPA 855, the 2023 edition of that um, is what you should be designing your emergency uh, systems to, or your energy storage systems, I'm sorry, too. The, the code, uh, the 21 code has a lot of those provisions in them. And there was some questions in that 23 uh, edition of NFP 855 that have been answered in the 24 IFC process. Those answers have been brought forward into the off cycle rules, which you guys approved. Um, and so it helps to clarify things uh, that were questions if you were designing and actually using NFPA 855 now. So that's one reason that uh, we don't really want to wait any longer. We have been waiting. Um, this is frustrating. I know we did expect our codes to be adopted months ago. And honestly, I don't know if the March 14th deadline is going to get pushed again. So we are in the 2018 code cycle right now. I don't, I, and I don't understand um, besides, yes, staff is busy. I get that. But if the code revisor's office is telling us this, that we can't make revisions to the current 2018 whack that's in effect, I don't understand that. Um, but again, I, I think it's important to uh, try to correlate the these changes into the 2018 code now um, with regards to vesting that when I think you asked this to, to Micah, this wouldn't go into effect until it becomes effective. So if you've already vested under um, the 2018 uh, code um, and those were the provisions, then you're vested under those provisions. Um, this wouldn't kick in uh, for a project until, or a project wouldn't get this applied to them until after they applied. Um, so I don't think it would be a, a retroactive uh, requirement. Well, that seems to me like it's going to cause more confusion than delete, especially when you said, since I'm already in compliance with NFPA, if I'm in compliance with that, why do I need this? For my next question. But if you, now we're going to have staggered starts of this stuff, depending on when I vest and when I don't vest, I, I see this as causing more confusion than it's going to eliminate. And I, I appreciate your frustration, Ken. I, I do. I think everyone in this room appreciates the frustration, but why, causing more confusion is not going to resolve that frustration. I don't think it's going to cause more confusion. I, I just think people want, they, they already know about this language. The 2021 code's been out. Designers for energy storage systems know about it. They were part of the development process. This is not going to cause confusion to them. They were the ones that helped support this beginning with last year. They want they, they want consistency. This provides consistency. But can't that see, be said about every component of the 2021 code? Everyone is already, they know what it is. They, they're ready to rock and roll with it. And uh, so I guess that goes to my second question. Why is this more urgent than any other portion of 2021 code? I, I'm i not saying it's more urgent than any other edition of 2021 code. I'm, I, I think your actions have already spoke on how important it is because you've already approved the off cycle rules for it. You approved emergency rule for the 20, so for, for, for NFPA 855 for the 23 edition. I initially, um, brought this to staff a, a year, over a year ago, talked about bringing forward all of this. And they said it was too big of a proposal. And so we broke it down to just doing the NFP 855 document um, and trying to encapsulate all of that. So um, I was directed by staff to go in one direction. I went in that direction. We went with NFP 855, the 2023 version. And now the code has been pushed back so many months so i'm trying to go back to what was the original proposal was trying to bring all of the language forward early and now it's not early it's part of looking at parting uh, trying to get this into the 2018 code so it can actually utilize now and and 
and I'm trying to make sure all the numbers correlate too. So the people that are developing plan review checklists, submittal checklists, inspection checklists, all of the numbers will correlate now while they're under the 2018 code. And then when it 21 code kicks in, they'll just correlate. There won't be any issues, but um, yeah, it is frustrating. It is extremely frustrating uh, dealing with um, code changes that the industry has helped bring forward. And then to just get the obstacle at, at the building code council um, that I'm hearing right now. So I, I'll just, I'll just sit back and let you guys make a decision. And, and if, 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 if staff is telling me that this wasn't even a possibility, um, then to be here for all of this time waiting to get to this point when it wasn't even a go, I, I don't really appreciate that wasting um, the time waiting around for that. So thank you. And I totally appreciate your efforts. Your answer is very, very good. And I, I respect your frustration and I thank you for answering the questions. Uh, Jay, go ahead. Thank you, Tony. Just so to understand the, the problem we're trying to solve here, given the current date of the 2021 effective date of being March 15th, 2024, are we looking to solve the problem of anything that comes through in a building permit between now and then? Is this a five month problem we're trying to solve or maybe even less given the challenges Stoyan and staff are saying of even getting an emergency rule implemented? It, it would be for five months, yes, unless Storian, it would be less than that. And again, that is only if the March 14th, 15th deadline doesn't get pushed again. Okay. And if the March 15th deadline, if for any reason we would, then this would be a problem we'd have to solve with that as well. No, that's the oh. whole thing. That's This would already be, if you allow the emergency girl rule go forward, we would have all of these provisions in the 2018 WAC now. I understand, but given the challenges that, that we're hearing on this, I'm I'm wondering about hunting on this now because it's really a five month or less problem. If I can clarify one more time. So we already have emer an emergency in place. So that this new one is the emergency to the emergency. So we we can't do both emergencies. We need to get rid of one. And then in addition to that, it's in 2018 language. So I don't know if we'll be able to file it. I'm not saying we won't be, I just don't know. Because, you know, again, it, it's an emergency for something that is already in the old rule. Again, it's not issues with the Code Revisor's Office or the State Building Code Council can, you know, we don't want to stop you. The, the issue first is with the filing. Are we allowed to do that? And second, does it meet the criteria for emergency? So we we have to follow the Administrative Procedures Act. Uh, uh, th these are the questions, whether or not we'll be able to file it. And the more important one is, does it mean the criteria for emergency? Again, for us, I mean, one emergency in place, how emergency is the second emergency? Can we survive without it? These are the questions. So it's not, again, don't consider this something against you. I just I just don't know the answers. And the second one, I think we touched base a little bit about the proposal. So your proposal is great, but it's not complete. It doesn't show the changes from the WAC. It shows the changes from the model code. That's that's the other thing. We'll take care of that, but we need to figure out whether or not we can file this. And again, it's not something that I don't want to do it. I will if the council requires me to do it. I just don't know the answer at the moment because I've never had the chance to meet with the code revisor's office. So with just mean quickly the the statement that does it meet the criteria for emergency rule the the nfpa 855 2023 which is being extended that met the criteria for emergency rule this is the same thing this is just code language being brought in that is about energy storage systems 
it's just more clarifying code language. So it, it as far as if it meets the criteria or not, I don't think that should be a question. Thanks. Uh, Micah, go ahead. So I'm trying to process some of this, what Stoyan said, what's going on. So we've already got an emergency rule for 2018 that will expire. This mm -hmm. takes that and puts it into rulemaking, which we should be able to do considering that the 2018 is the current code and will remain a current code until March 15th of 2024. So this will stay with the 2018 in perpetuity for whatever projects are done between now and March 15th, where if it's an emergency rule and it expires, that goes away, it's not there, it doesn't exist, doesn't have to be applied any longer. Um, and I believe this is something we talked about previously on the whole emergency rule, expedited rule, whether or not we can make rules for the 2018. I, I'm stunned that we were being told that there's probably a possibility that we can't make modifications to the current WAC. It's the current WAC until March 15th. The, the current WAC is the one that is adopted, which is 2021. Uh, well, then, if that's the case, why in the hell are, are we delayed to March 15th? We should just in, enforce the 2021. If that's the current WAC language, we've been told over and over that is the code language that applies as the WAC law. Then, then why is there anything, you, then why would any jurisdiction, why, why are we saying we can't enforce the 2021 currently? I, I don't understand where this, that makes no sense to me, Stoyan. I'm not trying to argue with you. That makes zero sense to me. If you're saying that the 2021 is state law, because that's what's shown in the WAC, then the 2018 doesn't apply, a delay doesn't apply. None of that applies. We should be enforcing the 2021 based on state law, if that's the case. If you know all this, I can offer my job again. I don't know the answer. I just said it. I don't know the answer. I, I know you don't know the answer. I'm just, I, that's why I didn't, I didn't ask for, I didn't ask a question. I didn't want an answer. I said, I'm stunned that that is what we're being told that we can't modify the current rules. And then you just said, that's not the current rules. The current rules that by state law jurisdiction should be enforcing, according to that statement, is the 2021 code, not the 2018. So you know, that makes, I don't Tony, understand that. Tony, that's what I'm getting at. Sorry. Tony, it's Derek Marabakto. Can I jump in for a minute? Yes, please. Okay, thanks. Uh, and first of all, I wanted to apologize for folks, my phone dropping in and out, but I have been uh, as part of this conversation. And I just want to clarify something and, and hopefully it can help answer Michael's question. Um, nothing Stoyan has said is, is wrong, but to be clear, the current law, the wax that are applied to builders is the 2018 code. That's what's in law. Those have been adopted. Those continue to be effective. The, the challenge here from the code revisor's office, as I understand it, is that the, a new set of rules have been adopted. So when they make changes to the current rules, the adopted rules, that, they're not in effect, but they've been adopted and in, all, in their files are um, categorized as adopted rules. Those are the 2021 rules. So that's, that's what's confusing here. It's not a question of whether they're effective. There's, make no mistake, the 2018 code cycle rules are effective and will continue to be effective until the new rules go into effect on March 15th. So what Stoyne has been uh, trying to describe and what I'm trying to describe now is a challenge with the code revisor's office and how they can go about making changes to the 2018 code uh, in a world in which new WACs have been adopted. So it's, it's more of an administrative challenge than anything else. And, um, you know, in conversations I've had with the Code Revisor's office, there's some head scratching about how they could go about doing it. I get it. Stoyan, is that a fair characterization? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. And, and that, that's, that, I mean, I think that's what Stoyan said. I appreciate it, Derek. It was just, it's kind of stunning that this, again, the Code Revisor is telling us we we can't, change something that's in effect currently because something else is adopted it sounds like that we should have made any rule changes to the 2018 at all after december 1st of last year according to that i just it's it's just odd that's a, that's all and i think we've already established as ken mentioned that this is an emergency that that you know we're trying to 
pick these up, capture all the safety measures and standards that should be adopted and enforced throughout the state with this. And, and we've already identified that previously through previous actions for the 2021 and emergency rules for the 2018. Thanks. I'll support this if, if we can move forward with it, but I don't even know if that we can do anything with it. That's crazy. All right. Thanks. I, I just one more thing I want to add uh, that was a little little confusing. So we do have emer an emergency in place right now, which will be effective until March 15, March 14. So we do have an emergency, the one that was adopted by the council. We refiled it right after the council meeting to, to, to expand to the new uh, uh, effective date. So now it, we have the emergency. I can't remember, we are adopting the standards and there was something in chapter one, I believe. So that's already effective, that's in place. So one emergency is in place right now. Okay. It's not expiring, it, expire, it expires on March 14. Okay. Um, yeah, Todd, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. And um, thank you, Ken, again. Um, for those of us that that do follow this through the tags and the committees, thank you for your persistence on this. And we do understand. And I also want to thank Stoyan and staff because you've been warning us about this. So just to defend what, what Stoyan is saying, he's been warning us this whole time that this is a consequence and this is, you know, as we delay codes and so forth. And, and of course, I was... Um, I, you know, I say that as as the only dissenting vote you know, to delay the last one, but just to make sure that we we knew this was coming. So I, I want I think the best thing we can do is 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 take action as a council and and know that it's already an administrative nightmare. Um, but but take action as a council and 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 let the administrative piece sort out is my recommendation. So thank you. Agreed, Todd. The very next thing out of my mouth was we'll do our job and we'll see how this shakes out. So Ben, go ahead. Yeah, I, I guess just something maybe Ken, if you could like knowing that there's an emergency rule in place for 2018 already, what what is a like a quick summary between the delta between what your what the proposal is and what's in place now? Just um, for my benefit, maybe some others. The existing emergency rule to the 2018 code only talks about, um, it says, it, right now it says energy storage systems regulated by section 1206 shall comply with this chapter as applicable and NFPA 855. And NFPA 855 is also referenced to the 23 version of 855. I have not broken down the exact code sections that are different between 855 and the 2021 IFC and the off cycle rules, which were approved already at the council level. Um, we went into, and then you get, I'm going to start back to the 21 uh, council or the 21 code section. So in the 21, we kept the same emergency or a same amendment and included 855. We then went into the off-cycle rule process to bring forward all of the proposed changes which you just approved. So all of those changes are what you, I think you're asking about what is the difference. The difference is what you just approved. What you just approved in the off-cycle rules is the difference from what the existing emergency rule is. So you're bringing in all those off-cycle rules plus the base code 2021 language that's the difference of of what we exist what we have now it you know there's definitions that are um different um from the base code of the 2018 code that need to get fixed so they correlate um with the language that's in 855 so uh, Again, I, I I like I understand the frustration going through the code revisers is off office again. Um, we're not looking at making any changes that you haven't already approved. I would just hope that we could get it into the WAC language that um, that staff needs to get to the code revisers office 
And then if we get held up in the code revisor's office, we get held up in the code revisor's office, but at least the building code council did their job and moved it forward. And you, you guys only have so much control. If you get stopped by an, another body, you, you get stopped. Uh, if I may, Ben, I think also to speak to, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the reason for this um, recent training that I've been to and, you know, in the previous year or so, uh, the, the uh, energy storage systems, uh, specifically with lithium ion have become uh, increasingly dangerous. Um, and these new standards and codes that are being put into place, uh, I can tell you quite confidently that we're already behind what's in the language. Um, it, it is increasing at, at a rate that makes it very difficult for um, us to keep up with from a prevention standpoint. And the fire industry as a whole has great concern in, um, with the, the items that are in place currently. So uh, is there any other further uh, council discussion on this? And if not, um, I, I'd like to look for a motion at this point. Micah? I'll make the motion to, uh, I guess, approve as submitted. I'll second that. Okay, who is the second? I'm sorry. Justin. Okay, thank you. And what do you mean by approve, Micah? Uh, you're on mute. Sorry, Michael. <clears throat> oh, muted. Sorry. Um, I was just looking at that. So thank you for that question. Is, is this approved for mercy rule or expedited rule? I, I'm. I need to verify with Storm because it says one mercy rule on the item number eight, but it says off or uh, expedited on the document. It's uh, the title is uh, how Ken submits it. Uh, I, I uh, the request is for emergency rule. And again, okay. uh, when we spoke with Ken the last time, I told him that this, he needs to work a little bit on it. It's it's not. I, I understand that I'm showing language in here that isn't in the wax. I, this document will get shortened down. Um, okay. So, you, you, yeah, I had to take a look at the East existing WAC under the 2018 show or delete those sections. And yes, there are some um, existing language that's in the 2018 base code that is shown because um, I had to show where it got struck out. So when I struck out entire sections of 1206 and I wrote, or, or 1205 where I wrote station or fuel cell power systems, the section is not adopted, WAC 5154-8-1205. So yes, there, there's very few things that need to get changed. Um, to be in the proper format. Uh, just for this presentation, I wanted to show um, the other parts of the existing 2018 base code so people could understand um, what got eliminated and what is gonna stay. So um, I understand it's not in the proper format, but again, that's a, to me, it's a quick change to, to make that Thanks, Ken. So for me, it would be the emergency rule as shown because I appreciate the format and I'm sure the code officials and other users would appreciate the format that actually shows what's deleted because the WAC rules don't. Um, and, and I'm going to bring one up, uh, another thing up right now, because this morning from 8 to 10, the Washington State Association of Fire Marshals has their Fire Prevention Institute. I spent two hours putting a presentation to them on energy storage systems. And I had told them that I was coming uh, this morning at 10 o'clock to help push this through. Uh, the feedback I got was just positive. It was, you know, I had text messages and stuff that were looking forward to this uh, coming forward now because they wanted that 21 language as soon as possible. And they're frustrated with it being pushed. Um, so please, I'll do everything I can to, you know, clean up this document. But again, the strikethroughs and underlines is, is, uh, 
is what's going to happen. And again, I'll just stress it one more time. You have already approved all of this language for the 21 code and off cycle rules. So there is no new language. You're just putting in as an emergency rule into 2018. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, Micah, I'm sorry. Clarify the motion. No problem. Uh, a motion to approve the emergency rule as submitted. Uh, formatting is not uh, an issue or criteria for us approving this emergency rule. I think that uh, we approve a lot of documents that get formatted after the fact. Thanks. Okay. Justin, are you good with that? As the I second? am good with that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Michael, would you like to speak to the motion? I think enough has been said. It's needed. We've already established your mercy. Let's move forward. Thanks. Okay. Justin, as the second, would you like to speak to that? Well, coincidentally, I spent uh, three days with the fire marshals earlier this week, and I bet 80% of the conversation was over battery storage. So it is a hot issue. I know that for a fact. Thank you, Justin. Uh, we'll open it up to the rest of the council. Jay? A hot issue, no pun intended, Justin. You like that? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I really appreciate the work that Ken is doing, and I appreciate the issue of saying that we have this code in 21, we want to bring it back to 28, uh, but I'm going to be voting against this motion. Here's why. Um, twofold, we're hearing that it's an administrative nightmare to, to deal with, not only while the, in concept where we're saying we want to take the 21 code and put it into 2018, given the language that is in the proponent submittal, comparing that to the WAC is going to take some significant staff time. In addition to dealing with how this gets dealt with with the code providers office, which is a separate issue. Secondly, any benefit to that would be in the time frame when this emergency role could be effective, and March 14th. So we've got limited uh, area uh, uh, of benefit. Third, a previous discussion of this council earlier today has been saying we need to do fewer emergency rules. There's a great opportunity to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Chill. Yeah, I guess um, I would prefer a motion that suggested that uh, the proponent clean up the document such that staff can easily work with it. <clears throat> Is that intended as part of the motion, Micah? It was not part of the motion, but I believe Ken indicated he would do that as needed. Um, I don't believe we need that in the motion if the proponent already said he would do that, which uh, Ken can verify, but I'm pretty sure that's what I heard. Yeah, and if staff wants to take the document and just you know, meet with me and tell me what they don't understand about it, uh, the formatting, um, uh, that, you know, that's fine. We can clean it up really quick. Okay, it's, thanks. It's, it's not whether or not we understand it. It's that the council voted on criteria for submittals, and this doesn't meet the criteria that are approved by the council. It's not what Stoyan wants. It's what the council approved, and we have a form for submittal, and we have a specific language in uh, uh, 5104, I believe it was 020 or 025. So okay. I guess I, my, if I vote for this, it will be contingent upon everything being cleaned up such that it is in the correct format where staff time is minimized. And I guess that's an understood part of if I vote for this. Thank you, Joe. Micah? I'll put my hand down. Thanks. Mr. Thank Chair, you. can I have your right hand? Yes. Um, I have a question. Stoyan indicated that one of the questions he has is whether this could meet criteria for an emergency rule. And we had a discussion similar to this earlier in the summer, several months ago. My question is, if we submit something that doesn't meet that criteria, does somebody vet that and spit it back to us? Or does, or, or is that potentially basis for us to be sued or brought to court over that? Um, if, if that's a question that gets resolved not in our favor. 
I, I will ask Dirk for help on that. Dirk, are you available at the moment? If you're not, I can. I'm not seeing him. He may have dropped again. Based on the conversations I had with him, uh, we need a finding of emergency. So if the council decides whether or not this is an emergency, of course, it's, it's open for a lot. So there is a possibility uh, for uh, the governor to overturn it if somebody files a complaint. So there is a there is a procedure that if somebody doesn't agree with the emergency. Uh, if there's any such risk, I would need to rehear the criteria for what an emergency. So I feel comfortable feeling that we can meet that those criteria. I don't, I don't remember them exactly. And, and again, I don't, I just say it doesn't meet the criteria. I said whether or not the council needs to decide whether or not this meet, meets the criteria for emergency. And I can show it on the screen. This is RCW 3404-350. Here is. Okay, here is, so that's the standard necessary for the preservation of the public health, safety, or general welfare. And then observing something blocked. Can you move the <laughs> Can you move the uh, video, folks? What's behind blocks? Tony's picture? Oh, good, thank you. And then observing the time requirements of notice and opportunity would be contrary to public thinking. So it's pretty vague. It is. Necessary for the preservation. Okay. There's also criteria under WAC 5104025. It's spelled out in a list. Uh, and it's for any statewide and emergency statewide amendments to the state building code. So yes, that is vague, but it, there is more specific criteria based on that WAC. But it's still vague, even though it's more specific list. <laughs> One more, oh, two, five. There we go. Oh, okay, great, I see that. For me, it's one of the following, and I think we check a couple of those boxes. Micah? Yeah, I was going to say the proposal that's posted online as well, not just the code language, has an explanation on item five. And it is indicated that we have approved and extended an emergency rule regarding ESS already this year. And this is congruent with those decisions, in my opinion. And it would meet the criteria of the emergency rule. Okay. Any further council discussion? before we do a roll call. And I apologize, I did not open this up for public comment. At this time, those in the attendees list, if you will raise your hand, if you have public comment, we'll take that now. Angela, go ahead. Sorry. Um, so this Angela helped uh, with Wabo, and I, it's kind of a question. Um, so Stoyan had noted that there's already an emergency rule in place for this that's good until March. Um, but then from what I'm hearing, it sounds like this new emergency rule is actually new information that would apply to permits from basically when it's adopted to March but anything else under the 18 code, say from today back would be different. So in code enforcement, we would have to actually keep track of the exact date to know whether or not this applies. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. So it is the first true where this is already actually adopted in an emergency rule that applies to the 18 or is it the second where it's going to confuse all of code enforcement for the next five months. Well, 
So the Any, yes, yes is for both questions. Well, so then why do we need the second emergency rule if there's already one in place until March? I believe the intent is to make the language more easily accessible for code users. As as a code user emergency, you know, or whatever, are things that are not easily found in the first place because the WAC is not actually edited. So we actually have to go hunt them down on the SBC site in order to actually find them. So I'm not sure that the intent would be met. I guess that's all. The emergency rules are not, you You don't see them in the WAC. They are not published. Right. Right. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Angela. Any further public comment? Okay, Ben, go ahead. Yeah, and thanks, Tony. I, I was just, that, that, that was kind of the purpose of my question was just to identify for everyone like what the current emergency rule is doing and uh, like Tony, you had spoken to as well as Ken, like there's there's a gap between what's proposed currently as versus what's um, in place with the current emergency rule and that there's significant changes between those that are um, in the public interest to, to be enforceable for the, the new requirements as well as aligning things with the, the code amendments that have been adopted for 2021. Thank you, Ben. Ben, go ahead. So one of the reasons bringing this forward is some of the designers of these systems um, are having to come forward with an alternate materials and methods request right now to use provisions in the 21 code, which is causing delay in their projects. If this is allowed to be an emergency rule to the 2018 code, then they will not have to go through that administrative process anymore. If they decide to submit, they can submit once this becomes effective with the emergency rules that you would be looking at today. And they would not have to go through that process of asking for an alternate material method for the 2018 code to use the 2021 provisions. Thanks. Thank you, Ken. Okay, with that, we'll do a roll call. And the motion on the table is to approve the emergency rule uh, as submitted. I think it's safe to say that the understanding is, is that Ken will work with SBCC staff to get that language um, in an appropriate format if approved. Fair? And, and staff will work with the code revisor's office to see if we can, we can file that. Agreed. Thank you for clarification on that. Okay, with that, we'll do a roll call on that. Shell Anderson? Yes. Jay Arnold? No. Todd Byrother? Aye. Aye. Um, Justin Borgo? Yes. Micah Chappelle? Yes. Damon Doyle? Yes. Um, Handy? Yes. Craig Holt? No. Kai Menser? No. Ben Omara? Yes. Pete Riki? Nay. Katie Sheehan? No. I'm getting seven to five. That's what I got. Motion carries. We need eight votes to pass. Oh, we do. Okay. So motion does not carry. Okay. Did the chair vote? Oh. No. Uh, it's not a tie. We got to. But it does affect the outcome. If, well, I don't know about that. I was going to refer to Dirk, but he's not here. Krista is suggesting that the vote will affect the outcome. So I'm not knowledgeable enough on that. It's my understanding that I abstain unless uh, uh, there's a tie. So unless I get other direction, then. 
I think my, it's my that, understanding right? of Robert's rules is that if the the chair does, uh, only abstains out of courtesy, there's no rule that says the chair abstains. They abstain out of courtesy unless their vote affects the outcome. That's my understanding from chairing the MVE and the tag. Hey, it's Derek Marabato. Can folks hear me? I am here. Okay. So we have seven, vote seven to five. I don't know if you hear, if you got uh, the discussion and uh, we need eight to pass. The question is, we don't have a tie. The question is whether or not Tony can vote on this. Uh, well, there's no, there's, so I heard what I think what Shell just said, um, and, and that's correct under Robert's rules. There's nothing in the uh, council bylaws or in statutes which would prevent the council chair from voting and and as Chell indicated as a courtesy council chair will, will generally not vote unless the vote uh, is necessary to make a difference uh, in the outcome okay so it does then my votes yes motion carries eight to five Okay, um, Ken, go ahead. No, I'm sorry, my hand was left up, thanks. Okay, all right. Okay, with that, let's go to agenda item number nine, discuss public concerns with the 2021 uh, WUI code. And we do have some public comment on this um, that, will probably help us lead in the right direction. Um, Stoyan or Dustin, do you have the do documents that you want to pull up? And maybe we can start with those that submitted those. Yes, give me two seconds. We also have people in the room that would like to provide comment. Excellent, thank you. Can, can somebody make me a non-presenter so I don't screw up the rest of the meeting? I appreciate that. Thanks. Okay. It looks like Michael uh, is in the in the room for the atten attendees. So, Michael, I'm going to allow you to speak on this. His hand is up. Can you hear me okay now? Yes. Thank you. So hi, I'm Michael Fear, Executive Director of Walk a Million Trees Project in Bellingham. I authored the white paper that you see there that you all received uh, as part of this agenda item. I hope you've had a chance to read it. It outlined many problems with the defensible space requirements. I wanna highlight just one of those to you today, DNR's WUI map. It shows red interface and yellow intermix areas, both of which require defensible space clearings up to 100 feet. Is the map a useful tool for jurisdictions and developers and landowners to know what is needed for wildfire resiliency? No, and here's four reasons why. One, the map is not a fuel-based map like what California has developed, which is how to accurately assess wildfire risk. As a result, a high percentage of Western Washington is in the yellow intermix area, almost everywhere except urban cores. This has no relationship to wildfire risk. It only shows where population is relative to large areas of landscape. Two, DNR's mapping staff confirmed that the map was created only to guide home hardening, not defensible space. Three, the map is three miles in, in its highest resolution, too low to be useful. As a result, there will be wide confusion by local jurisdictions and others trying to implement your defensible space code. Four, the map's alternative, the findings of fact process is cumbersome and unclear. Due to the flawed map, most people will need to use this finding of fact process which will swamp local code officials and probably SBCC staff as well. Q3, 
key terms like vegetation density are not defined. This fuzziness will tend to skew the scoring unnecessarily high, in our opinion. The other thing I wanted to highlight to you is the science. Here's the facts. Wildfire studies, including forensic evaluations of destroyed communities, unanimously demonstrate that structure hardening is vastly more important than broad defensible space landscape buffers. The latter is not supported by science. So why didn't we raise these impacts and issues a year ago? I've been asked that uh, quite a few times over the past several weeks. And the, the answer is the state uh, will we build did not ask for defensible space requirements. It only asked for building hardening code. So nobody outside of the SBCC knew you were adding defensible space language until last month, nor were any wildfire or tree or climate experts involved in your WUI drafting process. So for these reasons and more, I urge you to withdraw just the WUI defensible space portion of the code today. So it's many problems can be resolved during the next code cycle, including a much better map and a better findings of fact methodology. This action would not impact the energy code or the home hardening requirements at all. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I'd like to get through public comment on this first and then we will jump to council. Iris, go ahead. Um, thank you. My name is Iris Antman, and I'm reading a statement by Dr. Chad Hansen, who's, a, who's nationally known for his forensic study of communities like Paradise that burned to the ground. He's a forest and fire researcher. He's published about four dozen scientific studies in peer reviewed journals and two books. He original, originally sent us a two-page statement, and I'm reading a three-minute excerpt. The rest will be turned into you. His words, I was contacted and asked my professional opinion regarding some provisions of an international code that Washington is considering in an effort to create safe fire communities. While provisions regarding home hardening and def defensible space pruning within the immediate vicinity of each home are important and grounded in the best available science, the prohibition on trees being within 10 feet of each other is not scientifically sound and in fact would be counterproductive if adopted. Home hardening is paramount. By far the single most important thing that can be done to protect homes from wildfires is home hardening, reducing and preventing the ignitability of homes. Uh, I'm sorry for that interruption. Uh, defensible space pruning is next on the list. Uh, the second part of the equation is defensible space pruning within at most 100 feet from homes and in most cases 60 feet or less around each. This is not about cutting down trees. In fact, it is important to maintain tree cover for the cooling shade it provides. Defensible space is about reducing the most combustible material immediately adjacent to homes, especially dry grass, seedlings and shrubs, lower limbs, prune them to six feet above the ground, limbs that touch the house or deck, remove these, but not the tree, and dead leaves and pine needles on the ground. Third, removing trees does not curb fires and can, in fact, exacerbate wildfires. Contrary to what we've been repeatedly told by the media and some politicians, removing trees from forests do not effectively curb wildfires and often tends to make fires burn more intensely and more rapidly towards homes, increasing threats to homeowners. When trees are removed based on the outdated notion that more open forests are less flammable, the result is a hotter, drier, and windier microclimate that favors more intense, faster moving fires. This is the lesson of the largest and most comprehensive scientific studies ever conducted on this question by both independent scientists and US Forest Service scientists in the Pacific Northwest. Thank you. Thank you, Iris. Donna, go ahead. Hi, Donna Albert, retired professional civil engineer and lead accredited professional. I am concerned about state agency or council actions that have long-term environmental consequences. Thank you for the code change that effectively eliminates natural gas for heating in new buildings. Please ensure that is in implemented without further delay. 
The proposed code change to harden new buildings against fire in anticipation of worsening climate makes sense. However, please remove the defensible space component, which has many unintended consequences. To reach zero climate emissions from energy sources, we must stop burning fossil fuels like natural gas. But to reach net zero climate emissions from all sources, we are dependent on natural systems, including urban trees, to pull carbon from the air. This is not the time to cut down more urban and suburban trees. We are also in a biodiversity crisis. We are rapidly losing insects which have interdependent relationships with specific native trees and plants. Please take care to consider the climate and biodiversity effects of any code regarding landscape. And thank you for your work. Thank you, Donna. Heather? Heather, the floor is yours. Okay, we'll come back. I, I'm here. Okay, go ahead. Um, uh, this is Heather Pins, and uh, I have concerns regarding the WUI code. We cannot wait three years for revisions. A big concern is the current map with the defensible space. It conflicts with the following state level codes or regulations. The Washington State Urban Forest Management Plan, the Washington State Climate Commitment Act's Carbon Sequestration Goals, the Washington State Growth Management Act, Chapter 365190, which requires counties to protect habitat, including wetlands and critical areas, and to prepare for climate change. The Washington Critical Area Regulations, the Washington Shoreline Regulations, the Washington Storm Stormwater Regulations, and the Washington State DNR's Small Forest Landowner Program. In particular, I want to note the code's conflict with RCW 76150005 of Washington State's Urban Forest Management Plan. It states, increased tree canopy in urban areas can positively impact salmon populations through stormwater management and reduction of stream temperatures, thereby improving the critical salmon habitat. I am asking to please remove the defensible space for this code cycle and take the next three years to amend the code. Thank you. Thank you, Rhonda, go ahead. Did you say Rhonda? Yes, go ahead, Rhonda, four is yours. Thank you very much. My name is Rhonda Hunter. I am an ecosystem biologist who has worked on climate change and lived on the forest edge for 50 years. In especially the last five summers, I have worried a lot more about fire and kept my own pasture mowed short. I have not cleared away all trees because at what level of fire risk would I draw the line? A big wind-driven forest fire would deliver embers from a greater distance then I could clear cut to protect my home. A metal roof would be more protection than destroying the trees to put my home in a barren space, two thirds the size of a football field. Trees give my home the following benefits. Shade for summer cooling and less energy use for air conditioning. Habitat for the Northwest forest ecosystem critters, including shade for my salmon creek to keep the water cool enough in summer because sun warmed water drops oxygen levels and kills salmon fry. Trees store carbon by drawing in carbon dioxide, a climate warming molecule, and transpiring out oxygen, which of course we all breathe. Trees are calming, shade, and comforting in neighborhoods far better than wide, empty, barren spaces. Bottom line hardening homes' exteriors is a good idea 
but there really is no reason to widen to a 30 to 100 foot defensible tree destroyed space when wind driven fire will leap very wide spaces. As climate chaos advances, we need far more trees, not fewer. If the map is pushing you to apply this defensible space requirement everywhere, then there's something wrong with the map. Clearly, the energy and building codes themselves need to move forward, but please use your six month off cycle correlation process to remove the defensible space from the code. The legislation did not ask for that. It's more harmful than the fire risk. Thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. Brad? Thank you. I'm representing uh, uh, Carl Schroeder with the Associated Washington Cities, was not available to attend today's meetings. I'm the planning director at the city of Tumwater. I'm also representing the opinions uh, for the cities of Lacey and Olympia, their building officials and community development directors. Uh, we want to acknowledge, obviously, there is the need to risk uh, to address the risk for wildfires and the interaction with the development. Our fundamental concern is that the issues with the current WUI are too global for us to try to fix through detailed red lines at today's meeting. Uh, we believe that the issues with the WUI require the State Building Code and the Technical Advisory Committee to do a more thorough review and amend the WUI before it becomes effective. Um, as has been noted by the other speakers, the WUI has been written as a combination of very specific building related requirements that can be generalized across the state with mapping and site requirements that are much more uh, localized and should be applied and account for local conditions. Uh, the wideland urban interfaces codes of Kennewick are fundamentally different from those of Evan Aberdeen. We have found through our work and the, the reason for this, our work has started is we were as part of our adoption of the uh, hazard mitigation plan for the city, as well as updating our landscape tree, tree and tree preservation codes this year, we did a thorough dive into the actual text of the WUI uh, in order to make sure that what we were drafting worked with the WUI. It became clear to us that the WUI is, is really unclear. There are multi it's open to multiple interpretations. We have multiple discussions with members of the State Building Code Council staff, as well as state agencies on this issue. Uh, it is unclear to us which provisions are mandatory versus optional. It's not clear to us whether an op applicant avoids certain owner's requirements by opting to use other higher standards or not. And it's not clear to us whether there's any local discretionary authority for us to address issues that are become on a local nature. Our understanding is that the technical advisor committee full representation was not likely available during the drafting of this. And we acknowledge that there is a process that is followed. We acknowledge that the process has been completed. Our concern is that the process itself being completed is not the checkbox to uh, okay an approval of a code that is revised and updated. It is how that code actually functions when it's put on the ground and used by the building officials and planning staff uh, to review projects that are coming in. Our concerns have been echoed by other speakers. I just want to focus first on the mapping. Uh, the scale of the WDNR and mapping is way too large and is certainly not appropriate for urban areas. Trying to apply those and trying to, trying to determine actually where in the city this code would apply is difficult and in some cases doesn't match reality on the ground. There are conditions uh, change on local level often and a state level mapping will not be updated often enough to account for that. We definitely support the Washington State Association of County and the DNR remapping request that is now before the legislature or will be considered before the legislature. As noted, we think the definition of vegetation as used in the WUI is too broad, does not take into account regional variations across the state. It is, does not take into account that vegetation differs in terms of what fire hazards it actually creates. We believe that the defensible space requirements certainly create a number of conflicts with other state requirements, not the least the critical areas ordinance, the state uh, shoreline management plan and other things that have been addressed prior. We are concerned also with the applicability of WUI to small projects such as re-roofs or re that deal with an exterior structure. The WUI appears to require the application of the defensible space requirements in these cases. So if somebody comes in for a re-roof or replacing a window or anything that requires some level of minor building code approval, we would trigger the need for a site plan, site plan review, and clearing of vegetation if necessary. 
We are concerned that there are potential liability issues for both the jurisdiction and property owners with the maintenance provisions in section 603. Our request for the State Building Co Council to address this is to add this definitely for, as a discussion item for your November meeting. We should really be focusing here on making sure that the code that emerges from this process is something that is implemental. It is not important to me that a process is completed, but the fact that the code works at the end, that's the most important thing. The delay that has been put forward for the second time is to allow, would allow the State Building Code Council to address both the defensible space concerns and the mapping as part of this. If you have any questions, I'm available for answer questions. Thank you. That concludes public comment. At this time, we, we need to... people in the room as well. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, go ahead. If you would like to call on those, Annette or Dustin. Thank you. Just state your name and begin your testimony. Where do you want us to be? You, if you speak up, the mic will pick you up from where you're at. Okay. Lynn Fitzhugh, Executive Director of Restoring Earth Connection. I want to make very clear that I do not want to delay this building code beyond March 15th and fully support the gas changes. However, I am asking you to use the six month off cycle rulemaking or any other mechanism available to you to remove defensible space from this code cycle. DNR told me in a meeting that this map was never created to apply to defensible space, only to home hardening. Thus, you are getting unintended consequences. It conflicts with seven different Washington state regulations or laws which will wreak havoc for officials who will be uh, under conflicting mandates. People have already testified last month and written about all the detrimental effects of cutting down those many trees. In a consultant's report for my county on trees and its mitigation plan, they worried about 56,490 megatons of carbon sequestration lost from normal development due to the loss of 2,100 acres of trees. The changes in the Wooey, because of the 30 to 100 foot, almost treeless space around homes, would essentially double, if not triple, the expected sequestration loss. Not only will that blow up Thurston County's sequestration plan, but have comparable result, results in counties that have not even written their plans. This cannot wait three years to be fixed. My county needs to build 7,369 homes in the next three years. All of those will lack shade from the coming climate heat and will be at increased flood risk if there is not trees or vegetation to keep the ground porous. I live on a hill. During the recent intense rainstorms of the last week, sheets and buckets of water fell. I watched it run down the asphalt street like a rushing creek. Due to my neighbors at the top of the hills, trees along the cross street and other back street trees down the hill and current dead grass in our yards, we do not flood. Under development with this wooey, they would. Please correct this in any way you can. Are you gonna call me? Uh, you're ready to go. Okay, I'm Charlotte Persons. I'm from Olympia and I represent Black Hills Audubon Society. We urge you to act today to remove the defensible space parts of the 2021 Wildland Urban Interface Code amendments. Please use your six month amendment process to remove the defensible space sections before they go into effect and then use the three year code cycle to resolve the many legal conflicts. The defensible space requirements do not conform with the enabling legislation. Senate Bill 1609. That bill requires ignition resistant materials and does not mention defensible space. Similarly, RCW 1927.5560 passed in 2020 also requires ignition and resistant materials with no mention of defensible space. 
Finally, Restoring Earth Connections contacted the staff who created the Washington DNR map published in 2020 and referenced in the code. Before making the map, staff consulted with the Attorney General about the legislative intent of the legislation. As a result, they believe the map would designate the areas for residences to use ignition resistant materials, not to create defensible spaces. As other speakers have said, especially Heather, the defensible space requirements conflict with many state laws. We ask you to remove the defensible space requirements now in the next three year code amendment cycle. You can resolve the legal conflicts and be sure of the in legislative intent. If you begin the six month amendment process today, the six months will end in April, shortly before, the, shortly after the entire code's effective date of March 15th. When it's clear that the defensible space requirements will be nullified only one month after the code's effective dates, jurisdictions will not enforce them. This will save many, many treaties and prevent legal controversy. Please act today. And that's all that's in the room, Tony. Okay, thank you. That'll conclude public comment. We need to discuss extending the meeting at this time. If we're going to get through the rest of the agenda, I'm available for another 30 or till 430. I don't know what, where everyone else is sitting. I can do that. I'll make it up. Yep. I can stay. I'll make okay. a motion to extend the meeting for 30 minutes. Second. Till 430. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any against? Okay, motion carries. Representative Ramel, go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I unfortunately don't have um, flexibility to um, to stay much later. Um, I'm going to be late for my next meeting as it is. But I did want to just um, make sure folks saw the letter from Association of Washington Cities that's in the packet. Um, to me, the um, implementability of this is pretty critical, and it sounds like uh, there are some huge questions uh, that were that were raised by folks from Tom Water today as well. I, th I think this is a really important issue for us to take a look at. I don't know what the right step is. Um, and I, I think um, the discussion I was hoping to hear from, um, and we'll look forward to reviewing minutes on, is how do we work backwards from March 15th and have edits or potential revisions uh, recommended by a technical advisory group um, in time to be able uh, to have this implemented on the same schedule uh, in March 15th. Um, I was gonna, my intention was to ask Stoyan uh, about that sort of uh, scheduling, but I think this is an important issue and we do need to um, dig in and take a closer look at this. Thank you. Thank I'm you. Sorry. Sorry. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, Jay, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. I uh, had the opportunity to meet with Carl Croder from the Association of Washington Cities and um, also um, uh, Brad Medrud from the city of Tumwater, who you heard during uh, public comment. And as we've heard from them and in, from Carl in the letter, uh, from Brad and others in public comment, I, I've come to the conclusion that we've got three uh, particular areas that we need to deal with. One, I think we are dealing with flawed maps and would like to uh, have a discussion with staff on given uh, how the SBCC is relying on DNR for these maps, what's the best path to go resolve that, which may be something that worked out, be worked out between agencies or maybe uh, something that requires legislative action. Secondly, we've heard from AWC and others of um, uh, some concern over uh, some issues like, does this will we apply to uh, existing projects uh, and, and other uh, concerns there that I think we need to clarify. Uh, and then finally, we have some statutory 
conflicts that we've heard about between this critical areas, the Shoreline Management Act, uh, and city tree codes. And I would like to understand um, whether there needs to be action by us or perhaps part of a legislative agenda to uh, correct. So in, in short, I think there are a number of areas that we need to deal with and would like to put this on a November agenda to discuss what our next steps are. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate it. And Micah, uh, floor is yours. I'm looking forward to this. Go ahead. Just because you have a lot of information. I didn't mean that. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting a little rummy. This meeting's been been a doozy. Go oh, ahead. Man. Um, I, I'm glad you're looking forward to it. I I may have nothing to say because there there's I I I feel like it's all in defense. Um, to some extent, the legislators pushed through a, an engrossed substitute Senate Bill 6109 in 2018, 19, and went into effect once the mapping was completed. Uh, we've discussed this many times over. There's been a big, robust public process for this. Um, defensible space was not included in the legislation. However, there was not a lot included in the legislation or in RCW 1927-560 that makes anything that they put in there level uh, at some level of enforcement. That's the discussion we had. That's the reason this proposal came forward. Um, when I say talk about in defense, I read the AWC letter. I've received some emails. There's a lot of misleading information in that letter. Um, the folks that wrote it, I didn't receive much request for information. Um, before they sent this letter, they could ask some questions. I mean, I don't think any of the proponents on the original proposal, which included the Washington Association of Building Officials Technical Code Development Committee, and the Washington State Association of Fire Marshals in a combined work group were approached on questions or concerns or comments. Um, we definitely don't have enough time for me to go through all the points of the AWC letter and provide information on those based on the code language. Um, but I know there's a lot of information here that is some concerns. Um, we're dealing with those in the jurisdiction I work for. There are some overlapping criteria there are some that may have the perception of being conflicting, although they're not. I know a lot of the items they listed in the letter. Um, let's just, for instance, go to uh, talking about the Forest Management Act, I believe, or, or one of the others. I have to go back to the letter. I got too many things open. <laughs> um, when you go in there, that RCW, RCW 7615-005, this reference in the letter, does talk about trees and urban uh, forest and environment. But some key areas in there, it talks about the need to plan for, promote, and manage urban community forests. It doesn't say just let them grow wild and not manage them. So yes, yeah, some of this will correlate and coordinate with some of those ECAs and other items that were talked about, for, um, shoreline stuff. But again, it's a combined effort. This isn't a clear cut code. In other words, not you're not going through and cutting everything down. Um, when you look at mature forests, the 10 feet, not that much um, for tree crowns and other stuff. The defensible space part of this that keeps coming up, it works. For folks that think Washington State may be the first ones to adopt this, it's completely wrong. There are so many states that ad adopt and implement and heavily enforce defensible space. And it's proven time and time again that defensible space works for saving structures. And defensible space has a criteria that works that has not been mentioned, which is protecting forests and wildlands from structure fires. That's also one of the reasons for the WUI code. It's not just the other way around. So it's not always that the structure is in danger of burning, it is the prevention of the structure from spreading. So again, there's a whole lot of information here. I am not even sure there's necessary changes that can be made. Um, sure, we could go through the process again, if that's what the council recommends us that we do. Um, I have no problem with that. I'd love to participate in it. I do know that there are a great many number of folks that agree with the groups that have spoken on the defensible or um, 
on the mapping, there's a lot of concern on that. That's why chapter three of the WUI code adoption is in there. That is the process that DNR used to create the maps. There is some questions on vegetation and what that means, vegetation mapping from the national level standard that DNR used. So we agree on the, the concerns on the mapping. However, the State Building Code Council that cannot, cannot affect that mapping. That's, that's not up to us. Um, there is an opportunity for individual jurisdictions to challenge that mapping. That's what the findings of fact, which is in the legislation, does. That's what Chapter 3, as adopted, does. It goes to that findings of fact for that jurisdiction. There are ways for that jurisdiction, for individual parcels, to not have to apply wildland urban interface requirements. But it's very limited. Again, I think the letter is, is some of these letters are just misleading. Um, they don't have accurate information. And I think that uh, we could definitely find some common ground if we need to make changes. Codes change. If we need to change defensible space, great. I'm all for it. Um, I have no problem working with all the organizations if they so choose. <laughs> Maybe you guys will exclude uh, the Washington Association of Building Officials and the Washington Association of State Fire Marshals that worked on this proposal. Um, hopefully that wouldn't be the case. But again, we didn't do this behind closed doors. Um, this process, two years in the making. Thanks. I'll stop. There's a lot of hands. Thank you, Micah. Pete, go ahead. Yeah, I, you know, worked closely with Micah on this, and eventually he convinced me, despite my reservations on the validity of the DNR map and other issues, uh, that there was at least a process for challenging the DNR uh, map and that a local code official could come in and make the appropriate changes as, as they saw fit and have the map either amended or write the appropriate documentation to, to uh, uh, rebut that. Um, but at any rate, so I eventually, you know, vote to, to approve that code, and eventually the council did approve that code. Uh, uh, however, I think many of the people who spoke today have raised a number of excellent points, and I am uh, very supportive of that view and uh, need to make sure that those views get addressed in detail. However, I believe that that needs to be done in the next code cycle either, uh, and certainly not through an emergency rule, and certainly not through, uh, perhaps through an off-cycle rule, but I think through the standard code cycle is the most appropriate way to address uh, their concerns. Uh, I have looked through a number of their uh, technical literature, including the experts that was quoted, uh, uh, at, uh, the author on the subject matter, and uh, my own observations for years as a forester, uh, logger, and somewhat sometimes firefighter, uh, my understanding of the situation has, is, is, you know, I'm, I can see where their concerns come from. Uh, and I do think that, you know, the automatic reaction of much of the public to this kind of situation is cut the damn trees down. Uh, unfortunately, and that is uh, inappropriate. And uh, since I live on the east side, uh, trees are a precious thing to me. I live on a tree lot and my neighbors are not necessarily very appreciative of those trees and the, uh, the amount of cooling that they provide my home. So while I am uh, very sympathetic with the uh, petitioners here, I don't think I see a path other than the next code cycle to make the appropriate changes that they want to and give us time to investigate the details of what they're uh, proposing. And in fact, I, well, I don't think that we've really seen anything that we could call a proposal that we could be actionable that we could vote on. So uh, there's a lot of... Uh, education that needs to be gone that needs to be done on how the SBCC works and how these folks can get and interact with the code uh, with the code council itself so I'll stop there thank you Pete Katie go ahead uh thanks Pete um I 
And I'll, I, I just wanted to say I appreciated Jay's sort of breakdown of the issue. And um, and so I do think that this does merit a little bit more conversation, perhaps in the next meeting, so that we can understand the mapping. Um, to Pete's point, if, if there's an, a way of changing the maps, um, I'd certainly like to understand that better. And um, I think that, you know, I, I get that I get that we don't have the processes for this, um, but we're in a moment where um, I do think that taking a second look at tree canopy it, it, coming from Eastern Washington too, um, and being in the um, medical lake community, uh, I'd, I'm not there, but friends are there and colleagues. Um, you know, it's it's hitting her really close to home, and and the uh, idea of uh, cutting down trees to fix this is not um, doesn't make me any more comfortable than uh, than Pete. So I I I would invite a, a more information and maybe a better understanding in the next meeting. Thank you, Katie. Damon, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the feedback I've gotten over the last several months from the building industry is that uh, this is more complicated and perhaps more restrictive than the energy code. So congratulations, Micah. You've replaced uh, Chell as public enemy number one. So <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. But uh, I see three things. One is... Uh, if we can get any better clarification on this map, that's a DNR thing. So if you know, perhaps we send a letter, do what we can. Um, you know, it, it still blows my mind that where my house is located, there are probably five to six hundred homes all within the red. And I'm like, how does that even happen? And there's not, there aren't enough mature trees around in that forty acre space to uh, to trigger wooey, in my opinion. And it, you know, again, there's a path. And I could probably uh, negotiate around it. The other thing, and, and Mike, you could maybe give me some clarification here, but there were some things that were put in, into statute legislatively that drove the way that we had to interpret the code. And I wonder if there's any fixes that we could apply at this upcoming session to make that better. And then the third thing, the last thing, is I think we really need to have a library of assemblies that can help these structures meet the intent of the code. One hour, two hour assemblies. Cement board siding by itself is not a one hour assembly. It's part of a one hour assembly. So if we could get those things done, I think we could go in the right direction on this and and uh, yeah, we'll have less picketing. So thanks. Thanks, Damon. Craig, go ahead. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, if there's anything we've talked about today that falls in the realm of an emergency, this this is it, right? This is something we talked about when we tried to pass this and several of us opposed it because of the map and uh, we were outvoted. But I think the testimony I've heard today and the, the documents I've read tells me that we have a broken issue here with this defensible area and we should take a hard look at it and at least get it on the agenda for next next meeting to consider an emergency process for this. This is, this is tragic uh, where it is right now and it's indefensible. Uh, I kind of play on the words, but uh, the uh, the way it's set up right now is a, is a disaster waiting to happen, and it's going to be a disastrous for all of us. And so I, I I I know it's not time for motion, but I feel very strongly this is something that is an emergency, and should treat it as such. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Todd, go ahead. Todd, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, so thank you everyone for raising these concerns. Um, and I was not on the WUI tag. And so I am curious as now a council member on, on getting more information. But as we go further in this, one thing I, I wanna raise is um, I haven't as a council member heard from DNR um, yet on this. I'm sure it was, it was, you know, at the WUI, at the tag level, this was conducted, but um, you know, I've had very positive experiences with DNR and integration with the codes. Uh, we, you know, if you remember, we we did an ad hoc committee on the tsunami codes, and that was the strength of 
of DNR mapping and analysis along with other very talented stakeholders. And so I would love to learn more about the process that we went through. But the other side of this is I am cautious about the extent of the scope of the Building Code Council um, because now we're getting into, into very complex integration of, um, of harmonizing both building codes and development codes. And so I think this is going to be an, an evolving topic in our state as, as, we, as we become more aware of this. Uh, I'm in the forest products industry. I'm very aware of fuel reduction and healthy forest. I, I, had, the, I had the privilege of, of, of being on a Washington delegation to Finland recently, uh, sponsored by DNR. That is focused specifically on forest health and and in the in the integration with our our development patterns, and so I, I you know I want to make sure that we give our state agencies credit and and I, what I I think I heard some interesting ideas there. I'd love to um, learn more in session coming up on on what can be done at the at, at the state legislative level to to help this integration. So um, if we move forward with exploration as a full council or back of the tag, I would like to hear from, from DNR on this. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Jay, go ahead. I'd like to, Ty here would, wants to speak. I'd like to give him the chance before I have my second round. Appreciate that. Yeah, I'll bring my uh, laptop next time. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I've gotten a lot of community input, probably not a surprise since Brad Medrid, who um, spoke, I think, most comprehensively about the list of concerns, was representing the planning departments of Olympia, Tumwater, and Lacey. Those are all my constituents, and those are all my planning departments. So obviously, this is of a huge concern across my county. I'm kind of where Craig is on this, and um, you know, I wasn't here when all of these things were debated and passed and the public process. I'm a little confused about that because Micah was sort of laying out, oh, there's this long process, but I thought I heard folks saying it wasn't in the legislation and folks didn't really know about a defensible space in particular was gonna be included. I don't know that history, but um, but I have seen the mapping as it applies to Tumwater and this sitting down with officials there and this kind of maybe dovetails with something Damon said, but I mean, it's unbelievable the application of the areas that it would apply to in the look. And I know the community of Tumwater, so I can look at that map and have a sense of what that means. and I can't believe that and Tom Water is working on sequestration and a tree canopy plan and all these things. And I can't believe that that these rules, even if whether they are good rules or not good rules for a, a properly mapped area, I can't believe that, that they're applying as broadly as what I've seen in the Tom Water mapping. So I'm very interested in what we can do. I, I don't know. Seems like I'm not alone in not knowing exactly what the right next step would be. Um, there was a proposal in the white paper to just, you know, I guess Pete's saying adopt it and then address it, try to fix it in the next cycle. One of the, uh, in the white paper, they talk about, can we remove just the defensible space piece so that we can fix it and get it right? I don't know which one of those is possible or the right thing to do, but whatever that is, and I would ask for staff, whether that's at the next meeting or otherwise, to educate me on what the steps are that are possible for this council to take be interested in taking those steps. Thank you. Jay, go ahead. Yeah, uh, um, echoing what Ty had said, if you took a look at the, the Tumwar map, um, here you have um, a city, an urban area that's entirely in the wildfire intermix interface area. And uh, the impacts of that, uh, I think are not what is intended. Um, I don't mean the, the question, Micah and the tags work on saying, here are the standards when you have development that's happening adjacent to a forest where there is wildfire risk. I think the issue that we have is that this is being applied um, much, much more broadly. And uh, whether it's the finalization of the maps or us not appreciating the intersection of the maps and the code when we looked at this in 2022, um, I think we're running into that. Um, so I think we have a question of either the applicability of the code of where it's uh, uh, applied or perhaps some potential changes on how it's applied 
given our ability to, to, to change the maps. Before I make a motion though, I would like to hear some input from staff on how SPCC interacts with DNR and our ability to formally request map revisions, um, how this could be dealt with internally before we actually look at, at, at changing um, the code itself. You know, you know, I'm very much opinionated person, but I, I, uh, I'm not a technical expert on that, so I, I'm not sure. Of DNR, uh, I believe they hit a statutory mandate to develop the map. We, we didn't get involved in that. Uh, we had uh, uh, Ashley was in, I think, educating the TAC and the council members once or twice, but we never got involved in the development, and I don't know. Uh, honestly, how we can reach out? I I would prefer to with refer the question to Micah because he was uh, uh, coordinating with uh, uh, Ashley. Uh, Micah, I'm sorry if I'm lying, but based on the conversation, can you help me out here? Uh, we did not. I did not coordinate with Ashley on the mapping. We had nothing to do with the mapping. Ashley, we got in touch with Ashley after the mapping was completed based on the legislative requirements and the requirement to enforce RCW 1927560, -560, which as shown is not enforceable. As we've demonstrated, as we've talked about, as we had multiple meetings on, you can't enforce that RCW, but we were required to by state law. Um, Storian is correct based on my understanding of the engrossed substitute Senate Bill 6109, Section 3, that um, DNR was directed to do the map and they are directed to assist counties, cities, and towns for the development of findings of fact for modified maps, again, which we outlined in chapter three. Any jurisdiction can already do that. Um, so I, 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 you know, based on the legislation, I don't think it's the SBCC's place to do that. It would be, um, it would be up to the individual towns, jurisdictions, counties, whatever, as the legislation directs and then like is that on a parcel wait. mike is that on a parcel by parcel basis that, that i don't think it's must, clear that people make an application that say i think the wooey shouldn't apply to my parcel or my particular project uh it, it isn't clear jay on who does that i think that can occur if the jurisdiction says hey we're going to adopt what the state has or excuse me, we're going to force what the state has and the findings of fact you can do as your individual parcel. Uh, I, don't, I believe that a jurisdiction, if they wanted to go in as a jurisdiction and challenge the entire map themselves. I think one of the things you brought up about your jurisdiction being in the WUI code is it is you're probably falling under the, the distance of one and a half miles to high density vegetation. And that's why you fall into the map. Um, it's probably not based on the forest that you have in your city. It's the distance to a highly vegetated forest area. Um, that is a national standard. There are movements at the national code level to modify that further and increase that distance. There was a proposal that the Washington Association of Building Officials spoke against this last code cycle that stated when there was a wildfire, that any structures within 15 miles of that wildfire boundary would then be considered in the wildland urban interface. So again, it, it, the findings of fact are based on a national standard. I'm pretty sure DNR went through that process. They should come here and speak to you all and, and share that process. I do want to state, this is not my code. This is not, you know, uh, sorry, Chael, I'm going to push it back to the energy code. Um, we, we determined that the RCW as a, as a, you know, body, Washington Association of Building Officials, was not enforceable as written. And that the the fire marshals group said the same thing, like, yeah, we, this is this is ridiculous. It doesn't work. And so we went in and said, hey, let's try to come together with something. So if folks want to get rid of, modify, come in as an emergency rule and say, don't enforce the defensible space until we readdress it in the next code cycle, that's that's wonderful. I have no problem with that at all. <laughs> you know, I'm here to defend what was proposed and what was adopted. Obviously, we as the SB 